My dear students, the first point, the first topic from which we start the chapter, that is atomic mass. If you ask me what atomic mass is all about, my dear students, let me tell you, atomic mass, it is defined as the mass of single atom of an element. Atomic mass is defined as the mass of single atom of an element. For example, if I use, if I'm using the term atomic mass of oxygen, that means I am talking about the mass of one atom of oxygen. If I'm using the term atomic mass of fluorine, that means I'm talking about the mass of one atom of If I'm using the term atomic mass of sodium, that means I'm talking about the mass of one atom of So in short, what atomic mass exactly is? Atomic mass, it is defined as the mass of single atom of an atom. Number one, the basic, it's classical difference. In order to make you understand the actual definition of atomic mass, I will have to tell you some basic things. And what are those basic things? Let's have a look. My dear students, as I keep on making you understand with this particular example, have a look. Let's say I have taken an object over here. This is one object. And I'm assuming weight of this particular object is 5 kilograms. Similarly, I'm taking one more bigger sized object. Let's assume the weight of this particular object, it is 10 kilograms. I took two objects. Weight of the first object is 5 kilograms. Weight of second object is 10 kilograms. Now, my dear students, can I write this 5 kg in this format? 5 multiplied by 1 kg? Absolutely, I can do that. Can I write this 10 kg like this? 10 multiplied by 1 kg? Absolutely, we can do that. Now, the point is, why am I doing this? Why I wrote this 5 kg as 5 multiplied by 1? Why I wrote this 10 kg as 10 multiplied by 1? There's a reason behind it. Dear students, can I say, this particular object, it is 5 times heavier than 1 kilogram? Absolutely. Can I say, this particular object, it is 10 times heavier than 1 kilogram? Absolutely. My weight is 75 kilograms. What does that mean? That means I am 75 times heavier than 1 kilogram. So, in short, what am I doing exactly? Can I say, actually, I am comparing the masses of different objects with this 1 kilogram. I am comparing masses of different objects with this 1 kilogram. I am exactly checking. That this object is 5 times heavier than 1 kilogram. This object is 10 times heavier than 1 kilogram. I am 75 times heavier than 1 kilogram. So basically, I am comparing the masses of different objects with 1 kilogram. Right? So what this 1 kilogram here is? Can I say this 1 kilogram is basically the reference here? It is the standard here with which I am comparing the masses of different objects? Absolutely. This 1 kg is the reference here. It is a standard here with which I am comparing the masses of different objects. My dear students, like we have got 1 kg as a standard here, I would need a similar type of standard in chemistry. I would need a similar type of standard, a similar type of reference in chemistry with which I will be comparing the masses of different atoms or molecules. Right? Now, the point is what is that standard in chemistry with which we are going to compare the masses of different atoms or molecules. Let's have a look exactly what that standard is. My dear students, in order to make that standard, what I'll be doing exactly? I will be taking a carbon 12 atom. I will be taking one carbon 12. Let's assume this is the carbon 12 atom over here, which I have taken, right? Now, people, I'll be simply dividing this carbon 12 atom into 12 equal parts. I divided the carbon 12 atom into 12 equal parts. Now, if I take one part over here, this shaded part, can I say this shaded part, its mass is going to be 1 twelfth of, its mass is going to be 1 twelfth of the mass of the whole carbon 12 atom? Right? Can I say something like this? 
Absolutely. I took one carbon toll atom. I divided the carbon toll atom into two equal parts. Now, I'm taking one small shaded part over here. And I'm saying the mass of this shaded part, the mass of this small part, it's one twelfth of the mass of carbon. Now, dear students, this one twelfth of mass of carbon toll atom, this one twelfth of mass of carbon toll atom, the mass of this particular shaded part over here, that's something which you call as 1 AMU. You can call it as 1 U or you can call it as 1 D as well. Let me tell you, this AMU over here, it stands for the atomic mass unit. It stands for the atomic mass unit. This U over here, it stands for the unified mass. It stands for the unified mass. And this D over here, it stands for Dalton. So what exactly I did? I took a carbon tool. I divided the carbon tool atom into two equal parts. Then I took one small part. And I'm telling you mass of the small part, mass of the shaded part, it is basically one twelfth of the mass of carbon tool. And one twelfth of the mass of carbon tool atom, that's something which I call as one AMU, or you can call it as one U, or you can call it as one D, right? I hope everything is clear till here. Now, my dear students, what scientists exactly did? What scientists did? They calculated the mass of one whole carbon toll atom. They calculated the mass of one whole carbon toll atom by using a technique called as mass spectrometry. By using a technique called as mass spectrometry, what scientists did? They calculated the mass of whole carbon toll atom. And the mass of whole carbon toll atom, it came out to be 1.99 into 10 raised power minus 23 grams. So this 1.99 into 10 raised power minus 23 grams. If I ask you, if I ask you, is this the mass of whole carbon toll atom? Absolutely, this 1.99 into 10 raised power minus 23 grams, this is the mass of whole carbon. Yes, students, if you know the mass of whole carbon toll atom in grams, can you let me know? What will be the mass of this shaded part in grams? Absolutely. I'll be dividing this particular term by 12. I'll be getting the mass of the shaded part. Right? As simple as that. Let me summarize everything over here in detail. My dear students, I'm writing a statement which is what you are going to remember from now on. I'm writing 1 AMU, which is basically 1 U, which is what you call as 1 D. How do you define it? One twelfth of one twelfth of the mass of carbon toll. One twelfth of the mass of carbon toll atom. And the mass of whole carbon toll atom, it came out to be how much? 1.99 into 10 raised power minus 23 grams. Now, if I'm dividing this number by 12, I'll be getting the value exactly as 1.66 into 10 raised to the power minus 24 grams. Right? And this students, this 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 gram. You can represent it like this as well. 1 divided by Avogadro's number. And its units will be taken in gram. 1 divided by Avogadro's number. Yes, students, if you divide the number 1 by the Avogadro's number, whose value is 6.022 into 10 raised power 23, you'll be getting the value exactly as 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24. So this is the first statement which I would want every one of you to remember from now on. This is important. Do remember this particular statement from now on. Okay. Perfect. So what is 1 AMU? 1 AMU, you call it as 1 U. You call it as 1 D. Right? You call it as 1 D. Okay. It is defined as the 1 twelfth of the mass of carbon toll atom. Since already you know the mass of 1 carbon toll atom. You just need to divide it by the number 12. You'll be getting the value of 1 AMU. You'll be getting the mass of 1 twelfth of the carbon toll atom, which comes out to be 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams. My dear students, you can write it as 1 divided by Avogadro's number. Is this part clear to everyone till here? Quickly, let me know in the chats. This Na here is the Avogadro's number. 6.02 to 8 to 10 raised power 23. If you divide 1 by Avogadro's number, you'll be getting the value exactly as 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24. So quickly, my dear students, in the chats with the thumbs ups, if you got it properly, what I said till now.
quickly everyone <coughs> perfect all right now dear students if it is clear to everyone let's try to understand few statements here i'm writing the first statement i'm writing atomic mass of atomic mass of nitrogen atomic mass of nitrogen what does it mean atomic mass of nitrogen means that i am talking about the mass of i am talking about the mass of one atom of nitrogen it means that i am talking about the mass of one atom of nitrogen. and every one of you must be knowing that the atomic mass of nitrogen is nothing it is just 14 amu right it's 14 amu all of you must be knowing now dear students this 14 amu can't we write it like this 14 multiplied by 1 amu absolutely we can write it like this for sure right can you write 14 multiplied by instead of 1 amu can we write 1 twelfth of the mass of carbon 12 atom absolutely we can do that right my dear students instead of 1 amu Instead of 1 amu, can't we write 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams? Absolutely, we can do that. Instead of 1 amu, my dear students, can't I write 1 divided by Avogadro's number in grams? Write all these things we can write. The choice is all yours. The point is, what is meant by all these statements which I have mentioned here? Let's have a look exactly what is meant by all these statements which I have mentioned over here. I wrote a term atomic mass of nitrogen. That means I am talking about the mass of one atom of nitrogen, which comes out to be 14 a.m. What does that mean? That means one atom of nitrogen is 14 times heavier than one a.m. That means one atom of nitrogen is 14 times heavier than one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. Right? Can I say this is basically the mass of one nitrogen atom in grams? Or you can say this term over here. This is again the mass of one nitrogen atom. Quickly, let me know if all these terminologies are clear to you. Quickly, my dear students, everyone, everyone in the chats, is this particular statement clear to every one of you? Quickly. Quickly, my dear students, quickly, everyone. Quickly. Yeah. Let me write one more statement. In the similar format so that it becomes properly clear to you. Okay, let me use a different slide, just a second. All right. I'm writing a term over here. For example, I'm writing atomic mass of oxygen. Atomic mass of oxygen. What does it mean? Does it mean that I'm talking about? Does it mean that I'm talking about the mass of one atom of oxygen? Yes, I'm talking about the mass of one atom of oxygen. Now you tell me how much it is. Can I say it is nothing, it is just 16 AMU? Can I say 16 AMU can be written as 16 multiplied by 1 AMU? Absolutely. Instead of 1 AMU, we can write anything. 1 twelfth of the mass of carbon 12 atom. Instead of 1 AMU, we can write 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams. Instead of 1 AMU, we can write 1 divided by Avogadro's number in grams as well. Now the point is what is meant by all these terms? What is the meaning of all these terms? What is the meaning of all these terms? Right now people, we are talking about the atomic mass of oxygen. That means we are calculating the mass of one atom of oxygen, which is coming out to be 16 amu. That means one atom of oxygen is 16 times heavier than one amu. One atom of oxygen is 16 times heavier than one twelfth of the mass of carbon to atom. This is the mass of one atom of oxygen in grams. Even this is the mass of one atom of oxygen. So what is atomic? What is atomic mass? If you want to define the atomic mass now, can I say atomic mass is nothing? Atomic mass is just a number. 14 in case of nitrogen. 16 in case of oxygen. Atomic mass is just a number which tells us how many times an atom of an element is heavier than one twelfth of the mass of it. Right? Yes? What is atomic mass? I am writing its definition now. Atomic mass is a number. Atomic mass is a number. 
एटॉमिक मास इज अ नंबर विच टेल्स हाउ मेनी टाइम्स हाउ मेनी टाइम्स एन एटम ऑफ एन एलिमेंट एन एटम ऑफ एन एलिमेंट is heavier than is heavier than 1 amu so dear students if it is clear to everyone let me know quickly in the chats with a thumbs up everyone everyone quickly in the chats someone is saying video is not clear you just need to increase the quality of your video go and change it i think you are watching it at 360 140p something quickly people if this particular definition is clear to everyone do let me know in the chats with a thumbs up yeah perfect all right so if the term atomic mass is clear to you let's have a look on one more thing let's have a look on one more my dear students i took nitrogen in the beginning right i took nitrogen in the big and we know i took nitrogen in the beginning now related to nitrogen i'm going to write few terminology related to nitrogen i'm going to write few terminology first i'm writing 14 amu second i'm only writing 14 and third i'm writing 14 multiplied by 1 amu and instead of 1 amu i'm writing 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 gram if you ask me whether all these terminologies are same or different if you ask me whether all the terminologies are same or different let me tell you this 14 amu is what you will be calling as the atomic mass of nitrogen you should be calling this as the atomic mass of nitrogen this 14 over here you will be calling it as the relative atomic mass of nitrogen you will be calling it as the relative atomic mass of nitrogen and this particular term over here you will be calling this as the actual mass of nitrogen you will be calling it as the actual mass of nitrogen yeah okay similarly if i take oxygen into consideration oxygen yeah i'm taking oxygen here dear students dear students related to oxygen i'm writing again three terminology right first i'm writing 16 amu then i'm writing only 16 then i'm writing 16 multiplied by 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 gram you need to let me know whether these three terminologies are same or different these are absolutely different the 16 amu you will be calling this as the atomic mass of oxygen atomic mass of oxygen the 16 here you'll be calling it as the relative atomic mass of oxygen and this particular term that you will be calling it as the actual mass of oxygen quickly let me know in the chats if every single thing is clear till here with the thumbs ups people everyone everyone in the chats quickly if all the things are clear to everyone quickly my dear students yeah so the first concept of atomic mass i think it is done understood is damn clear to everyone now one thing i would want you all to do what is that you just have to remember atomic masses of some element just do that just do that okay atomic masses of some elements now you must be thinking which all elements sir is talking about just re do remember the atomic mass of certain elements starting from hydrogen till zinc the first 30 elements the first 30 elements their atomic masses you have to remember that's all that's all right perfect that's all yeah okay someone is asking about the notes notes you'll be getting on this telegram t.me slash w a s s i m s i r c h e m this is the telegram channel on which you'll be getting the handwritten notes right okay this is the telegram channel on which you'll be getting the handwritten notes perfect so i think the first terminology it's clear to everyone let's move on to the second terminology what is second terminology it's again very simple what is it molecular mass molecular mass. what is molecular mass all about 
Panya, I just told you, just remember the atomic masses from hydrogen till zinc, the first 30 elements, their atomic masses you have to remember. Okay? All right. Second terminology, that is molecular mass. Molecular mass, how do we define it? The sum of atomic masses. The sum of atomic masses. The sum of atomic mass. So, first of all, like we defined atomic mass, mass of one atom of an element. In the similar way, you can define this molecular mass. In simple words, you can define it like this. Molecular mass is basically the mass of single molecule. You can define it like this. The mass of single molecule. The mass of single molecule. And how will you calculate it? The sum of atomic mass of all the elements present in what does that mean? What does that mean? Let's have a look. For example, I'm writing water over here. I'm writing water over here. Let's assume I need to calculate the molecular mass of water. What do I need to do? I need to calculate the molecular mass of water. What does that mean? That means I need to calculate the mass of one molecule of water. That means I need to calculate the mass of one molecule of water. Now, my dear students, this water, it is made up of two different elements, hydrogen and oxygen, right? Hydrogen, its atomic mass is 1 amu. There are two hydrogen atoms, so multiplied by 2. Oxygen, its atomic mass is 16 amu, and there is one oxygen atom, right? The value over here comes out to be 18. Now, it's completely your choice. Whether you want to write 18 amu, or you want to write u, or you want to write d, the choice is all you want. But preferably, in the case of molecules, we write u over here. Yeah? So, this 18u, can I further write it as 18 multiplied by 1u? Absolutely. 1u is basically nothing. It is 1 twelfth of the mass of carbon 12 atom. And instead of 1u, can't I write 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams? Absolutely. Now, let's try to understand the meaning of all these terms. What is the meaning of all these terminologies? I just wanted to calculate the molecular mass of water. I just wanted to calculate the mass of one molecule of water. And the mass of one molecule of water came out to be 18 U. That means one molecule of water is 18 times heavier than one U. One molecule of water is 18 times heavier than one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. And this is the mass of one water molecule. In That's all. Simple and basic. For example, I'm writing a term glucose over here. I'm writing a term glucose, right? Let's say I need to calculate the molecular mass of glucose. Let's say I need to calculate the molecular mass of glucose. What does that mean? That means I want to calculate the mass of one molecule of glucose. I need to calculate the mass of one molecule of glucose. The mass of one molecule of glucose. How do you calculate the mass of one molecule of glucose? Just do the sum of atomic masses. Nothing else. Starting with carbon. Carbon has got the atomic mass of 12 AMU. And how many carbon atoms do we have? Six carbon atoms. Apart from carbon, we have got hydrogen. Its atomic mass is 1 AMU. And there are 12 hydrogen atoms. Similarly, oxygen is present as well. Whose atomic mass is 16 AMU. And there are six oxygen atoms. My dear students, when you calculate it, when you solve it, what is the value which you'll be getting? You'll be getting the value exactly as 180U. And this 180U, I can write as 180 multiplied by 1U. I can do that. Right? I can do that. And instead of this 1U, you can write all the things. Instead of 1U, you can write 1 twelfth of the mass of carbon to atom. Instead of 1U, you can write 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams. Instead of 1U, you can write 1 divided by Avogadro's number in grams. All these things you can easily write over. Yeah? Right, people? So, what I was supposed to calculate? I was supposed to calculate the molecular mass of glucose. I was supposed to calculate the mass of one molecule of glucose. And how did I do it? I just did the sum of atomic mass. Nothing else. The molecular mass of glucose, it came out to be 180. So, one molecule of glucose is 180 times heavier than 1U. One molecule of glucose is 180 times heavier than 1 twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. This is the mass of one molecule of glucose. 
that's all right is this super clear to everyone let me know quickly in the chats with a thumbs up i want the chats to go up continuously quickly my dear students is this super clear to everyone is this super clear to everyone quickly Quickly, let me know in the chats. Everyone, everyone, everyone. If the term molecular mass is clear, that means we can write its definition now. We can write its actual definition. Can I say molecular mass? It is a number. Molecular mass, it is a number which tells. which tells how many times a molecule which tells how many times a molecule is heavier is heavier than one twelfth of the mass of carbon to an atom right it is again one more definition of the term molecular mass i hope it's super clear right and dear students <clears throat> dear students one more thing let's have a look on one more for example i am taking ammonia into consideration nh3 <clears throat> nh3 first of all is it atom or molecule it's absolutely a molecule right nh3 it's a molecule now dear students i am writing few terminologies related to nh3 the first terminology i am writing 17u the second terminology i am writing 17 third terminology i am writing 17 multiplied by 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24. Now, what is the meaning of all these three terminals? You should be knowing the meaning now. Dear students, the 17U, I will be calling it as the molecular mass of NH3. This is something which I'll be calling as the molecular mass of NH3. This 17 only, without the units, I'll be calling it as the relative molecular mass. I'll be calling it as the relative molecular mass of nh and dear students this particular term the last term over here i will be calling this as the actual mass of nh i'll be calling this as the actual mass of NH3. i hope all these three terminologies are clear to you now if all these three terminologies are clear then you have to tell me the answer of one simple question what is that have a look i'm writing oxygen here in the atomic form and over here somewhere I am writing oxygen in the molecular form. The difference is here I am taking oxygen in atomic form. Here I am taking oxygen in molecular form. Dear students, here I am writing 16 AMU, then I am writing 16, then I am writing 16 multiplied by 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 gram. And over here, first term I am writing as 32U, the second term I am writing only 32, the third terminology I am writing 32 multiplied by 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 24. You need to tell me the meaning of all these terminology. Tell me the meaning of all these terminology. The first terminology 16 AMU. What is it? It is basically the atomic mass of oxygen. Since oxygen hair is in atomic form. Oxygen hair is in atomic form. And hair, oxygen is not in atomic form. It is basically in molecular form. It is basically in molecular form, right? This is the difference. That's all. Yeah. This particular term I'm calling as atomic mass of oxygen. And this 16, I'll be calling it as the relative atomic mass of oxygen. And this particular term, I'll be calling it as the actual mass of O. <clears throat> actual mass of O, correct? What about these terminology? 32U. What is it? It is basically the molecular mass of oxygen. Because here oxygen is in molecular form. 32. Relative molecular mass of oxygen. This particular term. Actual mass of O2. I hope all these three terminologies are very, very, very clear to you. So let me know once in the chats if all these terminologies are clear. So that we can solve your questions. Quickly guys. Everyone. Everyone.
everyone in the chats with the thumbs ups. All clear? All clear, guys? Everyone, everyone, quickly. <coughs> Perfect. Let's try to solve a few questions which can be asked out of the two concepts which I've taught you till now. Yeah. Let's see what kind of questions can be asked. Have a look, guys. <clears throat> this is the first question on the screen. And these sort of questions can be asked. The question is if 1u is defined as 124th of the mass of carbon dollar, calculate the molecular mass of carbon dioxide on this new scale. So what the question says and how we are going to deal with these. Have a look. First of all, as per the question is concerned, we have to define one U. We have to define one U as one twenty fourth, one twenty fourth of the mass of carbon dollar. Right? This is something. This is how we have to define one U as per the question. Right? This is. How we have to define one u as per the equation. So this is the new scale. This is the new scale as per the equation. Okay. What is the scale which we have chosen? We have chosen one scale like this. One u is nothing. One twelfth of the mass of carbon dollar. This is the scale which we have chosen long back. Right. So the first statement over here. It is a new scale. This one is the conventional scale, the old scale. Correct. Right, people. Now. Let's call the first equation as equation 1. Let's call this as equation number 2. Let's call this as equation number 2. Always your first step has to be, you need to get the relation between u and u dash. That has to be your first step all the time. Get the relation between u and u dash. Now, dear students, the point is, how we are going to get the relation between u and u dash? Let's do one thing. Divide these two equations. Divide these two equations. Let's, equate, let's divide equation 2 by equation 1. Equation 2 by equation 1. So it's going to be u divided by u dash. u divided by u dash. Mass of carbon 12. Mass of carbon 12 cancel. Here you'll be getting 1 by 12. Here you'll be getting 1 by 24. u divided by u dash is coming out to be 2 here. And if u divided by u dash is coming out to be 2, what does that mean? What does that mean? That means, that means u is coming out to be equal to 2 times u. I hope this is clear. This has to be your first step all the time. Get the relation. Get the relation between u and u dash. Okay. Well, after getting the relation between u and u dash, there's one more thing which you need. There's one more thing which you need. What is that? Tell me, what is the molecular mass of carbon dioxide as per the old scale, as per the conventional scale? What about the molecular mass of carbon dioxide? As per the old scale, as per the conventional scale, it's going to be carbon 12 plus oxygen 16 multiplied by 2. Value comes out to be 44U. This is basically the molecular mass of carbon dioxide as per conventional scale, as per old scale. But we have to calculate the molecular mass of carbon dioxide as per new scale. That means the answer has not to be in terms of U. It has to be in terms of U dash. That's all. Yeah. So what I'll be doing? This 44u, I'll be writing as 44 multiplied by 1u. And my dear students, already, instead of 1u, I can write 2 times u dash. I can write 2 times u dash. So the final answer of this particular question will come, come out to be 88u dash over here. So, so this is the molecular mass of carbon dioxide as per the new scale which is given to us as per the question. And this was the molecular mass of carbon dioxide as per the conventional scale as per the... If this is super clear to you, let me know once in the chats with a thumbs up. Every one. Quickly. Quickly, guys. Everyone. Yeah? Perfect. All right. So, let's try to solve one more question. Let me see if you can solve this one or not. Can you give it a try? The same procedure which you'll be following in this question as well. You do not have to do something new here. You'll be following the same procedure which I told you. As per this question, if 1u is defined as 1 sixth of the mass of carbon 12, we are defining 1u as, as per the question, 1u is defined as 
one sixth of one sixth of the mass of carbon twelve. Okay, as per the question, and how we have defined the U as per conventional scale that was one twelfth of the mass of carbon twelve. That was one twelfth of the mass of carbon twelve. Yes, students. Let's call this as equation number one. Let's call this as equation number two. The first step always is to get the relation between u and u dash. I'll be dividing the two equations. Dividing equation two by equation one. What do I get? U divided by u dash. U divided by u dash is equal to mass of carbon twelve. Mass of carbon twelve cancel. Here you'll be writing one by twelve. Here you'll be writing one by six. So u divided by u dash is coming out to be one by two. Or we can say u is nothing. It is just u dash divided by 2. This is something which we got till now. u is equal to u dash divided by 2. Now, dear students, what is the next step? What do we have to calculate? We need to calculate the molecular mass of NH3 as per the new scale. Now, if I ask you, what is the molecular mass of NH3 as per the conventional scale? Molecular mass of NH3 as per the conventional scale, how much that is? Nitrogen, it's 14. Plus hydrogen, it's 1 multiplied by 3. The value will be 17 U. But do we have to write the answer in terms of U or U dash? We have to write the answer in terms of right? So, you can write it as 17 multiplied by 1 U. And my dear students, instead of 1 U, you'll be writing just U dash by 2. So, it's going to be 17 multiplied by U dash divided by 2. The final answer will come out to be 8.5 U dash. So, this is the molecular mass of NH3 as per what? As per the new scale. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect people. Now, if you got to know how to deal with these questions, then I would want you guys to write a note. I would want you guys to write a note. What is the note? What is the note? Notice, have a look. This was the molecular mass of NH3 as per the scale which we have chosen in the beginning. This is the molecular mass of NH3 as per the new scale. So, if I ask you, on changing the scale, is the molecular mass of the substance changing? Yes. Initially, it was 17 U. Now, it's 8.5 U dash. So, if you change the scale, molecular mass of the substance, it changes. But do remember, on changing the scale, actual mass, actual mass does not change at all. Do remember this. Do remember this. Actual mass of NH3 will always remain as 17 multiplied by 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24. Right? Do take a note of it. Actual mass, actual mass of a substance, actual mass of a substance does not change, does not change on changing, on changing the scale. Okay, this is one important note which you are going to remember from now on. Yeah? Guys, everything clear to you? Quickly. Quickly in the chats. Everyone. 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 Quickly. All clear? You should be telling me if all the things are clear in the chats with a thumbs up. Yes, I'll be giving you breaks in between. The first break will be at 8. Yeah. PYQs, everything I'll be doing. Just wait, just wait. Try to learn things. Try to understand the concepts first. Get the concepts, all the things will be done here all. You not to worry about it. Okay. Perfect. Let's move on now to one more term. That's something which you call as molar mass. Have you heard about the term molar mass? Have you heard about the term molar mass? You must have heard, right? What is molar mass all about? Molar mass of the substance, it is defined as it is defined as the mass of one mole of a substance. It is defined as the mass of one mole of a substance and it is expressed in grams per mole. 
Now, what is meant by that? Before going into the molar mass, before going into the molar mass, what is meant by one mole of a substance? This is something I assume everyone will be knowing, right? What is one mole of substance? If I'm writing a statement, one mole of a substance, if I'm writing one mole of a substance, what does that mean? That means we have got 6.022 into 10 raised power 23 particles of that substance, right? If I say I have got one mole of a substance, that means I have got 6.022 into 10 raised power 23 particles of that substance. If I say, if I say I have got one mole carbon, what does that mean? That means I have got 6.022 into 10 raised power 23, since carbon is in atomic form, so I'll be writing atoms of carbon. As simple as that. Yeah. If I write, if I write one mole water, what does it mean? It means I have got 6.022 into 10 raised power 23. Here water is in molecular form, so I'll be writing molecules of water. As simple as that. If I say I have got one mole marker, that means I have got 6.022 into 10 raised power 23 marker. As simple as that. Okay. Now, dear students, understand and analyze things. Particles can be atoms, particles can be molecules, particles can be ions, anything. Yeah. Class timing every day will be 5 p.m. Okay. Now, people, mass of one mole of a substance is something which we call as molar mass. For example, I need to calculate molar mass of carbon. That means I need to know the mass of one mole of carbon. Let's say I need to calculate the molar mass of water. What does that mean? That means mass of one mole of water. Molar mass of nitrogen. Mass of one mole of nitrogen. Molar mass of marker. Mass of one mole of marker. Right? So in short, what is molar mass? Molar mass is nothing. It is just mass of one mole of it. That's all. Right? Now let's try to understand it a bit more in detail. Yes, students. I am writing a term over here as, I am writing a term here as molar mass of, molar mass of oxygen, molar mass of oxygen, O, oxygen I am taking in atomic form, molar mass of O, what does it mean, molar mass of O, what does it mean, it means I am talking about, I am talking about the mass of one mole of O, right? Simple, molar mass of O means mass of one mole of O. If I ask you, in one mole of O, how many atoms of O will be there? In one mole of O, how many atoms of O will be there? Can I write this mass of one mole of O like this? Mass of 6.02 to 10 raised power 23, which you call as Avogadro's number. Mass of NaO atoms. Can I say something like this? Both the statements are same. Their meaning is same, right? Now, understand one more thing. Mass of Na oxygen atom. Mass of Na oxygen atom. So, can I say, instead of mass of Na oxygen atoms, can I write, mass of one oxygen atom, mass of one oxygen atom, multiplied by Avogadro's number. Will it make a difference? All the three statements, they are same. Their meaning is, if you say, we are calculating mass of one mole of oxygen. If you say we are calculating the mass of any oxygen atoms or mass of one oxygen atom multiplied by Avogadro's number, all these three terminologies are one and the same. Yeah? Now comes a point. Have a look. Mass of one oxygen atom, mass of one oxygen atom, we call that as the atomic mass of oxygen. And you know, atomic mass of oxygen, it is nothing, it's 16 am. And here, you are writing Avogadro's number. Yeah, the 16 AMU, you can further write it as 16 multiplied by 1 AMU. And here, you know, it's Avogadro's number. And my dear students, in the beginning only, I told you 1 AMU is nothing. It is 1 divided by Na grams. And here you have got Na, Na, Na cancel. The value comes out to be 16. What is the 16? 16 is basically the molar mass of oxygen. And molar mass, it's expressed in grams per mole. What does it mean? What does the 16 grams per mole mean? It means mass of one mole of oxygen is 16. Mass of one mole of oxygen is 16 grams. If oxygen is taken in atomic form, right? This is the mass of one mole of oxygen. Perfect. 
Now, what was the atomic mass of oxygen? Atomic mass of oxygen was 16 amu. That means mass of one atom of oxygen was 16 amu. Molar mass of oxygen came out to be 16 grams. So, do you see the magnitude wise? Both the things are same. It is just the units are different. When you write amu as the unit, it becomes atomic mass. When you write grams per mole as the unit, it becomes molar mass. Nothing else. Yeah? Perfect. So, let me quickly summarize it. Let me quickly summarize it. Have a look what I'm going to say. Let me quickly summarize it. Have a look properly, guys, what I'm going to tell you now. For example, for example, I'm talking about carbon. I'm talking about carbon, okay? I am talking about carbon. Dear students, the first terminology which I'm writing, that's 12 AMU. Second terminology, I'm writing as 12. Third terminology, I'm writing as 12 into 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams. Fourth terminology, instead of 12 AMU, I'm writing 12 grams. There are 12 grams per mole. Now, if I ask you whether all these terminologies are same or different, these are different. What is the meaning of all these terminologies? This 12 AMU is something, since carbon here is in atomic form, right? It's in atomic form. So, this 12 AMU, it is the mass of one atom of carbon and you call that as the atomic mass. This is the atomic mass of carbon. This 12 here, this is called as the relative atomic mass of carbon. This particular term, you call this as the actual mass of carbon. And the last term over here, the last term over here, 6, 12 grams per mole, 12 grams per mole. That means the mass of one mole of carbon is 12 grams, right? This is something which you call as molar mass of carbon. This is something which you call as molar mass of carbon. This is something which is the mass of one mole of carbon, 12 grams, right? Perfect. Now, dear students, whether I have taken carbon in atomic form or molecular form, I have taken carbon in atomic form. So, instead of molar mass, you can use one more term. You can use gram atomic mass. You can call it as gram atomic mass. No issue. Yeah. One more term. For example, I'm writing NH3 now. Let's say I'm writing NH3. I'm writing few terminologies related to NH3. Let's see what it means exactly. First terminology, I'm writing as 17U. Then I'm writing only 17. Then I'm writing 17 multiplied by 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 24 grams. Then I'm writing 17 instead of U, I'm writing grams per mole. Grams or grams per mole. Okay. So whether the meaning of all these things is same or different. First of all, NH3 here, it is not in atomic form, it's in molecular form. Right? It's a molecule. Yeah? Now, the 17U is what you'll be calling as the molecular mass. Molecular mass. This 17 is something which I call as relative molecular mass. This particular term, I will be calling it as the actual mass. Right? And this particular term, I'll be calling it as the molar mass of energy. This is the molar mass of NH3. Now, dear students, one more thing. One more thing. Since NH3 is taken in molecular form, so instead the term molar mass, should I be writing gram atomic mass or gram molecular mass? You can call it as the gram molecular mass as well. Now, if all these terms are clear to you, do let me know once in the chats with the thumbs ups. Quickly. Quickly, guys. Everyone in the chats with the thumbs ups quickly.
perfect all right guys perfect 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 so if this is clear to everyone then let's try to solve one basic question basic question you guys are you guys are going to solve it what do you think about this question quickly you guys are going to solve this question give it a try give it a try people give it a try quickly the mass of one atom of x is given the mass of one atom of x is given we need to calculate the molar mass of x we need to calculate the molar mass of x so my dear students what is meant by molar mass of x molar mass of x means molar mass of x means the mass of one mole of x right molar mass of x means mass of one mole of x what is meant by mass of one mole of x mass of one mole of x means mass of na x atoms right mass of na x atoms i'm writing it mass of na x atoms now dear students few minutes back only i told you how to write this particular state mass of any x atoms means the mass of one x atom the mass of one x atom multiplied by what multiplied by avogadro's number simple right now the mass of one x atom is given to us it's 4 into 10 raised power minus 23 grams multiplied by what avogadro's number 6.022 Into 10 raised power 23. So this term, this term got cancelled. Six fours are comes out to be 24, and its units are going to be in grams. So this 24 grams is basically the molar mass of x. This is the mass of one mole of x. One mole of x has got the mass of 24. In short, so from now onwards, if you will be given with the mass of one atom of element, if you will be given with the mass of one atom of element, just multiply the mass of one atom of element by the Avogadro's number. By the Avogadro's number, you will be getting the molar mass, and molar mass it's expressed in grams. You know it, yeah? Perfectly done. Perfectly done. All right, people. Wonderful. So I hope all the three terminologies which I told you till now, I hope all these three terminologies are clear. Now let's have a look on one more important topic. That is average atomic mass of an isotopic mixture. This is again one important topic from which question. Okay. So first of all, if I ask you what the isotopes are, what are isotopes? How do you define the term isotope? How do you define the term isotope? Isotopes are nothing. These are the. These are the atoms. these are the atoms of same element atoms of same element having having same atomic number but but different atomic mass this is something which every one of you would be knowing right isotopes are the atoms of same element having same atomic number but different atomic now guys what it means exactly if you talk about your hydrogen hydrogen right every one of you must be knowing hydrogen it has got three atoms hydrogen has got three atoms which have got same atomic number which have got same atomic number But their atomic masses are different. This is one. This is two. This is three. Can I say these are the three atoms of the same element which have got same atomic number but different atomic masses? Absolutely. So I'll be calling these three atoms. I'll be calling these three atoms as the isotopes of hydrogen. As simple as that. I'll be calling them as the isotopes of hydrogen. Similarly, dear students. Similarly, if you talk about, for example, chlorine. If you talk about chlorine. chlorine has got two atoms chlorine has got two atoms which have got same atomic number which have got same atomic number but their atomic mass is different this is 35 this is 37 so can i categorically say these are basically the atoms of chlorine 
which have got same atomic number but different atomic masses absolutely so again these two atoms i will be calling as the isotopes of i'll be calling them as isotopes of chlorine so what are isotopes isotopes are just the atoms of same element having same atomic number but different atomic mass as simple as that. okay now dear students let's try to understand few important terminologies related to isotopes yeah and do remember them for example <clears throat> for example i am taking an element x okay this is the element which i have i am assuming this x has got three atoms this x has got three atoms which have got same atomic number which i am representing with z or different atomic masses this is m1 this is m2 this is m3 can i say these are the three atoms of x which have got same atomic number but different atomic masses absolutely so i should be calling these three atoms as the isotope now people whenever the element exists in isotopic forms whenever the element has isotope do remember whenever the element has isotopes we do not calculate the normal atomic mass for that element. what do we do we calculate average atomic mass of that particular whenever the element exists in the form of isotope we do not calculate the normal atomic mass of the element what do we calculate we calculate the average atomic mass of it and in order to calculate the average atomic mass of an element what do we need what do we need we need percentage abundances we need percentage abundances or we need mole percentage of these isotopes what these percentage abundances and mole percentage are all about you'll get the idea in some time first of all remember what i'm saying whenever the element exists in the form of isotope what do we calculate for that element we calculate average atomic mass and in order to calculate the average atomic mass what do we need we need the percentage abundances of these isotopes i am assuming the percentage abundances of these isotopes i am representing with a b and c my dear students once you get the percentage abundances of these isotopes once you get the mole percentage of these isotopes you just have to have one formula what is the formula formula is m1a formula is m1a plus m2b plus m3c divided by a plus b plus c this is the general result by means of which you can calculate This is the general result by means of which you can calculate the average atomic mass of an element has got isotopes. Okay. Now the point is, what is meant by these percentage abundance? Before talking about the meaning of the percentage abundance, before talking about the meaning of percentage abundance, let me tell you one more statement. Do remember the sum of percentage abundance. The sum of percentage abundance. of all the isotopes of all the isotopes of a particular element of a particular element that's always equal to and what does that mean that means a plus b plus c plus whatever are given is always equal right now let me make you understand let me make you understand exact meaning of all these let's have a look what it means for example for example i am talking about chlorine i am talking about chlorine for okay just a second guys just a second yeah for example i am talking about chlorine we know chlorine has got okay so right here i'm talking about chlorine and we know chlorine has two isotopes one is cl35 another one is cl36 right these are the two atoms of chlorine which have got same atomic number but different atomic yeah so my dear students i'll be calling these atoms as the isotopes of chlorine So, if chlorine has got isotopes, do I calculate the normal atomic mass of chlorine? No, I do not calculate the normal atomic mass. What do I do? I will be calculating 
the average atomic mass. And you must be knowing, in order to calculate the average atomic mass of chlorine, what do I need? What do I need? I need the percentage abundances of these isotopes. And let me tell you, the percentage abundances of these isotopes of chlorine are 75 and 25 respectively. Okay. These percentage abundances, we represent them with A and B. This is the value of M1 and this is the value of M2. So, first of all, you must be thinking what these percentage abundances are all about. Since, my dear students, you know, in nature, chlorine exists. Chlorine exists in the form of Cl35 as well as in the form of Cl37. You know that. In nature, chlorine exists in the form of Cl35 as well as Cl37. Do remember, 75% of the chlorine atoms in the nature, they will be existing in the form of Cl35. And the remaining 25% of the chlorine atoms will be present in the form of Cl35. That is the percentage of That is the percentage of I'm giving you the percentage abundance of these isotopes. That means 75% of the chlorine atoms in nature, they will be present in the form of Cl35 and the remaining 25% will be present in the form of Now, my dear students, since chlorine has isotopes, if the element has isotopes, what do we do? Do we calculate normal atomic mass? No. Calculate average atomic mass. What is the formula to calculate average atomic mass? It's M1A plus M2B. Divided by what? Divided by. Now, if I ask you, what is the value of M1? M1 value is 35. What is the value of A? 75. What about the value of M2? 37. B? 25. And A plus B value, that's always equal to 100. So, when you solve it in this equation, you'll be getting the value exactly as 35.5. So, if I ask you, what is this 35.5 AMU is all about? Is it the normal atomic mass of chlorine? No, it is not the normal atomic mass. It is the average atomic mass of chlorine which we are calculating. Right? This is the average atomic mass of chlorine. Perfect. So, do remember whenever the element exists in the form of isotopes, we do not calculate the normal atomic mass of the element. We always calculate the average atomic mass of an element. And in order to calculate the average atomic mass of an element, what do we need? We need the percentage abundances or mole percentage of these isotopes. Once we get the percentage abundances or mole percentage of the isotopes, then you can directly use this particular result and get the average atomic mass of an element which exists in the form of what? Which exists in the form of I. Yeah? Perfect. Now, they can just modify the question basically. This was one question which I gave you, right? They can modify the same question. They can modify the same question. And, <coughs> and they can form a question like this. They can form a question like this. It's not mandatory that percentage abundances will be given to you, right? They can also ask you how to calculate the percentage abundance. Have a look how. For example, you have got a question like this. You have got the element X. It has got two isotopes. One is X35. One is X37. As per the question, the average atomic mass of X is 35.5 amu. We need to calculate the percentage abundances. We need to calculate the percentage abundances of these two isotopes. Can't we do it? Can't we do it? Element X, it has got two isotopes. Average atomic mass of element is given. We need to calculate the percentage abundance of these isotopes. Now, my dear students, have a look how we are going to solve these questions over here. Understand? First of all, this 35 is something which I call as M1. This 37 is here M2. Okay, few minutes back I told you, few minutes back I told you, few minutes back I told you, the sum of percentage abundances of all the isotopes of a particular element, that's always 100. I told you the sum of the atomic masses of all the isotopes of a particular element, that's always 100, right? So, let's assume the percentage abundance of the first isotope, that's X. So, the percentage abundance of another isotope that has to be 100 minus x. Okay. And percentage abundances, how do we represent them? We represent them with A and B. That's all. M average. Instead of M average, can't I write M1A plus M2B divided by A plus B? 
right? And this value as per the question is 35.5. M1 value is given to us as per the question 35. A value is X. M2 value 37. B value is 100 minus X. Divide by what? Divide by A plus B. That's always 100. And this value will be 35. Correct? Simple. Simple. So, my dear students, if you just do the cross multiplication, you'll be getting the value of x from here and the value of x will come out to be 75%. And what was this x? x was basically the value of a, which is the percentage abundance of x35, which is the percentage abundance of x35. So, if I ask you what is the percentage abundance of x37, percentage abundance of x37, that's b. And what was b? b was nothing, it was 100 minus x. So, 100 minus 75 comes out to be 25 percent. I hope it's super clear to everyone. Quickly, let me know in the chat with the thumbs up. Quickly, everyone, everyone, people. Everyone. Is it super clear to everyone quickly? Quickly with the thumbs ups, everyone. Perfect. Perfectly done. All right. Let's try to solve one more question so that this concept becomes properly clear to you. There was one question which was asked long back from the same concept, right? And see what kind of simple question was asked in your neat exam. Look at the question given. Look at the question given. The question is, we are given with boron. We are given with the element boron. And as per the question, boron has got two isotopes. One is boron 10 and another one is boron 11. Correct. As per the question, the percentage abundance of boron 10, it's given to us as 19. And percentage abundance of boron 11, it's given to us as 81. What are we supposed to calculate? We are supposed to calculate the average atomic mass of boron. MAV we have to calculate. Average atomic mass of boron. So dear students, this is something I'm calling as M1. This is something I'm calling as M2. This is the value of A. And this is the value of B. Just to use the formula, nothing else. I'll be using M1A plus M2B divided by what? Divided by A plus B. So, in order to calculate MAB, I'll be using M1 is given to us as 10. A value is 19. M2 value, that's given to us as 11. B value, that's 81. Divided by A plus B will be always 100. Just a matter of calculation and get the final answer. That's all. Nothing else. Yes, uh, if you want to join the Avengers batch, there's a code Avenger which you have to use. A V E N G E R. So people are saying final answer of this particular question is coming out to be 10.81 AMU, which will be absolutely the correct answer. Majority is saying, yeah, surely. Okay. Perfectly done. All right. One more question which I'm giving you. Let me see if you can solve this question or not. For example, you have got a question like this. The question is, we have got the element X. We have got the element X. Or let's talk about directly the magnesium. We have got the element magnesium. Magnesium, for example, it has got three isotopes. One is Mg24. One is Mg25. And one more is Mg26. These are the three isotopes of magnesium. Okay. As per the question, the percentage abundance of Mg24 that's given to us as 79. This is the percentage abundance of Mg. And at the same time, the average atomic mass of magnesium. The average atomic mass of magnesium is given to us as 24.31 AMU. Now, as per the question, we are supposed to calculate the percentage abundances of the remaining two isotopes. Can you do it? Can you do this question, guys? Can you do this question quickly? 
The ones who have not subscribed to the channel yet, I would want everyone to subscribe to the channel right now. And the ones who have not liked the session yet, please do like the session. Make the live count to 1K, 913 something. Yeah? Let's make the live count as well as number of likes to 1K. Quickly. Quickly. It's not increasing. Why is that? All right, people. So let's have a look exactly how this sort of a question I'm going to solve here. Understand? First of all, we know the sum of the percentage abundances of all these isotopes, that has to be 100. The sum of percentage abundances of all these isotopes of magnesium, that has to be 100. Okay? So, people, just understand one thing. The percentage abundance of the first isotope is 79. That means, what will be the percentage abundance of the remaining two isotopes? The percentage abundance of the remaining two isotopes, that has to be 21. Because the sum eventually has to be 100. The sum eventually has to be 100. The percentage abundance of the first one is 79. That means the percentage abundance of the remaining two isotopes. That has to be 21. So out of that 21 percentage, let's assume the first isotope has got the percentage abundance of X. So the second one has to be, it has to be 21 minus. I hope this particular step is clear to everyone. I hope this particular step is clear to everyone. The first isotope, its I abundance is 79. The second one, it's X. The third one, automatically, it has to be 21. Okay? This particular term, 79, I'm representing with A. This term, I'm representing with B. And this term, I'm representing with C. 24 is the value of M1. 25 is the value of M2. And 26 is the value of M3. Now, dear students, instead of MAV, can't I write M1A plus M2B? plus M3C divided by A plus B plus C, that value is already 100 and this overall value is 24.5. M1 value, that's 24. A value, that's 79. M2 value, that's 25. B value, that's X. M3 value, that's 26. C value, that's 21 minus 6 divided by A plus B plus C, that's 100 and this overall value is equal to 24.5. Now, again, it's a matter of calculation. Again, it's a matter of calculation. You just have to cross multiply things over here and you'll be getting the value of X. And X value, as far as I remember, X value will come out to be 11. And what was this X exactly? X was basically the percentage abundance of MG25. This was the percentage abundance of MG25. Now, if you ask me, what will be the percentage abundance of MG26? That's 21 minus that's 21 minus 6. 21 minus 11. That means the percentage abundance of the remaining two isotopes we got to know came out to be 11. And so quickly in the chats, if everything seems clear till here. Quickly people, everyone. Everyone. Quickly. Quickly guys, everyone in the chats. I hope all these questions you can easily solve from now on. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, now let's move on. Something called as calculation of mole. Calculation of mole. Dear students, now we are going to enter into the actual mole curve. So, till now I was talking about some basic, basic things which are required in the chart. Now I'm going to actually enter into the chart. So first of all, I'll let you know how many different ways are there by means of which you can calculate number of moles. Okay, have a look people. Over here, I'm writing the terminology as the number of moles. The number of moles. Number of moles are represented by N. And there are many ways by means of which we can calculate number of moles per particle. How exactly? 
number of moles of the substance is always equal. Given mass of the substance in grams divided by molar mass of the substance in grams per. This is the first expression by means of which we can calculate. First x. Given mass of the substance divided by mole. The second way to calculate the number of moles of the substance that's equal to given number of particles. Given number of particles of the substance divided by what? Divided by Avogadro's number. This is one more result by means of which you can calculate. Given number of particles, given number of particles of a substance divided by Avogadro. My dear students, the third result to calculate number of moles. The third result to calculate number of moles is only valid for gases. Is only valid for gases. And the gas has to be present at STP. And STP already you must be knowing. STP means standard temperature pressure. Standard temperature pressure. When the gas is kept at the pressure of 1 atm and its temperature is kept as 0 degree centigrade, right? When you will be having a gas in the container, when you will be having a gas in the container whose pressure will be 1 atm, whose temperature will be 0 degree centigrade, then only we say the gas is present at STP. Now, whenever you'll be having a gas which will be present at STP, how do you calculate its number of moles? It's always equal to given volume of the gas in liters divided by 22.4 liters. Or if you take the given volume of the gas in milliliters, if you take the given volume of the gas in milliliters, then you have to divide it with 22400. Okay, these are few basic results by means of which we can calculate number of moles. Given mass of the substance divided by molar mass of the substance. Number two, given number of particles of the substance divided by Avogadro's number. Number three, given volume of the gas in liters divided by 22. So, these three basic results, let's exactly see how they are to be applied. How these results are applied in basic, basic. For example, one simple question you have. Calculate the number of moles present in 160 grams of NaO. Imagine that you have got a container which contains 160 grams of NaOH. And I am asking you that how many moles of NaOH are there in the container? What will be your answer? You will say mass of substance is given. You will say mass of substance is given. And we have to calculate moles of substance. How do you convert mass into moles? It's given mass divided by molar mass. Given mass of substance is 160 grams divided by molar mass of NaOH, 23 plus 16 plus 1. The value comes out to be 40 grams per mole. So what is the final answer? The value comes out to be 40. Now it's completely your wish. Whether you want to say that you have got 160 grams of NaOH in the container or you can say directly that you have got 4 moles of NaOH in the container. The choice is all yours. No worries at all. Right? You can say we have got 160 grams of NaOH in the container. Or you can say we have got 4 moles of NaOH. Look at the second thing. Calculate the number of moles present in 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide at STP. Now, if you ask me, if you ask me, since you have got 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide gas in the container, how many moles of carbon dioxide are there in the container? How many moles of carbon dioxide are there in the container? Check first of all, are we given with the mass of substance or volume of substance? We are given with the volume of substance. We are given with the volume of substance. Right? Perfect. And how do you convert volume into moles? It is given volume of gas in liters, which is 67.2 liters, divided by 22.4. The value comes out to be. Now, it's completely your wish. Whether you want to say that you have got 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide in the container, or you can say, you have got three moles of carbon dioxide. The choice is. Look at the next point. We are given with the atoms of carbon. Right? There are, for example, these many atoms of carbon in the container. And I am asking you, how many moles of carbon are there in the container? You will say, given number of particles, given number of particles divided by Avogadro's number. Given number of particles are 24 into 10 raised power 23 divided by Avogadro's number. The value comes out to be approximately 4. 
So whether you want to say that you have got these many atoms of carbon in the container, or you can say you have got four moles of carbon in the container. The choice is all yours. Again, you are given with the molecules of water in the container. You have got these many molecules of carbon in the container. Molecules again means particles only. So you are given with the particles of the substance. Convert the particles into moles. So let's calculate number of moles of water, which will be equal. Given number of particles, given number of particles divided by what? Divided by Avogadro's number. The value comes out to be exactly how much? It comes out to be 80. Right? It comes out to be 80. Perfect. So whether you want to say you have got these many molecules of water in the container, or you can say you have got 80 moles of water in the container, the meaning of both the things. Now, if I ask you, how many ways do we have to calculate number of moles of the substance? Till now, what we have learned? We have learned three things. If mass of the substance is given, divide the given mass of the substance by the molar mass. If number of particles of the substance are given, divide the given number of particles by the Avogadro's number. If volume of the gas at STP is given in liters, divide the given volume of the gas in liters by 22.4 liters, it will be exactly getting the number of moles of the gas, right? Hope it's clear. I hope it's clear to everyone, right? I hope it's clear to everyone. All right, people, some more basic, basic questions which we need to solve first. And in order to solve those basic questions, we should exactly know what the mole conversion diagram is, right? What the mole conversion diagram is. Have a look. My dear students, here I am writing the term number of moles. I am writing the term number of moles. Now, if you ask me, how many ways are there to calculate number of moles of the sun? I'll say there are three ways. Either will be given with the mass of the substance in grams. Either will be given with the mass of the substance in grams. Or will be given with or will be given with the volume of the gas in liters at STP, at STP, right? Or will be given with number of particles of the substance. Will be given with the number of particles of the substance. These are the three ways which can be given and accordingly, we'll be using the formula to calculate number of moles of the substance. Correct? Now, my dear students, if mass of the substance is given and you have to calculate number of moles, if mass of the substance is given and we have to calculate number of moles, what do we have to do? Divide the given mass of the substance by the molar mass of the substance, you'll be getting the value of number of moles. Right? If I do the reverse, if number of moles of the substance are given and we have to calculate mass, if moles are given, and we have to convert moles into mass. What do I do? I'll multiply moles by the molar mass of the substance. Okay? To get what? Get the mass of the substance. Similarly, if number of particles of the substance are given, I'll be dividing the number of particles by the Avogadro's number, and I will be getting the number of moles of the substance. Or, if moles are given and particles are to be calculated, then moles multiplied by Avogadro's number. Okay. Similarly, if volume of the gas at STP is given, then divide the given volume of the gas by 22.4 liters, you'll be getting number of moles. And if moles are given, just multiply it with 22.4 liters, you'll be getting the volume. This is one simple diagram, which will, I mean, by solving this particular diagram, by following this diagram, some basic, basic questions related to mole concept, related to basic mole concept can be easily done and done. Okay, now how to use this diagram, that is the point, that is the point, how to use this diagram. See guys, given mass divided by molar mass, that gives me moles, moles multiplied by molar mass, that gives me mass. Okay, simple. Number of particles divided by Avogadro's number, that gives me moles, moles multiplied by Avogadro's number, that gives me particles. Given volume divided by 22.4, moles, moles multiplied by 22.4. Guys, I'm not going to give you any sort of break now. We'll be taking the break exactly at, what is the time now? We'll be taking the break at 8. Okay, not now. Yeah? 
perfect do you know how this diagram how this conversion diagram came see guys it's simple look at the first result look at the first result i told you already if the mass of substance is given divide the given mass by the molar mass you will be getting moles or if moles are given multiply the moles by the molar mass you will be getting the mass that's what i told you correct similarly number of particles by avogadro's number you will be getting moles moles multiplied by avogadro's number you will be getting the number of particles nothing else yeah nothing else i hope whatever i'm telling you that's clear now my dear students how to use the diagram look at these basic basic calculate the mass of 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide at stp in gram look at the question carefully calculate the mass we have to calculate mass of 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide so we are given with 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide and we have to calculate the mass of 67.2 liters of carbon dioxide right correct that's something which we need to calculate we have to calculate the mass of these many liters of carbon dioxide. Now, what you exactly need to do? Have a look, understand properly what I'm going to do. First of all, you identify what is given to us. We are given with the volume of the gas. What we are supposed to calculate? We are supposed to calculate mass. We are given with volume. We are supposed to calculate mass. So, we are given with volume and we are supposed to calculate mass. Is there any direct relationship between volume and mass? There is no direct relationship between volume and mass. There is no such direct arrow between volume and mass. So what I'll be doing? We are given with the volume. We are supposed to calculate mass. So I will be starting with the volume. I'll be starting with the volume. And I will have to reach at mass. Whatever arrows will take me from volume to mass, I'll be following all those arrows. So this is the first arrow which I'll be following. This is the first arrow which I'll be following. From hair to hair, then from hair to hair. This has to be the second arrow. This has to be the second arrow which I'll be following. Perfect. So, two steps are there. I'll be starting from volume and I'll have to reach the mass. So, start with volume, follow this arrow, then follow this arrow. So, how many steps? Two steps. First step, convert volume into moles. Then convert moles into mass. That's all. So, the first step is, Number of moles of carbon dioxide, which is equal given volume of carbon dioxide in liters divided by 22.4. The value comes out to be 3. So we have calculated the moles. I mean, we have divided the given volume by 22.4. We got the moles. Now, moles multiplied by molar mass. That gives you what? That gives you the mass of carbon dioxide. So, mass of carbon dioxide in grams will be equal moles of carbon dioxide multiplied by molar mass of carbon. Now, dear students, moles of carbon dioxide, we have calculated 3. And molar mass of carbon dioxide, all of you must be knowing, that's 44 grams per mole. The value comes out to be how much? It will be 132. So, 132 grams is basically the mass of, the mass of 67.2 liters of carbon. That's simple. Look at the second question. Check, first of all, what is given. We are given with the mass of carbon dioxide. And what are we supposed to calculate? We are supposed to calculate the number of molecules. So, in this question, mass is given, particles are to be calculated. Mass is given, particles are to be calculated. Mass is given in this question now. In the second question, mass is given and particles are to be calculated. So, I will be starting from mass and I will have to reach to the particles. Whatever arrows will take me from, whatever arrows will take me from mass to particles, I'll be following them mass to particles so first this is the arrow which i'll be following right second this is the arrow which i'll be following. then only i'll reach from mass to the particle so how many steps two steps first step given mass divided by molar mass of the substance that gives me moles moles multiplied by avogadro's number that gives me the number of particles of the substance so two steps are there let's have a look two steps are there first step first step is convert Convert given mass into moles. Given mass divided by molar mass. That gives me the number of moles. So, my first step is number of moles of carbon dioxide. Which will be equal to given mass of carbon dioxide in grams divided by molar mass of carbon dioxide which is 44 grams per mole. The value comes out to be 10. So, first step is done. Moles are done. Right. 
Now we know moles multiplied by Avogadro's number. That gives me the number of molecules. So I am writing number of molecules. Number of molecules of what? Number of molecules of carbon dioxide. Which will be equal to moles of carbon dioxide multiplied by Avogadro's number. Moles of carbon dioxide means 10 multiplied by what? Multiplied by Avogadro's number. So these many molecules of carbon dioxide we have present in 440 grams of. I hope this is super clear to you. Right? I hope it is clear to everyone. Can you let me know the answer of this question quickly? This is again a simpler one. Quickly let me know its answer. Quickly let me know its answer. Calculate the volume of 128 grams of carbon dioxide at STP in liters. Quickly everyone. <laughs> volume of 128 grams of carbon dioxide. So we are given with what? We are given with mass and we have to calculate volume. So convert mass into moles first, then convert moles into volume. Correct? You can do this. You can do this. First step will be number of moles of carbon dioxide will be equal to given mass of carbon dioxide in grams divided by molar mass of carbon dioxide. What do we get? We'll be getting moles of carbon dioxide. Once you get the moles, volume of carbon dioxide will be moles of carbon dioxide multiplied by 22.4 the answer is going to be in liters that's all that's all right correct correct is it clear guys can you solve these sort of questions can you solve these sort of questions quickly in the chats Can you solve these sort of questions quickly? If you can solve these sort of questions, then you should be able to solve this one as well. Okay. For example, I'm writing the question like this. The question, for example, is like the, the mass of The mass of one atom of element X is equal to 4 into 10 raised power minus 23 grams. Calculate. Calculate the. Calculate the number of moles. Calculate the number of moles present in. 96 kg of x. Can you solve this question? Can you solve this question quickly? It's a simple question, guys. The mass of one atom of element x is given, and we are supposed to calculate number of moles present in 96 kg of x. We have to calculate number of moles present in 96 kg of x. So, mass of x is given, which is 96 kg. So, it is 96,000 grams. So, whenever mass of substance is given and you are supposed to calculate the moles, given mass, divide by what? Divide by molar mass of x, right? Well, do we know the molar mass of x? We do not know the molar mass of x. But what is meant by molar mass of x? Molar mass of x means, molar mass of x means mass of one mole of x. How do you calculate the molar mass? Mass of one atom multiplied by Avogadro's number. Mass of one atom multiplied by what? Multiplied by Avogadro's number. That gives you the molar mass. And units of molar mass now are going to be in grams per mole. So this term, this term got cancelled. Right? Grams, grams got cancelled. So it's going to be 96,000 divided by 6 fours are 24. So the value comes out to be uh, 4,000. Right? 400. 4? Perfect. So, what did we calculate here? We got to know in 96 kg of x, 96 kg of x means 4000 moles. I hope again this sort of a question you can easily solve from. Yeah? Is it clear? Is it clear to everyone? We were not given with the molar mass of x, but I've already told you molar mass is nothing, it's mass of one atom multiplied by Avogadro's number. That gives you the mass of one mole of element. 
and mass of one mole of element is something which is colder mass of as simple quickly if it is clear let me know once in the chats let me know once in the chats quickly yeah okay i'm giving you one more question let me see if you can solve this one or not let me see if you can solve this one or not the question is the question is how many how many moles of electrons weighs 1 kg how many moles of electrons weighs 1 kg you have to read the you have to understand the language of the question how many moles of electrons weighs 1 kg so what do we have to calculate we have to calculate what we have to calculate moles of electrons what are we given with we are given with the mass of the substance how do you convert mass into moles how do you convert mass into moles you will be writing number of moles of electrons is equal to given mass of electrons in grams divided by molar mass of electron simple right what is the given mass that is 1 kg 1 kg means 1000 grams so this is the given mass of the substance divided by molar mass of electron molar mass of electron means mass of one mole electron mass of one mole electron means mass of one electron multiplied by 6.022 to 10 raised power 23 multiplied by avogadro's number then only i'll be calling the whole denominator now as molar mass which is expressed in grams per mole right so grams grams cancel moles comes up and you just need to solve this equation and get the number of moles of electrons which actually weighs 1 kg right is it clear to you quickly guys is it clear to you can you solve these sort of questions from now on you should be able to solve these sort of questions easily you should be able to solve these sort of questions easily okay one more question let me see if you can do any sort of mistake here in this question the question is calculate calculate the total number of molecules calculate the total number of molecules present in 1.8 liters of h2o 1.8 liters of h2o liquid can you give it a try can you solve this question calculate the total number of molecules present in 1.8 liters total number of molecules present in 1.8 liters of water and here h2o is present in liquid state my dear students you must be thinking that volume is given and we are supposed to calculate molecules means particles volume is given particles is to be calculated right that's something which you must be thinking that's must something which you must be thinking that volume is given and particles are to be calculated volume is given and particles are to be calculated so you will be starting from volume you will have to end at particles so you must be thinking that you'll be following this arrow first then you'll be following this arrow you are thinking like this that means you will make the question the question will be wrong why is that why is that the first formula given volume divided by 22.4 liters which gives you number of moles that's only valid for what that's only for valid for gas and the gas has to be present at stp but are we given with the gas or we are given with the liquid we are not given with the gas we are given with the gas, right so you cannot divide this volume by 22.4 right you cannot do that that's only valid for gases here it's not gas water it's present in liquid state so how will i solve this question simple see guys you must be knowing density of water density of water everyone is knowing how much is that 1 gram per ml correct instead of density of water can i write mass of water in grams divided by volume of water in ml and this value is given to us as 1 gram per ml right so can i say mass of water in grams divided by volume of water in ml volume of water in ml that means 1800 ml 1800 ml 
and this term is basically equal to 1 gram per ml. Perfect. So, from this equation, can't I calculate the mass of water in grams? Mass of water in grams, it's coming out to be how much? 1800 grams. So, basically, what are we given with? We are actually given with 1800 grams of water. We are actually given with 1800 grams of water. Correct? Now, dear students, we converted volume into mass. Now, imagine that as if we are given with the mass of substance and we are, we are supposed to calculate molecules. Imagine, we are given with the mass of substance and we have to calculate molecules. How do you convert mass into molecules? So, first, mass into moles, then moles into molecules. That's it. Right? So, number of moles of water will be equal to given mass of water in grams divided by molar mass of water. The value is 100. Moles we got. Now, the molecules. I can say number of water molecules will be equal to moles multiplied by what? Multiplied by Avogadro's number. Right? That's something which we were supposed to. Is this clear to everyone? Quickly. Quickly, guys. Everyone in the charts. Everyone in the charts. If this is super clear to everyone. What I told you, whenever the given substance is not in gaseous state, it is in liquid state, then convert its volume into mass by using the term density. Density of water is 1 gram per ml. Density means mass by volume. That's 1, right? Volume is given. So, mass of water we got, right? So, imagine as if we are not given with the volume of substance. We are given with the mass of substance. So, mass of water we got, we have to calculate molecules. So, you will start from mass. You will have to reach to molecules in that diagram. So, first mass divided by molar mass, that gives me moles. Moles multiplied by Avogadro's number, that gives me what? Molecules. That's all. Yeah? Perfect? Quickly, guys, let me know in the chats with the thumbs ups if it's again clear to everyone. <laughs> Quickly. Quickly, guys, everyone with the thumbs ups if it is super clear to you. Quickly. Anya, this is enough. Whatever I'm teaching right now, this is enough. This is more than something. No need to go for anything else. Up. Guys, quickly let me know in the chats with the thumbs ups, everyone, so that I'll move ahead. Sleeping somewhere? Quickly, everyone. <clears throat> The Gadro's number value you have to take as 6.022 into 10 raised power. Right now, I'm just taking, taking it as 6. Be involved in law. brutal calculations. Yeah. Let's move on then, guys. Let's move on. There is one more special type of question, which is again simple, in which they'll ask you to calculate atoms, electrons, number of protons, neutrons, ions, atoms. All these things they can ask. Whenever you see a question in which they ask you about the electrons, in which they ask you about the atoms, in which they ask you about the protons, neutrons, ions, etc., you'll be again doing one thing. What is that? You'll be using one simple diagram. What is that diagram? Have a look. The diagram is like this. I'm writing here given quantity. Whatever is given to us as per the question. Be it mass of substance, be it volume of substance, particles, whatever. Whatever is given to us as per the question, that's something which you'll be calling as given. Our first step always will be there to calculate 
number of moles of so convert the given quantity into moles. That should be always our first. Convert the given quantity into moles. Right? Yes. Convert the given quantity into number of moles. Given quantity can be in terms of mass. It can be in terms of volume. And you know how to convert mass into moles. You know how to convert volume into moles. Right? Everything is already clear. Once you get the moles. Once you get the moles. If the given substance whose quantity is given to us. If the given substance whose quantity is given to us. If that given substance is in molecular form. Then multiply the moles by the Avogadro's number. You will be getting the number of molecules. You will be getting the number of molecules. What does that mean? You will get the idea in some time. First of all, you remember. You remember. If the given substance is in molecular form. Then on multiplying moles by Avogadro's number. You will be getting the molecules. Okay, once you get the molecules, you can easily calculate atoms, you can calculate electrons, you can calculate protons, you can calculate neutrons, you can calculate ions, anything can be asked out of these. Anything can be asked. Anything can be asked. For example, guys, for example, how to use this diagram basically. For example, I'm writing one simple question. I'm writing calculate. Calculate the total number of atoms. Calculate the total number of atoms present in 448 liters of carbon dioxide at ST. At ST. Read the question carefully. What are we supposed to calculate? We are supposed to calculate the total number of atoms present in 448 liters of carbon dioxide at ST. So, what are we supposed to calculate basically? We are supposed to calculate atoms. We are supposed to calculate atoms. Whenever atoms are to be calculated, that means we'll be using this, this diagram. Now, look at the question carefully. Whatever is given to us, are we given with the volume of the substance? Yes, volume of the substance in liters is given. Volume of the gas in liters is given. What is the first step? This is my given quantity. Convert the given quantity into number of moles. My first step is to calculate number of moles, which will be equal to Given volume of carbon dioxide in liters divided by 22.4 liters. The value comes out to be 20. Correct? So we calculated the number of moles of the substance. Now, my dear students, check whether the given substance is in atomic form or molecular form. The given substance is in molecular form, it's carbon dioxide. And you know, when moles are multiplied by Avogadro's number, now we'll be getting the molecule because the given substance is in molecular form. I'll write. Number of molecules of what? Carbon dioxide is equal to moles multiplied by Avogadro's number. Moles multiplied by Avogadro's number. So these many molecules of carbon. So we have calculated the molecule. After calculating the molecules, now you can calculate the atom. And how you can convert molecules into atoms? How you are going to convert molecules into atoms? My dear students, since we have done the question till here, now we have to calculate atoms. Can I say? Can I simply say one molecule of carbon dioxide contains one molecule of carbon dioxide contains how many atoms? Two plus one, three atoms, right? One molecule of carbon dioxide contains three atoms. So one molecule of carbon dioxide it contains three atoms. Two molecules of carbon dioxide multiplied by two. Three molecules multiplied by three. Four molecules multiplied by four. How many molecules we have? Twenty Na. So twenty Na molecules of carbon dioxide will contain. 3 multiplied by 20 Na atoms. So, in total, you are getting 60 Na atoms. So, can I say one thing? Can I say 448 liters of carbon dioxide will contain in total 60 Na atoms? That's something which I was supposed to calculate. Is this super clear to everyone? Is this clear to everyone? Quickly, guys. The given substance was in molecular form. That's why. Moles multiplied by Avogadro's number gave me molecule. If the given substance was not in molecular form, if the given substance was in atomic form, then, then moles multiplied by Avogadro's number directly gives you. If the given substance is in ionic form, then moles multiplied by Avogadro's number that directly gives you the number of. So you have to check first what is the nature of the given substance. 
is it molecular form is it atomic form is it ionic form whatever it is i hope it's clear so how that three atoms came guys it's clear no one molecule of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide has got one carbon atom two oxygen atoms so 2 plus 1 3 right <clears throat> okay one more similar type of question calculate the number of atoms electrons protons neutrons in 44.8 liters of carbon dioxide at s all these things are to be calculated right so before solving this particular question i need to tell you some basic things some basic stuff i need to tell for example you have got the element x whose atomic number is z Whose mass number is m, right? There is no charge on this atom. For example, this atom X is electrically neutral. Whenever you'll be having the electrically neutral atom, right? You can say one atom of X, one atom of X contains how many protons? It contains Z protons. How many electrons? It contains Z electrons. How many neutrons? It's always going to be m minus z mass number minus atomic number neutral. What does it mean? For example, have a look. Let's say you are talking about sodium. Its atomic number is eleven. Its mass number is twenty three. So this is the value of z. This is the value of what m. Perfect. So I can say one atom of sodium. One atom of sodium contains how many protons? It contains eleven protons. How many electrons? Eleven electrons. How many neutrons? Twenty-three minus eleven comes out to be twelve. Twelve neutrons. Correct. This complete basics, which all of you must be knowing. Yeah. Similarly, dear students. For example, I'm writing something like this. Let's say I'm writing Mg di positive. Now charge is present on magnesium base. There's a di positive charge on magnesium. Magnesium, its atomic number you all must be knowing. That's twelve. Its mass number you must be knowing. That's twenty-four. Correct. Do remember, due to the presence on due to the presence of charge, now magnesium has got di positive charge. Due to the presence of charge, nothing happens to the protons. Nothing happens to. Due to the presence of charge, nothing happens to protons. Nothing happens to neutrons. Only thing that changes, what is that? Number of electrons. So I can say one mg di positive ion. It contains twelve protons. How many neutrons? Twenty-four minus twelve. Twelve neutrons. How many electrons? If there was no charge on magnesium, then twelve electrons. But there is di positive charge. That means two electrons have been taken out from magnesium. So twelve minus two comes out to be ten electrons. So in one mg di positive, you'll find twelve protons, twelve neutrons, and 10. as simple as that. Correct. Similarly, let's say I'm writing n tri negative. Let's say I'm writing n tri negative. Again, you have taken nitrogen, and there's a negative charge on nitrogen. You have taken nitrogen, the charge is negative. Now, dear students, due to the negative charge, nothing happens to protons. Nothing happens to, uh, I mean, the neutrons. Only thing that changes is number of electrons. Yeah. So, its atomic number since is seven, its atomic mass is fourteen. So I can say one n tri negative. Contain seven protons, seven neutrons. How many electrons? If there was no charge on nitrogen, then seven electrons. But there is tri negative charge, so it has gained three electrons. So seven plus three. So in one and tri negative, you'll find some ten electrons. Correct? Simple, basic. Now let's try to solve the question. Which the question is calculate the number of atoms. Then electrons, then protons, then neutrons in forty-four point eight liters of carbon dioxide. My dear students, have a look. First of all, check what is our given quantity. The given quantity is in terms of volume. What is my first step always to convert the given quantity into number of moles? Do we know how to convert volume into moles? I'll be writing number of moles of carbon dioxide. Given volume of carbon dioxide in liters divided by twenty-two point four liters. Value comes out be two. First step is done. We have calculated the moles. Now second step. Second step. What is the second step? Check whether the given substance is in atomic form or molecular form. It's in molecular form. So second step will be 
moles multiplied by Avogadro's number that gives you the number of molecules. Now calculate number of molecules. This is the second step. Number of molecules of carbon dioxide will be equal to multiplied. So these many molecules of carbon dioxide, two n, correct? Okay. Since we have calculated the molecules, now we are supposed to calculate the atoms. Now you tell me, in one molecule of carbon dioxide, how many atoms are there? Two plus one, three atoms, right? One molecule of carbon dioxide contains three atoms. So two molecules of carbon dioxide will contain multiplied by two, three molecules, multiplied by three, four molecules, multiplied by four. How many molecules we have? Two Na. So two Na molecules of carbon dioxide will contain three multiplied by two Na. The value comes out to be six Na atoms. So in total, you will find these many total number of atoms present in 44.8 liters of carbon. Yeah. Perfect. Since atoms you have calculated, now it is the time to calculate electrons, right? Atoms you have calculated, now it is the time to calculate electrons. If I talk about one molecule of carbon dioxide, this is one molecule of carbon dioxide, carbon and two oxygen. Atomic number, 6, and it's 12. This is 8, 16, 8, 16. In one atom of carbon, how many electrons are there? 6. How many electrons are there in one atom of oxygen? In one more? So 8, 8, 16, 6, 22. So in one molecule of carbon dioxide, there are 22 electrons. You will find 22 protons and similarly neutrons. 12 minus 6 is 6 plus 16 minus 8 is 8. 16 minus 8 is 8. So again, 22 neutrons. So we just checked one thing that in one molecule of carbon dioxide, there are 22 electrons, even 22 protons, even 22 neutrons. Can I write like this? Can I write one molecule of carbon dioxide? What does it contain? It contains 22 electrons, 22 protons, even 22 neutrons, right? If one molecule of carbon dioxide contains 22 electrons, so two molecules will contain multiplied by two, three molecules multiplied by three, four molecules multiplied by four. How many molecules we have? Two Na. So I can say two Na molecules of carbon dioxide will contain 22 multiplied by two Na. That means 44 Na electrons. That means 22 multiplied by 2Na. So, comes out to be 44Na protons. Similarly, 44Na neutrons. Correct? So, these were all the things which we were supposed to calculate. Atoms, electrons, protons, as well as in 44.8 liters of carbon dioxide at S. I hope this is super clear to everyone. Quickly, let me know in the chat with the thumbs ups. Everyone. Everyone, guys. Everyone. Everyone, quickly. Everyone, quickly in the chats. Yes, we shall be completing this chapter already. Whole chapter will be done. Now have a look. Look at this particular question. In this question, they are asking you, calculate the number of valence electrons in 4.2 grams of N trinegative. N trinegative. Since we have to calculate valence electrons, correct? Right? So I'll be following the diagram which I gave you. From. That diagram says convert the given quantity into number of. What is the given quantity? We are given with mass of N trinegative. The given quantity, that is the mass of N trinegative. We are supposed to convert the given quantity into moles. So, let's calculate the moles of N trinegative. It's equal to given mass of N trinegative in grams divided by molar mass of N trinegative. Due to charge, nothing happens to the molar mass. Whatever is molar mass of nitrogen, same is the molar mass of N trinegative. So, due to the presence of charge, nothing happens. Molar mass of nitrogen, that is 24 grams per mole. Sorry, not 24, 14. 14 grams per mole. This value comes out to be what? 0. So, we have converted the given quantity into number of. Now, what used to be our second stage, second step? Moles into molecules. Moles into molecules, right? Look at it carefully. 
is the given substance present in molecular form or ionic form it's given in ionic form now moles multiplied by avogadro's number that's not going to give me the molecules that's going to give me the number of ions right so i can write number of n tri negative ions will be equal to 0.3 right so i got the ions i got the ions now i'll check in one n tri negative ions how many valence electrons are there let's check that let's check that in one n tri negative ion in one n tri negative ion how many total electrons are there since atomic number is 7 seven, 7 plus 3 makes it 10 so there are total 10 electrons out of 10 electrons there will be two electrons present in the first shell eight electrons present in the second shell this second shell which is the valence shell here it's containing eight electrons so if i ask you how many valence electrons are there in one n tri negative so one n tri negative contains eight valence electrons correct one n tri negative contains eight valence electrons so if one n tri negative contains eight valence two n tri negative multiplied by three multiplied by three how many ions we have 0 0.3 na so 0 0.3 na n tri negative ions will contain eight multiplied by 0 0.3 na the value comes out to be 2.4 Na valence electron, right? Perfect. So, these many valence electrons will be present in 4.2 grams of N. Is this clear to everyone? If it is super clear, do let me know once in the chats with a thumbs up. Everyone. 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 Quickly. Quickly, guys. Perfect. So here we have got again three more questions. Look at these questions here. These are again simple questions, basic questions. Calculate the number of atoms in 16 grams of helium. 16 grams of helium. You have to calculate atoms. So mass of helium is given. Right? You have to calculate atoms. Helium is given in atomic form. Helium is given in atomic form. So if we calculate moles of helium, then we multiply moles by the Avogadro's number. Will be directly getting number of atoms, correct? That's what we have been doing till now. So first thing, in order to solve the first question, I'll be calculating the number of moles of helium first, which is given mass of helium in grams divided by molar mass of helium. So I got the moles of helium, correct? Moles since helium is in atomic form. Now moles multiplied by Avogadro's number that gives me what? That gives me the number of atoms of helium number of atoms of helium will be exactly equal to what? 4 Na. This clear? Simple? Correct? Now look at the second one. Look at the second one. Calculate the number of atoms in 16 U of helium. Here it's not grams. It's 16 U of helium. It's not grams. So how are you going to solve it? Do you know? Do you know what is the atomic weight of helium? 4 AMU. 4 AMU is the mass of one atom of helium. Correct? 4 AMU is the mass of one atom of helium. So 1 U will be the mass of 1 by 4 atoms of helium. And how many U are we given with? 1 six, 16 U. So 16 U will be 1 by 4 multiplied by 16 atoms of helium. Which comes out to be 4 atoms of helium. Correct? So, as per the question, 16 U of helium means 4 atoms of helium. Isn't it simple? That's all. We were supposed to check how many atoms are there in 16 U of helium. So, in 16 U of helium, there are 4 atoms of helium. Nothing else. Again, simple. Look at the third one. Look at the third one. Again, you can see mass is not given in grams. If it was given in grams, then given mass divided by molar mass, that gives me the moles. Then moles multiplied by Avogadro's number, that gives me its molecules, right? That was the simple procedure if the mass was given in grams. But here again, the mass is not given in grams. It is given in AMU. What I'll be doing? HNO3, its molecular mass. That means mass of one molecule of HNO3. 63. 63 U is basically the mass of molecule of Okay, 
63U is the mass of one molecule of HLO. So, dear students, what about 1U? Can I say 1U is equal to 1 by 63 molecules of HLO? 1U is equal to 1 upon 63 molecules of HNO3, right? How many U's are we given with 126? So, 126 U has to be 1 by 63 multiplied by 120. Value comes 2 molecules. Two molecules of HNO. Is this clear? So that's something we were supposed to calculate. We were supposed to calculate how many molecules are present in 126 U of HNO. So there are two molecules which are present in it. Clear? Is it super clear to everyone? Quickly. Quickly, guys. Break will be given at 8, okay, not now. Perfect, perfect, guys, perfect. Now, there is something like there are, there is a particular type of, there are particular type of questions which are again asked, basically, over here from the mole cons. Let's try to solve those questions. But before going into the details of the questions, let's have a look on the concept. Understand what I'm. My dear students, if I write, one mole of H2SO4. One mole of H2SO4. Let me tell you, in one mole of H2SO4, what is present? In one mole of H2SO4, I can say there are two moles of H present. Here, hydrogen, I am taking in atomic form. One mole of H2SO4 contains two moles of H. Contains one mole of S as well. Contains four moles of O as well. Correct? Oxygen again I've taken in atomic. Uh, guys, just a second. Somebody is here. Yes, who is here? Yes, who is here? Yes, who is here? Till then I'm going to write something. <laughs> yes, who is here? Yes, who is here? Quickly. Cannot be Ambika, ma'am, yaar. Sir, is saying, ma'am. See, somebody's name is Vazim. <laughs> yeah, none other than Capto, guys. See, Ambika, ma'am, is missing. So, somebody she's should. She's missing, she's gone, she's dead. I... Oops. Oops. That's it. Ambika, ma'am, is going to take. Avenge. Uh, hello, Sana. Hello, Harini. Hello, Sanjeev. Uh, what to do, man? Ambika is not there. No, somebody should come. No. So that's all. I'm doing Ambika Mam's role over here. I'm going to teach biology also on her behalf. And everybody will rock it. Yeah. 18 out of how much is this? 360? <laughs> 18 out of 8, 180. <laughs> no, but with my Tukka strategy, I think it will be more than 100. Yeah. Where is HSP, sir? HSP, sir, he's is in. Over. <laughs> <laughs> he's over. He's... First time in an academy, Ashir. Welcome. Kya baat? Very good. Very good. Are my God. Guys, you have good stamina. Yeah? And where are those other 2 300 people who started with the, the session? And where are they gone? Huh? Started sleeping already. Call them. What is this? Vadim sir is here. He is going to teach you for uh, more than 5-6 hours. And you are going to sleep. Call your friends. Yeah. Definitely. Then Vadim sir will teach physics. Ambika will teach maths. And our Venugopal sir will teach biology. Definitely. We'll have it. HSP sir. HSP sir. Yes, he will be the student. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, crazy. So, guys, um, I just came to say hello and just to cheer you up and uh, continue watching this class till the end. 
Vazim sir will be taking a break after half an hour because he's going to come. Look at his dedication. He's going to come on the JE channel. So if you have your JE friends, let them know to come on the JE channel by an academy. Right? Okay. Hello guys. See you. See you. All the best. All the best, Vazim sir. Sir has got biryani for me. Huh? That is an awesome um, biryani, guys. And called Done Biryani. Out would know about what is biryani. Please tell Wazim, sir, what is Done? Okay. Or he will leave the class. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's have a look, guys. <clears throat> See now. Over here, I wrote one statement. One mole of H2SO4. It's very simple. In one mole of H2SO4, what you will find? You'll find two moles of hydrogen atom. Two moles of H. One mole of S. Four moles of O. Now, dear students, there is one thing which I would want you guys to know. Sometimes, sometimes, instead of moles, they will ask you to calculate gram atom or they will ask you to calculate gram molecule. Gram atoms or gram molecules is nothing, these are moles basically. Gram atoms or gram molecules, nothing, it is just moles. When they ask you to calculate the gram atoms, that means they, they are asking you to calculate the moles. When they ask you to calculate the gram molecule, so indirectly it's like calculate the moles. Okay? Now, dear students, have a look. One mole of H2SO4 contains two moles of hydrogen. Hydrogen here is in atomic form. Since hydrogen is in atomic form, so I can write two, instead of moles, I can write two gram atoms. I can write two gram atoms of hydrogen. Right? Perfect. I can write one gram atom of sulfur. Right? Here oxygen again is in atomic form. I can write four. Instead of moles, I'll be writing gram atoms of oxygen. <clears throat> I hope it's super clear to you, right? Now, my dear students, one more thing. My dear students, one more thing. Understand. No doubt, I wrote one mole of H2O. So, it contains two moles of H. But, if I want to write hydrogen in molecular form, should I be writing one mole of H2O? So, it contains... One mole of H2, absolutely. One mole of H2, so what it contains, one mole of H2. Over here, hydrogen is in molecular form. So, instead of moles, you can write one gram molecule. You can write one gram molecule of what? Of hydrogen. Talk about oxygen. Talk about oxygen. Can I say one mole of H2, so what? It will contain two moles of H2. Yes, it contains. Two moles of, sorry, not H2O2. It contains two moles of O2. Two moles of O2 means four moles of O. Here I have taken oxygen in molecular form. So I should be writing two gram molecules of oxygen. I hope all these things you can write. For example, for example, let me give you one more example so that you can understand. I know it will be a little bit difficult for you guys to understand this. Right? So, let's take one more example. For example, I'm writing one mole. One mole of H2S2O8. First of all, I'm going to write all the statements considering the elements in atomic form. I'll write one mole of h 2 contains two moles of H, two moles of S, 8 moles of O. I can write in a different format as well. Hydrogen here is in atomic form. So, 2 instead of moles, I'll write gram atoms of hydrogen. I'll write gram atoms of hydrogen. Similarly, instead of 8 moles of O, oxygen here is in atomic form. I can write 8 gram atoms of oxygen. Now, these two statements, can you convert them into gram molecules? I want you guys to do that. Convert them into gram molecule. Can I say one mole H2SO4? It contains one mole of H2. 
hydrogen here is in molecular form. So instead of mole, you'll write gram molecule. So one gram molecule of hydrogen. One gram molecule of hydrogen. One mole H2S2O8 contains four moles of O2. It contains four moles of O2. Oxygen here is in molecular form. So I'm writing four gram molecules of oxygen. I hope all these statements are right. Now, dear students, if you know how to write these statements, then there's a particular set of questions which can be asked. How is that? This is the question. The question is calculate the moles of O present in. 196 grams of H2SO. Calculate the moles of O present in 196 grams of H2SO. Now understand. We have to calculate the moles of O which are present in 196 grams of H2SO4. Whenever you see this sort of a question, your first step always is going to be to convert the given quantity into number of moles. Your first step always will be to convert given quantity into number of moles. Right? So first of all, let me calculate number of moles of H2SO4, which will be equal. given mass of H2SO4 in grams divided by molar mass of H2SO4. The value comes out to be 2. So you have converted the given quantity into number of moles, right? Well, my dear students, after doing the first step, what is the second step? Have a look what the second step is all about. Since we are given with H2SO4, right? So I'll write. One mole of H2SO4. One mole of H2SO4. Calculate the moles of O. Now tell me how many moles of O are present in one mole of H2SO4. I'll say one mole H2SO4. It contains four moles of O. Yes. One mole H2SO4 contains four moles of O. My dear students, now it's evident. If one mole H2SO4 contains four moles of O, how many moles of H2SO4 do we have? Two moles. I'll say two moles of H2SO4 will contain four multiplied by two. The value comes out to be eight moles of O. That's something which we were supposed to calculate, right? We got to know that we have got 196 grams of H2SO4. That means we have got two moles of H2SO4. In one mole H2SO4, there are four moles of O. So two moles of H2SO4 will have eight moles of O. Eight moles of O means? Four moles of O2. The question can be anything. They can ask you in terms of O. They can ask you in terms of O2. Right? They can ask you like this. Eight gram atoms of O. Or you can write four gram molecules of oxygen. I hope all these things are super clear to you. Yeah? Perfectly done? Perfectly done? One more thing which I would want you guys to remember. I'll give you one more example. Yeah, I'll give you one more example. But before that, have a look on the question. What we were supposed to calculate? We were supposed to calculate the moles of O. We were supposed to calculate the moles of O. That means we were supposed to calculate the data for O. That substance whose data is to be calculated, that always has to be on the right side of the state. That's why this O is on the right side of the state. If I was supposed to calculate the data for H2SO4, that means I was supposed to what? I was supposed to reverse the statement. So that H2SO4 comes on the right. Okay? The one whose data is to be calculated, that has to be always on. Yeah? Let's try to solve one more question. Look at this question. Calculate. Calculate the mass of H3PO4 that contains 0.25 moles of O. Calculate the mass of H3PO4 that contains 0.25 moles of O. What is the given quantity? The given quantity is 0.25 moles of O. The given quantity is already in terms of moles. So you need not to convert it like before. It's already in terms of moles. No need to convert it. Now, what is the statement which I'll be writing? Calculate the mass of H3PO4 that contains these many moles of O. So can I say? One mole of H3PO4 contains 
four moles of O? Absolutely. But the point is, do I need to calculate the data for O? Or I have to calculate the data for H3PO4. I have to calculate the data for H3PO4, right? I have to calculate the data for H3PO4. The one whose data is to be calculated that has to be on the right side. So, should I be reversing the statement? Absolutely, I'll be reversing the statement. So, can I say, after reversing the statement, can I say 4 moles of O are present in? 4 moles of O are present in O1 mole of H3PO4. Yes, 4 moles of O are present in 1 mole of H3PO4. Now, dear student, if 4 moles of O are present in 1 mole H3PO4, let's use the unitary method. Can I say 1 mole of O is present in 1 by 4 moles of H3PO4? Correct. Now, how many moles of O I am given with? I am given with 0 0.25. So, 0 0.25 moles of O are present in 1 by 4 multiplied by 0 0.25 multiplied by 0 0.25 moles of h3po4 so this is 1 by 4 this is also 1 by 4 the value comes out to be 1 by 16 moles of h3po4 so if i ask you what did i calculate if i ask you what did i calculate what should be your answer you will say we calculated the moles of h3po4 these are the moles of h3po4 which contains 0 0.25 moles these are the moles of H3PO4, which contains 0 0.25 moles of O. But my dear students, was I supposed to calculate the moles of H3PO4? No. I was supposed to calculate the mass of h 3 I was supposed to calculate the mass of h 3 So, dear students, mass of h 3 Do you know, how do you convert moles into mass? Moles of H3PO4 multiplied by what? Multiplied by molar mass of h 3 Correct. So, mass of H3PO4 in grams will be equal to moles 1 by 16, molar mass 98, the value comes out to be 6.125. So, what about the 6.125 grams? What is this? What is this exactly? This is basically the mass of H3PO4, the 6.125 grams. It is the mass of H3PO4. It is the mass of H3PO4 which contains 0 0.25 moles of O. That's something I was supposed to Right? This is the mass of H3PO4 that contains 0 0.25 moles of O. That's something I was supposed to calculate. What mass of H3PO4 contains 0 0.25 moles of O? I hope these sort of questions you will be easily solving from now. Yeah? <clears throat> Perfect. Okay, guys. Quickly, guys, everyone. All right, perfect then. Okay. By the way, can you solve this question on your own? Can you solve this question on your own? Do you think you can solve this? Just read it carefully once and let me know. Can you solve this question? Quickly. This is your homework question. You are going to give it a try. 
and let me know the answer of this particular question in the comment section of the video okay in the comment section of the video perfect so till here your basic mole concept is over it's done right your basic mole concept is done now it is the time for the average molar mass of the gas one more important topic right <coughs> so let's get to know what the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture is exactly all of understand guys properly understand this is important first of all the average molar mass of a gaseous mixture it is represented by mav it is represented by mav now what does it mean my dear students as per its definition average molar mass of the gaseous mixture it is defined as it is defined as the mass of the mass of 1 mole of a gaseous the mass of 1 <clears throat> mole of a gaseous now what that exactly what that exactly see guys imagine that you have got a container over here which is closed on all the sides imagine you have got a container which is closed on all the sides for example in this container you have got two chemically non reacting gas let's say in this container you have got two chemically non reacting one is n2 gas one more is o3 gas so there are two chemically non reacting gases in the container can i say first of all in the container we have got a gaseous mixture yes there is a gaseous mixture present in the container which contains two chemically non reacting my dear students let's assume that in the container there are two moles of n2 and two moles of o3 as well let's assume that in this container there are two moles of n2 and two moles of o3 as right so if i ask you how many total moles are there in the mixture how many total moles are there in the gaseous mixture you will say 2 plus 2 there are total four moles present in the gas if i ask you if i ask you what will be the mass of two moles of the n2 and what will be the mass of two moles of o3 we are going to do that see molar mass of n2 is 28 gram right that means mass of one mole of n2 is 28 gram but do i have one mole of n2 or two moles of n2? i have two moles of n2. now if the mass of one mole of n2 is 28 grams that means the mass of two moles of n2 will be 6 gram right similarly what about the molar mass of o3 what about the molar mass of o3 that means 48 which is the mass of one mole of o3 but do i have one mole o3 or two moles o3? i have two moles of o3 if the mass of one mole of o3 is 48 grams that means the mass of two moles of o3 will be 96 grams so can i say in this particular container there are 56 grams of n as well as 96 grams of ozone now if i ask you one more thing what about the mass of whole gaseous mixture mass of whole gaseous mixture will be mass of n2 56 grams plus mass of o3 96 how much will be the value it will be 152 grams so i would say 152 grams is the mass of whole gaseous correct Yes. So, dear students, can I say something like this? Four moles of a gaseous mixture. Four moles of a gaseous mixture has got the mass of one fifty. The mass of four moles of gaseous mixture is one fifty two grams. What about the mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture? The mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture will be one fifty two divided by four grams. can you let me know in the chats exactly what did we calculate what is this term what is this term 
This is basically the mass of, this is the mass of one mole of a gas. As per the definition, the mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture. What do we call that? We call that as the average molar mass of the gas. So, first of all, first of all, there were two chemically non-reacting gases in the container. That means there is a gaseous mixture in the container. Right? There is a gaseous mixture in the container. The mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture is something which we call as average molar mass. So, right now, the scenario which I have taken over here, the scenario which I have taken over here, I got to know the mass of one mole of the gaseous mixture is 152 by 4 grams. So, this is something which I will be calling as average mole. Now, why I am doing this? I just want to make the formula to calculate the average molar mass of the in the formula of average molar mass, there should be two terms, one in numerator, one in denominator. In the numerator here, you can see 152, which was basically the mass of mixture. So, in the numerator, there has to be mass of the mixture in grams. And in the denominator, it is 4 here. And what was 4? 4 were basically the total moles present in the mixture. So, this is one general formula by means of which you can easily calculate what? By means of which you can easily calculate average molar mass of the gas. You do not have to do this procedure which I did over here. No need to do this. No need to do this. Just remember this result. Just remember this result. If you already knew this formula, then you were not supposed to do all this stuff. Mass of the mixture, that's 152 grams. Divide by moles present in the mixture, that's 4 in total. That gives you the average molar mass of the gas. That's all. So, what is average molar mass of the gaseous mixture? First of all, in order to define the average molar mass of the gaseous mix, what do we have? There should be two or more than two chemically non-reacting gases. The mixture should contain two or more than two chemically non-reacting And whatever will be the mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture, that's something which you call as average molar mass. Nowadays, students, there are many results which we are going to generate over here to calculate the average molar mass of the gas. Right? Let's have a look what those are. <clears throat> have a look at it. Let's assume that we have got a container and in this container, for example, there are two chemically non-reacting. That means in this container, what do we have? Again, I can say, I have got a gaseous mixture present in this particular, which contains two chemically. Let's assume W1 represents the mass of gas 1 in the container and W2 represents the mass of gas 2 in the container. W1 represents the mass of gas 1 in the container. W2 represents the mass of gas 2 in the container. Similarly, for example, N1 represents number of moles of gas 1 in the container and N2 represents number of moles of gas 2 in the container. Similarly, M1 represents molar mass of gas 1 in the container and M2 represents molar mass of gas 2 in the container. V1, let's assume V1 represents volume of gas 1 in the container, V2 represents volume of gas 2 in the container. Mole fraction of gas 1 represented by chi 1, mole fraction of gas 2 in the container represent. Right? So, dear students, <clears throat> dear students, if I ask you, what about the mass of gaseous mixture? What about the mass of gaseous mixture in grams? The gaseous mixture contains gas 1 and gas 2. Mass of gas 1 in the container, it's W1. Mass of gas 2 in the container, that's W2. So, W1 plus W2, it gives me the mass of the gas. Total moles present in the mixture. N1 represents moles of gas 1 in the mixture. N2 represents moles of gas 2 in the mixture. N1 plus N2, it represents total moles present in the mixture. Now, few minutes back, I told you, whenever you will be having two or more than two chemically non-reacting gases in the container, that means you have got gaseous mixture in the container. And wherever you see the gaseous mixture in the container, what do we calculate? We calculate average molar mass for that gas. And how do you define the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture? That is basically the mass of one mole of a gas. 
right? So mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture is something which you call as average mole. And its formula is, two minutes back we discussed this formula, mass of the mixture in grams divided by total moles present mixture. This is one result. You can convert it in different result. The mass of the mixture is W1 plus W2. Total moles present in the mixture is N1 plus N2. Correct? Similarly, if I ask you how do we calculate number of moles? Given mass of the substance, divide by molar mass of the substance. That's how you calculate number of moles. If I write 1, 1 and 1. So, can you calculate W1 from here? When I say W1 is nothing, it's M1 N1. M1 N1. So, instead of W1, I can write M1 N1 plus W2 is going to be M2 N2. Divided by what? Divided by N1 plus N2. This is one more formula by means of which you can calculate the average motor mass. Okay. Similarly, dear students, in order to calculate average molar mass of the gaseous mass, we can use one more. This is the denominator N1 plus N2. It is the denominator of this term as well as denominator of this. So I'll be writing M1 N1 divided by N1 plus N2 plus M2 N2 divided by N1 plus N2. Does not make a difference, right? This is the denominator of the first term as well as second. So, you can convert it in a different format. You can write M1 as such. M1 as such. N1 divided by N1 plus N2. Number of moles of gas 1 in the container divided by total moles present in the container. Should I be calling that as mole fraction of gas 1? Plus M2. N2 divided by N1 plus N2. Should I be calling that as mole fraction of gas 2? Right? Isn't it simple again? Right, guys? Basic, simple. Now, similarly, you can write one more thing. Whenever I'll be using the term as mole percentage, what is mole percentage? Mole percentage is nothing. It is mole fraction multiplied by 100. Mole percentage is nothing. It is mole fraction multiplied by 100. That means mole fraction is nothing. It is mole percentage divided by 100. Correct? So, here I can modify this result as well. Average molar mass of the mixture is going to be M1 instead of mole fraction of gas 1. You will be writing mole percentage of gas 1 divided by 100 plus M2 you are writing as such. Mole fraction of gas 2 you are going to write mole percentage of gas 2 divided by 100. So, my dear students, how many results did we got, did we get till now in order to calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mass? This is the first result. This is the second result to calculate the average molar mass of the mixture. This is the third result to calculate the average molar mass of the mixture. This is the fourth result to calculate the molar mass of the mixture. And this is the fifth result by means of which you can calculate average molar mass of the mixture. <clears throat> right? Perfect. Similarly, dear students, there can be one more result as well. There can be one more result as well. And what that result is going to be. Have a look. <clears throat> for example, for example, if the gaseous mixture, if the gaseous mixture, is present at constant pressure and temperature. That means the gaseous mixture which I have taken in the container, let's say its pressure and temperature that's fixed. Let's say pressure and temperature of the mixture does not change at all. That's how I say that the mixture is present at constant pressure and temperature. I do not have to let the pressure and temperature of the gas to change. I do not have to let the pressure and temperature of the mixture to change. Then only I can say the gaseous mixture is present at constant my dear students, you know, as per ideal gas equation, PV is equal to nRT. If pressure and temperature of the mixture is kept constant, R is already constant, I can say volume is directly proportional to moles, right? So, wherever, wherever, in this particular equation, do you see moles? Replace the moles, replace the moles by 
right and how you are going to replace it by volume now you are going to write the result mav is equal m1 instead of n1 you are writing v1 plus m2 instead of n2 you are writing v2 divided by v1 plus v2 but if i ask you whether this particular result it's valid under all conditions or not this particular result to calculate the average molar mass of the mixture it's not valid under all conditions. It's valid only when the pressure and temperature of the mixture is kept. Right? Is this clear to everyone quickly? Is this clear to everyone people quickly? So we have got, <coughs> so we have got basically different results by means of which you can calculate average molar mass of a gaseous. So from now onwards, <clears throat> from now onwards, if you see two or more than two chemically non-reacting gases present in the container, one thing should strike your mind that you should calculate its average molar mass of the mixture. You should calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture. Right? It does, it hardly matters whether the question is from this chapter or some other chapter, wherever you see two or more than two chemically non-reacting gases in the container, your first step always should be to calculate the average molar mass of the gas. And a lot of results we have to calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture. You can use anyone and get the average. Basically, mass of one mole of a gas. Right? <clears throat> I hope it's clear. So let's try to solve a few questions so that you can understand. <clears throat> Look at this question, guys. Calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mix containing 4.4 grams of gas A, 6.4 grams of gas B, and 4.8 grams of gas. So as per this particular question, <clears throat> it is the simplest of all. There are three gases present in the container. Gas 1, gas 2, gas 3. Or you can write gas A, gas B, gas. The choice solved. So, as per the question is concerned, how many grams of gas A are there? As per the question, we have got 4.4 grams of gas A in the container. Similarly, how many grams of gas B in the container? 6.4 grams of gas B in the container. Similarly, 4.8 grams of gas. 4.8 grams of gas C. In the container, right? What about the molar mass of gas A? Molar mass of gas A, as per the question, that's 44 grams per mole. Molar mass of gas B, that's 64 grams per mole. Molar mass of gas C, how much is that? Molar mass of gas C, that's 48 grams per mole. 48 grams per mole. What do I have to calculate? As per the question, we have to calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture. Since we are given with a gaseous mixture, we have to calculate its average mole. Now, dear students, we have got a lot of formulas by means of which we can calculate the average molar mass. Correct? There are a lot of formulas. But which formula do I use right now to calculate the average molar mass of the mixture? I can use the result W1 plus W2. There is third gas, so W3 divided by N1 plus N2 plus N3. Correct? Now, as per the question, W1, W2, W3 are given to me, right? W1, W2, W3 are given to me. W1 is 4.4, W2 is 6.4, and W3 is 4.8 divided by. What is N1? N1 stands for number of moles of gas 1 in the country, which is basically mass of gas 1 divided by molar mass of gas 1 plus N2, mass of gas 2, molar mass of gas 2, N3, mass of gas 3 divided by molar mass of gas 3, right? So, you can write MAV, average molar mass of the mix. 4.4 plus 6.4, that's 10.8. 10.8 plus 4 means 14.8. 14.8 plus 8 is 15.6, right? 15.6 grams divided by W1 by M1. W1 value we know, M1 value we know. 4.4 divided by 44, that's 0 0.1. This term will be again 0 0.1, this term again 0 0.1. So, it's going to be 0 0.3. Right? So, this value will come out to be 156 divided by 3. So, the value will be 3 5s are 15, 3 2s are 6. So, 52 
is the value of average molar mass of the mixture, right? Since we are calculating molar mass basically, and its units are supposed to be in grams per. So I can say mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture right here will be simply how much? It will be 50. Is this clear to everyone quickly in the chats once? Yes, Chandru, you can get the previous class. <clears throat> quickly, let me know in the chats if this is clear to everyone. Quickly, guys. <clears throat> Perfect. Let's try to solve one more question. Let me see if you can solve one more question or not. One simple question I'm giving you. <clears throat> the question is, again you have got a gaseous mixture in the container. Since there are two gases, one is carbon dioxide and one more is O2. Let me call this carbon dioxide as gas 1. Let me call O2 as gas 2. There are two gases in the container, carbon dioxide and O2. First of all, if I ask you, what about the molar mass of carbon dioxide? You will say it's 44 grams per mole. Similarly, what about the molar mass of O2? It is 32 grams per mole. Right? As per the question, the mole percentage of carbon dioxide, the mole percentage of carbon dioxide, that's given to me as 60. Similarly, mole percentage of O2 is equal to 40. Mole percentage of O2 is equal to what do I need to calculate? I need to calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture. My dear students, few minutes back only, I gave you one result in terms of mole percent. Right? In terms of mole percent. What is that? That's going to be M1 multiplied. Mole percentage of gas 1 divided by 100 plus M2. Mole percentage of gas 2 divided by 100. Correct? I'll put all the results, all the values in the result. M1 value, as per the question, is 44. Mole percentage of gas 1, that's 60, divided by 100. Plus M2 value, that's 32. Mole percentage of gas 2, how much is that? That's 40, divided by 100. Right? Give it a try. Final value, you'll get as 39.2. So, this 39.2, what is it? It is the average molar mass of the mixture. Average molar mass of the mixture, and you know, the units of molar mass, nothing, it's just grams per. That means, mass of one mole of a gaseous mixture right now is 39.5. I hope this is super clear. Yeah? <clears throat> Perfect. Perfect, guys. Simple and basic again. All right, one more question. The question is at 27 degrees centigrade and 1 atm, a given mixture of O2 and SO2 contains gases in 2 is to 1 volume. Calculate the number of moles present in 20 grams of the mixture. What does it mean? Have a look what it means. As far as this particular question is concerned, we have got two gases in the container. One is O2 and one more is O2. These are the two gases in the container. Right? Well, can I say I've got a mixture of gas in the container? Absolutely. And this mixture of gas, it's kept at constant pressure and temperature. The mixture of gas is kept at constant pressure and temperature. So, one thing that is striking my mind right now, that since I've got a mixture of gas, the mixture of gas is kept at constant pressure and temperature. And whenever there is a mixture of gas, kept at constant pressure and temperature, if by chance, if by chance you need to calculate its average molar mass, how do you do that? Which formula do you use? You will be using the volume valley formula calculator. Right? So by chance, if I need to calculate the average molar mass of the mixture, I will do that with the help of volume valley. Right? Because there's only one result which is used to calculate MAV at constant pressure and temperature. Volume. Yes? What do I need to calculate actually? I need to calculate the number of moles present in 20 grams of the mixture, right? So, as per the question, mass of the gaseous mixture is given to me as 20 grams. This is the mass of whole mixture. What do I need to calculate? I need to calculate total moles present in the mixture. 
correct total moles present that's something i need to simple guys i need to calculate total moles present in the mixture i say it's going to be mass of the mixture divided by molar mass of the mixture and molar mass of the mixture is something which you call as average molar mass of as simple as given mass of the mixture divided by what given mass of the mixture divided by average molar mass of the mixture that gives me the total moles present in the mixture mass of the mixture is given to me as 20 grams divided by average molar mass of the mixture is not given to me so i will have to calculate i will have to calculate let's call this as gas 1 o2 let's call the so2 as gas 2 right molar mass of o2 you know it's 32 grams per mole molar mass of so2 that's 64 grams per mole these two gases they are present in the volume ratio of 2 is to 1 they are present in the volume ratio of 2 is to 1 my dear students since they are present in the volume ratio of 2 is to 1 so what is going to be the volume of o2 here what is the volume of gas 1 here it has to be 2x and volume of gas 2 has to be x simple multiplying both sides by x that's all v1 v2 we got since we got v1 v2 m1 m2 we already know so can i calculate m average over here it's going to be m1 v1 plus m2 v2 divided by what divided by v1 plus v2 and dear students m1 value you know v1 value you know m2 v2 everything you know put all the values into this expression you'll be getting the final result as 128 divided by 3 grams per this is the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture which we was i supposed to calculate the average molar mass of the gaseous mixture yes i was supposed to calculate average molar mass of the gaseous mixture. that's why i calculated now put it here it's going to be 20 Divided by one twenty eight by three, the value comes out to be sixty divided by one twenty. So what the sixty by one twenty is all about? What is it? What the sixty divided by one twenty eight is all about? These are basically the total number of moles. These are the total number of moles present in twenty grams of this gas, which I was supposed. To. Quickly, let me know in the chats if everyone got the concept of solving this particular question. Quickly. Can you all solve this question from now on? <clears throat> Quickly, guys! Everyone, everyone, is it clear? I think you all are sleeping, right? Are you feeling sleepy? What about you guys? Is it clear to you? Yeah. Andru, you have to use the code as Avenger. A V E N G E R. Perfectly done. All right. So let's move on to one more question then, which can be asked. Let's have a look on. The question is: Six <clears> hundred <throat> mL mixture of O two and O three. At STP weighs one gram. Calculate the volume of ozone in the mix. The nice question. Let's see how this sort of a question is. As far as the question is concerned, imagine that this is a container, and in this container we have got two gas. One is your O2 gas. One more is ozone. These are the two gases present in. as per the question yeah now my dear students the gaseous mixture it is present at stp the gaseous mixture is present at STP. what does that mean that means the pressure and temperature of the mixture is kept constant the pressure and temperature of the mixture is so one thing is striking my mind what is that if i by chance need to calculate the average molar mass of the mixture Which formula do I need to use? Be using the volume alone. Yeah, I'll be using the volume alone. Correct. And how exactly? Have a look. Let's read the question. Six hundred mL mixture of O two and O three. So, as per the question, the volume of the whole gaseous mixture is six hundred mL. 
वॉल्यूम ऑफ द होल गैशियस मिक्सचर इज सिक्स हंड्रेड एम एंड सिक्स हंड्रेड एम एल मिक्सचर ऑफ ओ टू एंड ओ थ्री इट वेज हाउ मच इट वेज वन ग्राम तो वन ग्राम इज द मास ऑफ होल गैशियस मिक्सचर एंड सिक्स हंड्रेड एम एल इट इज द मास इट इज द वॉल्यूम ऑफ होल गैशियस लेट्स डू वन थिंग लेट्स अज्यूम लेट्स अज्यूम इन सिक्स हंड्रेड एम एल ऑफ गैशियस मिक्सचर लेट्स अज्यूम वॉल्यूम ऑफ ओ टू इज फॉर एग्जाम्पल एक्स एम एल Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over here is going to be 600 minus x. Therefore, volume of O3 over
or did I do the reverse? I think this value will come out to be 400 and this is 200. One of the two. Okay? One of the two. Perfect. Either this value will be 400 or this value will be 400. You can check that out after solving it properly. Okay? So, is it clear till here? Quickly? Quickly, guys, everyone. Is it super clear to everyone? Yes, you can join from this topic, no issues at all. <clears throat> Perfectly done. All right, <clears throat> let's move on then. Let's move on, guys. Just a second. Okay. Let's move on to one more important topic of this chapter, stoichiometry. Okay, so what are the stoichiometry exam? Let's have a look. It's again one simple topic, but let's try to understand this. So, in order to make you understand the stoichiometry, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to take a general reaction. And the reaction I'm taking in N2 plus H2, it gives N2. This is the reaction which I've taken. This is the reaction which I've taken. N2 plus H2 gives. First of all, is this reaction balanced on, or unbalanced? The reaction is unbalanced. Reaction is unbalanced. Whenever you want to use stoichiometry in the reaction, the first step always is to balance the reaction. So let's try to balance the reaction. This has to be three times. This has to be two times. It has to be one. So first of all, the reaction is balanced. After balancing a reaction in stoichiometry, this one, three, and two, this one, this three, and two, what do we call this one, three, and two as? This one, three, and two, you will be calling it so I show metric coefficient. You'll be calling this 1, 3, and 2 as the stoichiometric. And my dear students, these stoichiometric coefficients, let me tell you, they are treated as more. They are considered as more. So, first of all, whenever we need to use stoichiometry basically in the reaction, we are supposed to balance the reaction. After balancing the reaction, after balancing the reaction, you can write different types of statements. For example, one type of statement you can write. Since I told you, you can treat these stoichiometry coefficients as moles. You can say, you can say from the stoichiometry of the reaction, from the stoichiometry coefficients over here, you can say one mole of N2 completely reacts with three moles of H2 to produce two moles of NH. Can say something like that. one mole of N2 completely reacts with three moles of N2 to produce what? To produce two moles of N2. This is the data which you are getting only if you know the stoichiometry coefficients. And this type of statement you only wrote in terms of moles. That means I'm using mole method over here. Correct? So, guys, it's evident now. Since you got to know one mole of N2 reacts with three moles of H2. So, what about 2 moles of N2? Can I say 2 moles of N2 will react with 6 moles of H2, will form 4 moles of NH3? Can I say 3 moles of N2 will react with 9 moles of H2, will form 6 moles of NH3? Correct? All these things you can say. All these things you can say. This was one statement which was clearly in terms of moles. Let's have a look on one more statement. If I ask you, what about the mass of 1 mole of N2? What does that mean? Mass of 1 mole of N2 means molar mass of N2. The molar mass of N2 is nothing. 28 grams. It's 28 grams. So, instead of 1 mole of N2, you can write 28 grams of N2. Now, if I ask you, what is the molar mass of H2? You'll say 2 grams. 2 grams is the mass of 1 mole of H2. 
but here we have three moles. So mass of three moles of H2 will be six grams. Molar mass of NH3, 17 grams. That means the mass of one mole of NH3, 17 grams. And over here we have got two moles. The mass of two moles of NH3 will be 34 grams. Dear students, we got to know. Dear students, we got to know. 28 grams of N2 completely reacts with 6 grams of H2 and produces 34 grams of NH3. And produces 34 grams of NH3, right? Right, people? Perfect. So, have a look exactly. This particular statement which I wrote over here, I wrote in terms of mass. So, I'm calling this method in stoichiometry as mass. Now, I can write one more statement. I can treat these stoichiometry coefficients directly as moles. I can treat these stoichiometry coefficients directly as, sorry, directly as volume. How exactly? I can say from the stoichiometry coefficients, one volume of N2 completely reacts with three volume of H2 and produces two volume of NH3. This volume term you can use in terms of liters, in terms of ml or whatever. What does that mean? That means I can say one liter of N2 completely reacts with three liters of H2 and produces two liters of NH3. And do these two statements are used in terms of volume. That means which method I'm using in stoichiometry here, I'm using the volume. Well, it's not mandatory that you will be taking this volume in liters. You can take it in ml as well. You can say 1 ml of N2 reacts with 3 ml of H2 and produces 2 ml of NH2. All these statements, you should be able to write, right? You should be able to write all these statements, either in terms of mass or in terms of volume or in terms of moles. You should be able to write all these statements for all the reactions. Yeah? Perfect? Okay, guys. So, in order to write all these statements, you should first of all balance the reaction. That's important. That's important like how to balance. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. So, one by one, we'll check how to use the mole method, how to use the mass method and how to use the volume. One by one, we are going to check these methods. One by one, we are going to check these methods. But one thing which I would want you guys to remember, whenever we will be using mole method in the questions. At that point of time, whenever we try to use the mole method in the questions, first step always will be to balance the reaction. Second state, statement will be always to convert the given quantity. This will be always our second step in the mole method. In the mole method, when we use the mole method, my first step will be to balance the reaction. Second step will be convert the given quantity into number of moles. And third step, write the similar type of a statement. This will be the third step, right? The similar type of this in terms of mole. Okay. And dear students, whenever you will see me using mass method in stoichiometry, if I'm using the mass method, that means after balancing the reaction, I'm supposed to convert the given quantity into mass. Well, after converting the given quantity into mass, then I'm supposed to write this kind of a statement. I'll be I'm supposed to write this kind of a statement in terms of mass. Same goes for what? So, one by one, we'll check how exactly the different methods in stoichiometry are used in the question. But before doing the question, there are some reactions which I would want you guys to write. Some reactions which are frequently used in stoichiometry. Some reactions which are frequently used. For example, the first reaction, KClO3, upon heating, when you heat it up, it gives KCl solid. With this, you get O2 gas. This is one very common reaction which is used in stoichiometry. Okay, number one. Number two, calcium carbonate solid upon heating. It produces calcium oxide. With calcium oxide, you will be getting carbon dioxide. This is one more important. This is one more important reaction. Third reaction, NaHCO3, sodium bicarbonate upon heating. It gives sodium carbonate Na2CO3 plus carbon dioxide plus water. This is one more important reaction which is frequently used. Na2CO3, when you heat it up, sodium carbonate, when you heat it up, nothing happens. Nothing happens. No reaction takes place here. 
Similarly, what all other reactions we have? BaCl2 plus Na3PO4. It gives Ba3PO4 whole twice plus NaCl. One more important reaction which we frequently use here. Similarly, if you take the hydrocarbon, PXHY, hydrocarbon, if you do its combustion, it will lead to the formation of carbon dioxide. With this carbon dioxide, you will be writing water as well. I am writing the reaction in the balanced format. X times x times this is y by 2 times and the stoichiometric coefficient of o2 will be x plus y for example if you take ch4 here the value of x is 1 the value of y is 4 plus x plus y by 4 so 1 plus 4 by 4 1 plus 1 that comes out to be 2 2 times o2 what does it give x times carbon dioxide what is x value 1 so 1 times carbon dioxide plus y by 2 4 by 2, 4 by 2 is 2, 2 times what? Okay, so remember this equation in the generalized form, right? Then you can derive all the other equations. Okay, right, people? Right? Now, let's exactly get to know how to solve different, different questions in stoichiometry. The first question which is on your screen. The first question which is on your screen. Let's have a look. The question is very, very simple, guys. Calculate the mass of oxygen gas produced upon heating 12.25 grams of KCl. So, first of all, whatever questions I'll be showing you now, I'll be solving all the questions with the help of which method? I'll be solving all the questions with the help of mole method. I'll be solving all the questions with the help of mole. Okay? So, as per the question is concerned, what we are doing? We are heating. What we are heating? We are heating up KCl. And you know, you know when KClO3 solid is heated up, it gets converted into KCl and with KCl, you write O2 as well. This is the reaction which happens, correct? Now, as per the question, how many grams of KCl you are heating up? We are heating up 12.25 grams of KCl. Okay. So, this is my given quantity here. This is my given quantity. Which method am I using? I am using the mole method. What is the first step in the mole method? Convert the given quantity into number of moles. Convert the given quantity into number of moles. We are given with the mass of KClO3. So, I will be converting the given mass of KClO3 into moles of moles. So, my first step will be to calculate the given quantity into moles. Mass of KClO3 into moles of KCLO3 is equal. Given mass of KClO3 in grams divided by molar mass of KClO3. The value comes out to be 0. Now, it's completely yours. So you want to say that we are going to heat up 12.25 grams of KClO3 or you can say we are going to heat up 0 0.1 moles of KClO3. The choice is all yours. The choice is all yours. Whether you want to say that we are going to heat up 12.25 grams of KClO3 or you want to say that we are going to heat up 0 0.1 moles of KClO3. That means the same, one of the same. Right? So what to do here now? First thing, we are using the mole method. In mole method, we are supposed to balance the reaction. So this has to be 2 times, this has to be 2, and this has to be 2. The reaction is balanced. Right? The reaction is balanced. We have already converted the given quantity into mole. Now, since we have got one reactant and two products, now what you will be doing? You will be writing one statement. See, KClO3 is the one whose data is given. And oxygen is the one whose data is to be calculated. Correct? KClO3's data is given. O2 data is to be calculated. So, you just need to relate these two things in story. Okay? So, you can say from the mole method, you can say 2 moles of KClO3 upon heating gives 3 moles of O2. Right? Stoichiometry is telling us that 2 moles of KClO3 upon heating gives 3 moles of O2. Now, we use the unitary method. What about 1 mole KClO3? 1 mole KClO3 upon heating gives 3 by 2 moles of O2. Correct? Gives 3 by 2 moles of O2. But as per the question, are we heating 1 mole of KClO3? No. We are going to heat 
0.1 moles of KCl3. So 0.1 moles of KCl3 upon heating, it gives 3 by 2 multiplied by 0.1. The value comes out to be 0.15 moles of O2. So what this term is all about? Can I say basically these are the moles of O2 which are being produced? These are the moles of O2 which are being produced upon heating 0.1 moles of KCl. Upon heating 12.25 grams of KCl. But as per the but as per the equation, where we suppose calculate the moles of O2 produced or mass of O2 produced. I was supposed to calculate the mass of O2 produced. Mass of O2 gas produced will be equal to moles of O2 produced multiplied by molar mass of O2. Moles of O2 produced is 0 0.15 and this is 32. The value comes out to be 4.8. What does this 4.8 grams mean? What does it mean? It means 4.8 grams of O2 are being produced upon heating 12.25 grams of KCl. One statement which I told you long back, the one whose data is to be calculated, the one whose data is to be calculated has to be on the right side of it. The one whose data has to be calculated, it has to be on the right side of it. Okay? Perfect. Now, my dear students, can just reverse the same question. You can just reverse the same question. I'm using mole method right now. I'm using mole method right now. Okay. You can reverse the question as well. And how exactly you can reverse the question? Let me show it to you. I mean, the question can be like this. Calculate the Calculate the mass of KCLO3 required, required to produce 4.8 grams of O2 during its decomposition. The question can be like this as well. The question can be like this as well, correct? Can be like this. So, since we know KClO3 solid upon heating, what does it give? It gives KCl and with KCl you write O2. So, since we are using, we are solving all the questions with the help of mole method. So, this is two times, this is two times, this is three times, right? Now, as per this question is concerned, calculate the mass of KClO3. We have to calculate the mass of KClO3, which is required to produce 4.8 grams of O2. This is my given quantity. It's my given quantity. Since I'm using the mole method, so what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to convert the given quantity into number of moles. This is my given quantity. Convert the given quantity into number of moles. Convert the given mass of O2 into moles of O2. Moles of O2 is equal to given mass of O2 divided by molar mass of O2. The value comes out to be 0 0.15. So as per the question, we have to produce 4.8 grams of O2. As per the question, we have to produce 0 0.15 moles of O2. Correct? Correct, people? Now, understand one important thing. Understand one important thing. As per the question, we are supposed to calculate the mass of KCLO3. We are supposed to calculate what? Mass of KCLO3. So, data for KCLO3 is to be calculated and data for O2 is given. Data for O2 is given and data for KCLO3 is to be calculated. So we are just going to relate these. We have got nothing to do with case. We have got nothing to do with case, right? Okay. Right? Now understand one important. How would I write the statement? I can write the statement like this. 2 moles of KCLO3 from the stoichiometry, 2 moles of KCLO3 upon heating, it produces 3 moles of O2. Correct? I told you one thing few minutes back. The one whose data is to be calculated has to be on the right side. Now, whose data I need to calculate? Basically, I need to calculate the data for case. That means case zero three has to be on the right. What I'll be, I'll be reversing the equation. I'll be reversing the equation. And how you are going to reverse the equation? You'll say three moles of O two are produced. 
3 moles of O2 are produced from, from 2 moles of KCl. 3 moles of O2 are produced from 2 moles of KCl. So that means 1 mole O2 is produced from 2 by 3 moles of KCl. Okay. But was I supposed to produce only 1 mole of O2? No. I was supposed to produce 0 0.15 moles. As per the equation, 0 0.15 moles of O2 are produced from 2 by 3 multiplied by 0 0.15. The value will be 0 0.1 moles of KCLO. Okay. So, what did I calculate? What did I calculate? I basically calculated the moles of KCLO. These are the most moles of KCLO3 which are enough to produce 0 0.15 moles of O2. These are the moles of KCLO3 which are enough to produce 4.8 grams of O2. But was I supposed to calculate moles of KCLO3? No. I was supposed to calculate mass of mass of KCLO3 will be equal to moles of KCLO3 multiplied by molar mass of KCLO3. All the things you this term is 0 0.1. Molar mass of KCLO3, that's 122.5 grams per mole. Value finally comes out 12.5. So, this is basically the mass of KCLO3 which is required. This is the mass of KCLO3 which is required to produce 4.8 grams of O2. Right? Is it clear? Is it clear to everyone quickly? Quickly, guys. Quickly, let's try to solve one more question. <clears throat> one more simple question. I'm solving all the questions right now from the stoichiometry, okay? From the stoichiometry with the help of mole method. I did not use the mass method. I'm just showing you the mole method. All right. Look at this question carefully. Calculate the volume of carbon dioxide. Calculate the volume of carbon dioxide. Produced at SP, STP by complete combustion of 570 grams of octane. So, as per the question, we are doing the combustion of octane, right? What is the formula for octane? C8H18. So octane, you are doing its combustion. And during the combustion of the hydrocarbon, we always get carbon dioxide with water, right? We always get carbon dioxide with water. Now, since we are using the stoichiometry, and which method in stoichiometry are we using? We are going to use the mole method. In the mole method, what do we do? We, first of all, try to balance the reaction. This is 8, so this has to be 8 times. 18 has to be 9 times. This will be x plus y by 4, which makes it 25 by 2. Correct? The reaction is done. It's balanced. Number 1. Number 2, convert the given quantity into number of moles. This is my given quantity. I am given with mass of octane. I am given with the mass of octane. So, I am going to convert the mass of octane into moles of octane. So, moles of octane is equal to given mass of octane in grams divided by molar mass of octane is 114 grams. The value comes out to be. Now, it's completely your choice whether you want to say that we are doing the combustion of 570 grams of octane or you can say we are doing the combustion of 5 moles of octane. The choice is all. Whatever you want to say. Now, my dear students, the one whose data is given, that's octane, and the one whose data is to be calculated, and the one whose data is to be calculated, we just need to relate these two. That's all. Stoichiometry coefficient error is 1. Error is 8. So, can I say from the stoichiometry of the reaction, I got to know 1 mole of octane upon combustion produces 8 moles of carbon dioxide. Right? 1 mole of octane upon combustion produces 8 moles of carbon dioxide. But as per the question, do we have to do the combustion of 1 mole of octane or we have to do the combustion of 5 moles of octane? So, I can say 5 moles of octane upon combustion produces 8 multiplied by 5. That means 40 moles of carbon dioxide. So, you got to know in total 40 moles of carbon dioxide are being produced. But am I supposed to calculate the moles of carbon dioxide produced or the volume of carbon dioxide produced? We need to calculate. We need to calculate the volume of carbon dioxide produced at STP, which will be equal to 
moles of carbon dioxide produced multiplied by 22.4 liters. This is 5, sorry, this is 40 multiplied by 22.4. The value comes out to be 896 liters. So, this is basically the volume of carbon dioxide which is being produced when we do the combustion of 570 grams of octane, or you can say when we do the combustion of uh, 40 moles of octane. Right, people? Is it clear to everyone? Is it clear to everyone? One more simple question we have. We are already given with the reaction. The reaction is 3 times NO2 gas plus H2O liquid. It gives 2 times HNO3 plus NO. How many grams of NO2? Are required to produce 25.2 grams of HNO2. Since we are using the mole method, the first step is to balance the reaction. The reaction is already balanced. Second step, convert the given quantity into moles. This is my given quantity here. So convert it in terms of number of moles. So convert the mass of HNO3 into moles of HNO3. So it's going to be equal to given mass of HNO3 in grams divided by molar mass of HNO3. Can you let me know in the chats what is the exact value which you get after solving this? Can you let me know in the chats quickly? What is the exact value which you get after solving this quickly? Everyone. What is the exact value you get after solving this? 0 0.4, yeah? 0 0.4. So, what did we do? We converted given mass of HNO3 into moles of HNO3. Now, as per the question, how many grams of NO2? Its data we are supposed to calculate. How many grams of NO2 are required to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3? So, basically, as per the question, in order to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3, in order to produce 0 0.4 moles of HNO3, how many grams of NO2 are required? So, you have to relate NO2 with HNO. This is the one whose data is given as per the question. This is the one whose data is to be calculated. And the one whose data is to be calculated, that always has to be on the right side of the equation. So, what I'll be writing? I'll be using these stoichiometry coefficients. I'll write, as per the stoichiometry, 2 moles of HNO3, 2 moles of HNO3 are produced from 2 moles of HNO3 are produced from are produced from 3 moles of NO2, right? If 2 moles of HNO3 are produced from 3 moles of NO2, 1 mole of HNO3 is produced from 3 by 2 moles of NO2. But do we need to produce only 1 mole of HNO3? No, we need to produce 0 0.4 moles of HNO3. So, 0 0.4 moles of HNO3 is produced from 3 divided by 2 multiplied by 0 0.4 moles of NO2. This is 1.2, that means 0 0.6, 0 0.6 moles of NO2. So, what did we calculate? These are the moles of NO2. These are the moles of NO2, which are, <coughs> which are required. To produce 0 0.4 moles of HNO2. But was I supposed to calculate the moles of NO2 or mass of NO2? Right? Was I supposed to calculate the moles of NO2 or mass of NO2? Since we got the moles of NO2, but what was I supposed to calculate? Mass of NO2. Mass of NO2 is going to be moles of NO2 multiplied by the molar mass of NO2. Moles of NO2 we got as 0 0.6 multiplied. Molar mass of NO2 is 32 plus 14. Comes out to be 46. Right? Solve it. Approximately the value will be 27.6. So this 27.6 grams, what is it exactly? What is it exactly? Right? What is it exactly? Quickly. 27.6 grams. It is basically that mass of NO2 which is required. Produce 25.2 grams of NO2. Hope it's clear.
Clear to everyone, people? Right? Okay. One more question. Give it a try. One more question and give it a try. Okay, what is the answer of this question, Afnan, if you remember? Afnan remembers the questions. What is the answer of this question? Quickly. <laughs> okay. How much HCl is needed? How much HCl is needed for complete reaction with 69.6 grams of MnO2? In the reaction, as per the question, in the reaction, in the reaction, how much HCl is needed? How much HCl is needed for the complete reaction with 69.6 grams of MnO2? Okay, so how are you are going to solve this question? Since I'm showing you the question solving with the help of mole method, so the reaction is already balanced. Now convert the given quantity into number of moles. So convert the mass of MnO2 into moles of MnO2. Number of moles of MnO2 is equal to given mass of MnO2 in grams. Divided by molar mass of MnO2. Right? So these are the moles of these are the moles of MnO2. These are the moles of MnO2, right? Okay. Now people understand. Understand properly what I'm going to do. As per the question, whose data is given to us? We are given with the data of MnO2. Whose data we are supposed to calculate? We are supposed to calculate the data for HCl. The one whose data is given. The one whose data is given and the one whose data is to be calculated, we just have to relate these. Okay. And the one whose data is to be calculated, that has to be on the right side. I can say from the stoichiometer, one mole of MnO2 reacts with four moles of H. One mole of MnO2 reacts with four moles of H. That means 69.6 divided by 87 moles of MnO2. Reacts with 4 multiplied by 69.6 divided by 87 moles of HCl. So, what did I calculate? These are basically the moles. These are the moles of HCl which are enough to react with these many moles of MnO2. But was I supposed to calculate the moles of HCl? No. I was supposed to calculate the mass of HCl. So, mass of HCl is going to be moles of HCl multiplied by molar mass of HCl. Right? Mass moles of HCl we got to know as 4 multiplied by 69.7 divided by 87 multiplied by molar mass of HCl is 36.5. Just solve it and this is going to be the answer of the equation. So let me know what is the value you will be getting after solving this equation. It is 116.8 grams, right? It is 116.8 grams of HCl. So this is basically the mass of HCl which is required. This is the mass of HCl which is required to react with to react with 69.6 grams of MnO2. To react with these many moles of MnO2. I hope it's clear to everyone. Yeah? Is it clear, people? Is it clear to everyone? Is it clear to everyone? Let me know in the chats with the thumbs ups quickly. Okay. <coughs> Perfect. Let's have a look on how stoichiometry, how this mole method, how this mole method is used in sequential reactions. Right? So, first of all, what are sequential reactions? Let's get to know. Sequential reactions are the ones which are carried out in a sequence. They are not one step reactions, they are multi step reactions. They are multi step reactions. For example, for example, you have got a reaction like this A plus B, it gives C. C upon reaction with D, it gives E. If I add these two reactions, if I add these two reactions, on adding these two reactions, this C and this C got cancelled. So my net reaction is going to be A plus B plus D, it gives E. Now, if I ask you whether this particular reaction is completed in one step or more than one step, this reaction. It's completed in more than one. It's completed in more than one. 
right so basically the c which is getting formed in the first reaction c is the product of the first reaction right and c the same c it is the reactant of the second reaction so can i say the product which is formed in the first reaction that is becoming the reactant of the second reaction yeah right so whatever amount of c gets formed in the first reaction same amount of c gets consumed in the second reaction do you agree with that do you agree with that whatever c will be getting formed in the first reaction same amount of c will be consumed in the second reaction yeah this is something which you need to remember that's all this is something which you need to remember that's all whatever c gets formed in the first reaction same amount of c is being utilized is being consumed in the second reaction okay now how we are going to solve the questions then look at this question look at this question my as far as this particular sequential reaction is concerned in the first reaction kclo is getting formed and whatever KCLO is getting formed in the first reaction, same amount of KCLO is being consumed in the second. Whatever KCLO3 is getting formed in the second reaction, same amount of KCLO3 is being utilized in the third. And eventually, what is getting formed? Eventually, KCLO. What we need to calculate? Calculate the mass of KCLO4. Calculate the mass of KCLO4 formed on starting with 568 grams of cl2 right so the question is we are starting with 568 grams of cl2 on starting with 568 grams of cl2 calculate the mass of kclo4 which gets formed at which methods are we using we are using the mole method in the mole method always the first step convert the given quantity into number of moles given quantity here is mass of cl2 convert the mass of cl2 into moles of right given mass of Cl2 in grams, divided by molar mass of Cl2, it comes out to be, okay, so whether you want to say that you are starting with 568 grams of Cl2, or you can say you are starting with 8 moles of Cl2, the choice is completely, okay, now guys understand, Cl2 and here KClO is getting, getting formed, this KClO is the reactant in the second reaction, here KClO3 is being formed, this KClO3 is the reactant in the third reaction and over here KClO4 is being formed, okay? Now understand, first of all you need to balance all these steps and right here in this question, the steps are already balanced. The steps are already balanced. From the stoichiometry, can I say 1 mole of Cl2 is producing 1 mole of KClO? So 1 mole of Cl2 gives 1 mole of ClO. 1 mole of Cl2 gives 1 mole of KClO. Do I have only 1 mole of Cl2? No, we have 8 moles of Cl2. If 1 mole of Cl2 gives 1 mole of KClO, so I can say 8 moles of Cl2 will produce 8 moles of KClO. So, this 8 moles of KClO, I can say from the first reaction, 8 moles of KClO is being produced. And whatever KClO is being produced in the first reaction, same amount of KClO will be utilized in the second reaction. How exactly? See, this is 3 here, this is 1 here. From the stoichiometry, can I say, from the stoichiometry, can I say 3 moles of KClO gives 1 mole of KClO3. That means, 1 mole of KClO3 gives 1 by 3 moles of KClO. Sorry, that means 1 mole of KClO, it gives 1 by 3 moles of KClO3. Hey guys, it's simple. 3 moles of KCLO gives 1 mole of KCLO3. So, 1 mole of KCLO, it gives 1 by 3 moles of KCLO3. Right? How much KCLO was being formed in the first reaction? 8. Whatever KCLO was formed in the first reaction, same amount of KCLO is utilized in the second reaction. So, if 1 mole of KCLO gives 1 by 3 moles of KCLO3, so 8 moles of KCLO, which got formed in the first reaction, right? Now are going to give 1 by 3 multiplied by 8, 8 by 3 moles of KClO3. So, we got to know the moles of KClO3 which are being formed in the second reaction. That's 8 by 3. So, 8 by 3 moles of KClO3 got formed in the second reaction. And whatever moles of KClO3 got formed in the second reaction, 
same moles of KClO3 will be utilized in the third reaction. Have a look. Four moles gives us three moles. So one mole gives us three by four moles. So eight by three moles will give us, let me write it one by one. Four moles of KClO3. Upon reaction in the third step, it gives, it gives three moles of KClO4. So one mole of KClO3. One mole of KClO3. It gives three by four moles of KClO4. But do I have only one mole of KClO3? No, we do not have one mole of KClO3. We have got eight by three moles of KClO3 here. So I can say eight by three moles of KClO3 gives three by four multiplied by eight by three. The value comes out to be two moles of KClO3. So what did I calculate? I calculated the moles of KClO4 which are being formed at the end of the reaction. These are the moles of KClO4. These are the moles of KClO4 which are being formed at the end of the reaction. But as per the question, as per the question, was I supposed to calculate moles of KClO4 or mass of KClO4? I was supposed to calculate the mass of KClO4. Since moles you have calculated, multiply the moles by its mole mass. Is that clear? Is that clear, people? Is that clear to everyone quickly? All right. Let's see one more question then. Okay. One more sequential reaction question. First of all, as per the question, you are starting with 134.4 liters of NH3. You are starting with these many liters of NH3. So convert the given quantity to number of moles. So first of all, let me calculate number of moles of NH3, which will be equal to given volume of NH3 in liters divided by 22.4. This value comes out to be 6. Yeah, approximately 6. Let me take the value approximately as 6, whatever it comes. Okay, leave it. So as per the question, we are starting with, we are starting with, we are starting with 6 moles of NH3. In the first reaction, as you can see, NO is being formed. And whatever NO is being formed is utilized in the second reaction. In the second reaction, NO2 is being formed. And whatever NO2 is being formed, that's utilized in the third reaction. And in the third reaction, at the end, what's being formed? HNO3. And we have to calculate, we have to calculate. Mass of HNO3, which gets formed at the end. How exactly we are going to see? As per the equation, 4 moles gives 4 moles. So 1 mole gives 1 mole. So 6 moles of NH3 gives 6 moles of NO. So in the first reaction, 6 moles of NO are being formed. 6 moles of NO are being formed. Now, whatever 6 moles of NO are being formed, same moles of NO are being utilized in the second reaction. Okay, have a look. 2 moles gives 2 moles. So 1 mole should give 1 mole. That means it's 6 moles. It should give 6 moles of NO2. So as per the question, I got to know 6 moles of NO2 are being formed. 6 moles of NO2 are being formed in the second reaction. And whatever NO2 is being formed in the second reaction, same amount of NO2 will be utilized here. Right? Have a look. Can I say 3 moles of NO2 gives 2 moles of HNO3? If 3 moles gives 2 moles, so 1 mole gives 2 by 3 moles. 6 moles will give, 6 moles will give 2 by 3 multiplied by 6. The value comes out to be 4. So 4 moles of HNO3 is being formed at the end. But am I supposed to calculate? Moles of HNO3 formed or mass of HNO3? Mass of HNO3 will be moles multiplied by moles. It will be 4, 3, 12. 252 grams of HNO3 is being formed at the end. Is that clear to now, everyone now? Is that clear to everyone quickly? Is that clear to everyone quickly? Is that clear to everyone quickly, quickly, quickly?
Okay. <clears throat> One more question of the similar type. As far as this question is concerned, calculate the mass of polyethylene that can be produced from 10 kg of calcium carbide. So you are starting with 10 kg of calcium carbide and we have to calculate the mass of polyethylene being formed at the end of the We are solving all the questions as per mole method. So what I'll be doing again, I'll be converting the given quantity into moles. Number of moles of CAC is equal. Given mass of calcium carbide in grams, divided by its molar mass. So these many moles of CAC2 we have with which we are starting, right? Now as you can see, as you can see, CAC2 is forming C2H2. And whatever C2H2 is being formed in the second reaction, it's forming C2H4 here. And that C2H4 is consumed here and at the end polyethylene. We need to calculate the mass of polyethylene. All right, have a look. So from the stoichiometry of the reaction, look at the first reaction. Can I say one mole of CaC2 gives one mole of C2H2? One mole of CaC2, it produces, it produces one mole of C2H2. But do I have only one mole of CaC2? No, I've got 10,000 by 64. So 10,000 divided by 64. Moles of CAC2 produces 10,000 divided by 64 moles of C2H2. So these are the moles of C2H2 which are produced in the first. Now, whatever moles of C2H2 are produced in the first reaction, same moles of C2H2 are utilized in the second reaction. And as per the second reaction, one mole gives one mole, correct? So I can say, 1 mole C2H2 in the second reaction. It gives 1 mole of C2H4, right? But do I have only 1 mole of C2H2? No. We have got these many moles of C2H2 which got formed in the first reaction. So can I say 10,000 divided by 64 moles of C2H2 should give me 10,000 divided by 64 moles of C2H4? What is this point? What is this point? These are the moles of C2H4 which got formed in the second reaction and whatever moles of C2H4 got formed in the second reaction, same moles of C2H4 will be utilized in the will be utilized in the third reaction. How exactly? So, geometric coefficient here is n, here it's 1. So, in the third step, can I say n moles of C2H4, n moles of C2H4 produces Reduces one mole of, this is something which you call as polyethylene, right? Reduces one mole of polyethylene. So, from the unitary method, one mole of C2 reduces one by n moles of polyethylene. But do I have only one mole of C2H4? No. We have got these many moles of C2H4, which got formed in the second step. I would say 10,000 divided by 60 moles of C2H4 will produce 10,000 divided by 64 n moles of polyethylene. So these are the moles of polyethylene which got formed at the end of the reaction. But as per the question, do I need to calculate the moles of polyethylene? No, I need to calculate the mass of polyethylene, which is equal to moles of polyethylene formed multiplied by molar mass of poly. What are the moles of polyethylene? It's 10,000 divided by 64 with n multiplied by Molar mass of polyethylene. What is the molar mass of polyethylene? Carbon 12 to 24. 24 plus 4 is 28. So it's 28n. Right? So multiply it with 28n. N n got cancelled. So the value comes out to be 28 divided by grams. Solve it. That's going to give you the mass of polyethylene which got formed. Clear? So guys, can you solve these sort of questions as well? Yeah? <clears throat> okay, so guys, 
this session will be ending here only since i told you there are some big chapters which will take two sessions and whole concept is one of them thermodynamics is one of them right so the rest of the chapters i mean the rest of the topics in this particular in this particular chapter we'll be doing them on after 3 days because tomorrow it's dresser session after tomorrow it's ambika mams then hsb sir then again it's mice okay perfect so this was your mole concept part 1 and mole concept part 2 will be done after 3 days perfect i have told you in a week we'll be completing four chapters right two chapters from chemistry one from physics and one from bio since physics it's vectors that small chapter that will be done tomorrow only in chemistry in chemistry your complete mole concept will be done like half is done today and half will be done on the fifth day okay and hsp sir is going to take goc he'll be taking two sessions perfect so one week completely four chapters will be done but everything as you saw i am going to teach in detail in this batch perfect because i'm not going to skip a single thing you must have seen till now right that's how the batch is going to continue okay and do let me know please and please in the comment section of the video once the video ends do let me know in the comment section did you actually like the session do you want the sessions to be complete in a similar way or do you want to be i mean do you want me to be fast do you want me to be slow or did you like the pace did you like all these different problem patterns which i am myself showing right perfect priya pyqs are included here lot we solved a lot, lot of pyqs till now okay perfect guys so with this i'll be taking leave let's come let's come up uh, with the part 2 of the mole concept after 3 days right do let me know i mean do write in the comment section that the challenge is accepted right waiting for part 2 mole okay so this is the telegram channel on which you are going to get the pdf t.me/wassimsircheem this is the telegram channel on which you will be getting the session pdf and do write something in the comments that challenge accepted for mole part 2 and let me tell you in the part 2 of mole what all topics will be covering number 1 limiting reagent percentage yield percentage purity mixture analysis concentration test five topics are there okay hello see you see you in the second part of the mole concept then take care sleep well and do revise the same topics again otherwise you might forget them okay otherwise you might forget them so do revise them again whatever topics are there. take care guys god bless you all in the next session in the last session we discussed about stoichiometry in the stoichiometry i showed you exactly three methods one was the mole method one was the mass method one was the volume method right mole method we discussed in detail and right now i'm going to discuss mass method with you first of all right i'll show you exactly one more way of solving the questions in stoichiometry i'm going to show you one more way of solving the questions in stoichiometry my dear students with the help of mass method okay and after that you decide whatever method you find easy you apply that method method in the questions okay perfect so let's get going let's get going let's get going just a second i hope voice everything is all perfect yeah i hope voice and everything is all perfect all right people so let's have a look on let's have a look on a question let's have a look on a question if you remember this question we have already solved in the last session with the help of mole method right now the same question we are going to solve with the help of one more method and at the end it's going to be your choice to select the method and follow that okay now guys have a look the question is calculate the mass of oxygen gas produced calculate the mass of oxygen gas produced on heating 12.25 grams of kclo3 at stp okay this is the question we have solved the same question with the help of mole method now let's have a look how mass method is utilized to solve this question so we are going to talk about the mass method now mass method 
माई डियर स्टूडेंट्स वेन एवर यू यूज मोल मेथड और मास मेथड इन स्टॉइशोमेट्री द फर्स्ट थिंग ऑलवेज इज टू बैलेंस द रिएक्शन दिस हैज टू बी ऑलवेज योर फर्स्ट स्टेप जस्ट बैलेंस द रिएक्शन राइट नाउ पर्टिकुलरली इन मास मेथड आफ्टर बैलेंसिंग द रिएक्शन कन्वर्ट द गिवन क्वांटिटी इन टू मास कन्वर्ट द गिवन क्वांटिटी इन टू मास इफ यू रिमेंबर इन मोल मेथड वॉट वी वेर सपोज टू डू इन मोल मेथड वी वेर सपोज टू कन्वर्ट द गिवन क्वांटिटी इन टू मोल्स But here we are supposed to convert the given quantity into mass. Look at the question carefully and see what is our given quantity. My dear students, we are given with one twenty-two point sorry, we are given with twelve point two five grams of KClO three. We are given with twelve point two five grams of KClO three. So this twelve point two five grams, it is our given quantity, and it's already given in terms of mass only, right? Grams is the unit. It's already given in terms of mass. so no need to change it it's already given in terms of mass okay now i hope every one of you would remember the reaction we know when kclo3 is heated it gets converted into kcl and with kcl you get o2 as well let's try to balance the reaction this has to be two times this has to be two times this has to be three times okay the one whose data is to be calculated the one whose data is to be calculated and the one whose data is given just relate the two just relate the two guys simple and basic understand properly what i'm going to say understand properly we are supposed to calculate the mass of oxygen gas produced on heating 12.25 grams of kclo3 so as per the question we have to heat up 12.25 grams of kclo3 and on heating 12.25 grams of kclo3 we should we have to calculate the mass of oxygen gas produced okay so i'm going to relate these two things one thing if i ask you what is the molar mass of kclo3 molar mass of kclo3 is 122.5 grams that means mass of one mole of kclo3 that is 122.5 gram but right now if i ask you do i have one mole of kclo3 here or two moles Of two moles of KCLO. If the mass of one mole of KCLO three is one twenty two point five grams, so what has to be the mass of two moles of KCLO three? It has to be two forty five grams. So I'll write two forty five grams of KCLO three upon heating gives. Now tell me what is the molar mass of O two? Molar mass of O two is thirty two grams. That means mass of one mole of O two is thirty two grams. But Do I have one mole of O2 or three moles of O2? I have three moles of O2. Now you tell me, if the mass of one mole of O2 is 32 grams, what has to be the mass of three moles of O2? It has to be 96 grams of O2. Right? So my dear students, just look at this particular statement carefully. Whose data I was supposed to calculate? I was supposed to calculate the data for O2. As I told you in the last session, the one whose data has to be calculated. that has to be on the right side so o2 is already on right side done look at this particular statement carefully the statement is written in terms of mass the statement is written in terms of mass so which method i'm using here i'm using the mass method i'm using the mass method now guys you're almost done stoichiometry is telling me that 245 grams of kclo3 upon heating gives 96 grams of o2 Now we use the unitary method. Can I say one gram of KClO three upon heating should give me ninety six divided by two forty five grams of O two? This is something which stoichiometry tells me that on heating one gram of KClO three, you'll get these many grams of O two. But as per the question, am I supposed to heat one gram of KClO three? No, I'm supposed to heat twelve point two five grams of KClO three. Now you tell me, upon heating, twelve point two five grams of KClO three. How much mass of O two will be produced? Ninety six divided by two forty five multiplied by twelve point two five grams of O two. When you solve this particular term, my dear students, you'll get it exactly four point eight grams of O two. So what did you calculate basically? What is this particular term? 
This is basically that mass of O2, which is produced upon heating to 12.25 grams of KClO3. As simple as that. The same answer you got with the help of mole method as well, if you remember. Same, same answer. Now, it's completely your choice to select the method. Whether you want to approach the question with the help of mole method or you want to approach the question with the help of mass method, the choice is all yours. Okay, let's try to solve one more question which we have already done in the last session. But right now, we are going to solve the question with one more approach. That is the mass method approach. Do you remember this question we did in the last session? Now, let's solve the same question with the help of mass method as well. Let's solve the same question with the help of mass method as well. The first step is to balance the reaction. Second step, convert the given quantity into mass. That's what we need to do. Okay. Now, guys, let's have a look on the reaction first of all. It is three times NO2 gas plus H2O liquid. It gives two times HNO3 aqueous plus NO gas. The reaction is already given in, in the balanced format. The reaction is already given in the balanced format. Okay. Now, guys, look at the given quantity. The given quantity is already as per mass, right? It is already given in terms of mass only. It's 25.2 grams. My given quantity is already in mass, in the form of mass. So I do not need to convert it. It's already in the form of mass, right? No need of conversion. Now look at the question. How many grams of NO2, how many grams of NO2 are required to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3? So as per the question, we need to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3. And in order to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3, how many grams of NO2 are needed? How many grams of NO2 are required to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3? Now look at the question carefully. My dear students, I'm using which method? I'm using mass method. So I have to write this statement in terms of mass. And how exactly? Have a look. If I ask you, what is the molar mass of NO2? 14 plus 32 comes out to be 46, right? So I would say 46 grams, that is the molar mass of NO2. 46 grams is the mass of one mole of NO2. But do I have one mole of NO2 or three moles? I have three moles of NO2. Now, if the mass of one mole of NO2 is 46 grams, what will be the mass of three moles of NO2? It will be 138 grams. So I'll write 138 grams of NO2 here. Okay. Now talk about this HNO3. What is the molar mass of HNO3? Calculate it. It will be 63 grams. 63 grams is the mass of one mole of HNO3. But do I have one mole or two moles? I have two moles of HNO3. If the mass of one mole of HNO3 is 63 grams, the mass of two moles of HNO3 has to be 126 grams of HNO3. Now, guys, read the question carefully. Read the question and tell me whose data I'm supposed to calculate. Am I supposed to calculate the data for NO2 or am I supposed to calculate the data for HNO3? Look at the question. How many grams of NO2? How many grams of NO2 are required? So I need to calculate the data for NO2. And the one whose data is to be calculated, that has to be on the right side of the statement. That has to be on the right side of the statement. So what do I need to do? I just need to reverse the statement so that NO2 comes on the right side. So I'll be writing something like this. I'll write 126 grams of HNO3. 126 grams of HNO3 are produced. As per stoichiometry, 126 grams of HNO3 are produced from 138 grams of NO2. Okay. Guys, today you are going to see some mind-blowing questions, right? Just wait for that. 126 grams of HNO3 are produced from 138 grams of NO2. Use the unitary method. Can I say 1 gram of HNO3 is produced from 138 divided by 126 grams of NO2? Right? So 1 gram of HNO3 is produced from these many grams of NO2. But am I supposed to produce... 1 gram of HNO3? No. I'm supposed to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3. So 25.2 grams of HNO3. 
will be produced from 138 divided by 126 multiplied by 25.2 and this will be grams of NO2. Value comes out to be, I think this value comes out to be 27.6 grams of NO2. Okay. So what did I calculate? Check it out. Check it out. What did I calculate? This is the mass of NO2. This is the mass of NO2, which is required to produce 25.2 grams of HNO3. Let me know once quickly in the chats. Can you solve the questions with the help of this particular approach as well? Can you solve the questions with the mass method as well from now onwards quickly in the chats? Quickly guys, quickly. Jashri, you have to increase the volume. I cannot do that. I'm already talking in high pitch. Perfect. <clears throat> Done. Wonderful. So I'm assuming that you guys can easily solve these sort of questions from now onwards. Okay. Now, guys, mass method is though done, right? Now, let's talk about first of all one more important concept that's called as limiting reagent. Have you heard of this term, limiting reagent? The most important type, the most important concept from the chapter mole concept, because this concept is almost involved everywhere in the physical chemistry. It is almost involved everywhere in the physical chemistry, people. Limiting reagent. So let's have a look what limiting reagent is all about. This is the most important concept of the chapter. Okay. So first of all, how do we define the limiting reagent? I would say that reactant, that reactant, which gets, which gets completely consumed that reactant which gets completely consumed earlier in the reaction earlier in the reaction that's something which you call as limiting reagent that's something which you call as limiting reagent the other reactant the other reactant is called as is called as excessive reagent. Let's get to know about these two terms, these two statements which I mentioned over here. Have a look people, this is important, okay? Just to make you understand, just to make you understand, let's say I've got a reaction in this format, A plus B, it gives C plus D. Let's assume it's one balanced chemical equation. Let's assume that it's a balanced chemical equation, yeah? Let's assume that it's a balanced chemical equation. For example, I'm writing something at time t is equal to zero. t is equal to zero means the reaction has not started yet. Reaction has not started yet. What does that mean? That means the reactants have not reacted yet to form the products. Okay. So at time t is equal to zero, reaction has not started yet. So reactants have not reacted yet to form the products. I'm assuming initially at time t is equal to zero, I have got some 10 moles of A and 5 moles of B. Let's say initially I've got 10 moles of A and 5 moles of B. So this has to be 0, this has to be 0 because the reaction has not started yet. Now my dear students, when the reaction will start, when this particular reaction will start, when the reactants will start reacting, when the reactants will start reacting to form products, what will happen to the moles of the reactant? Initially, I had A moles, I had 10 moles of A. I had 5 moles of B. When the reaction will start, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Can I say number of moles of reactants will keep on decreasing with time? And number of moles of products will keep on increasing with time? Yeah? Right? So number of moles of reactants will keep on decreasing with time. Can I say there will be a time when one of the reactant will get completely consumed in the reaction? Yes, when the reaction will start, number of moles of reactants will keep on decreasing. 
there will be a time when one of the reactant will get completely consumed in the reaction. And if one of the reactant gets consumed in the reaction, the reaction will stop. The reaction will stop. So let's assume B is the reactant which is getting completely consumed in the reaction. Okay. So after some time, you will find some zero moles of B left in the container. You will find that B is completely consumed. B is completely consumed. And you know, that reactant which gets completely consumed earlier in the reaction, what do we call that as? We call that as the limiting reagent. So in this reaction, B has to be what? B has to be limiting reagent. Right? B has to be limiting reagent. If B is the limiting reagent, I would call this A as the excess reagent. I would call this A as the excess reagent. Okay. What does that mean? That means I took initially 10 moles of A. But it's the excess reagent. It's not getting completely consumed in the reaction. So when the reaction stops, there will be some moles of A left in the container. There will be some moles of C which would have formed. There will be some moles of D which would have got formed. Only B is the one which has got, which has consumed, which has been consumed completely. Okay, so I hope you just got the idea of what is limiting reagent. In short, limiting reagent is the one which gets completely consumed in the course of reaction. Okay, and when one of the reactant gets consumed, what happens? Reaction stops. Reaction stops. Okay, if one is the limiting reagent, other one is called as the excess reagent. There will be some moles of excess reagent left in the container. And there will be some moles of products which would have got formed at the time of limiting reagent. Okay? I hope the concept is a bit clear to you. Now, we are going to see how this concept is used in the question. And where to apply this concept, how to apply this concept. That's important here. Okay? So let's try to understand how to apply this particular concept. Let's try to understand. Have a look, guys. Let's try to understand how this particular concept is applied and used. Okay. Let's say I'm writing the reaction as one simple reaction, N2 plus H2. It gives NH3. This is the reaction, very simple and basic reaction. Okay. Now, dear students, I'm writing T is equal to zero. So initially, time T is equal to zero when the reaction has not started. Let's assume I have got 10 moles of N2 and 10 moles of H2 present in the container. So if I ask you, if I ask you, how many moles of NH3 would have got formed? Right now, zero. Okay. Now, my dear students, now, my dear students, remember, remember, whenever, whenever in a question, you will be given with the amounts of all the reactants. Whenever in a question, you will be given with the amounts of all the reactants. Like in this case, we are given with the moles of all the reactants. Right? In another case, mass of all reactants will be given. In another case, volume of all reactants will be given. So in short, whenever you will be given with the amounts of all the reactants, at that time, you will be using the concept of limiting reagent. So when the concept of limiting reagent U is used, I'll write it over here. When the amounts of all the reactants, when the amounts of all the reactants are given, this is when you use the concept of limiting reagent. Okay. Now, dear students, since we got to know when to use the concept of limiting reagent, now how to use the limiting reagent? The first step always, the first step always is going to be balancing of the reaction. The first step always is going to be balancing the reaction. Is the reaction balanced? The reaction is not yet balanced. So balance it, make it three times, make it two times, make it one. Now the reaction is balanced. After balancing the reaction, we are supposed to identify which one is the limiting reagent. After balancing the reaction, we are supposed to identify which one is the limiting reagent. How do we identify the limiting reagent? There is a special procedure for that. There, will be, there is a special procedure for that. How do we identify the limiting reagent? Just do one simple thing. Divide the given moles, divide the given moles of reactants by their respect to stoichiometric coefficients. Like I'm writing 10 divided by 1. 10 divided by 1. Here, it's going to be 10 divided by 3. 
divide the given moles of reactants by their respective stoichiometric options. What is the value here? The value comes out to be 10. What is the value here? It comes out to be 3.33. The one which gets the lesser value, the one which gets the lesser value, that has to be your limiting reagent all the time. Given moles divided by stoichiometric coefficient. The one which gets the lesser value, that will be the limiting reagent. So which one is getting the lesser value? 3.33 is less. So it's going to be H2, which is the limiting reagent. So I hope you got to know how to identify the limiting reagent. So after balancing, we have to identify the limiting reagent. So we have identified in this particular question, the limiting reagent is H2. If the limiting reagent is H2, so N2 has to be the excess reagent, okay? Now, H2 is the limiting reagent. It would have got completely consumed in the reaction. We started with 10 moles of limiting reagent. We started with 10 moles of H2. After some time, you will find some zero moles of H2 in the container. It would have got completely consumed. And at that point of time, the reaction would have stopped. The reaction would have stopped. When the reaction would have stopped, since N2 is the excess reagent, N2 is the excess reagent. So out of 10 moles of N2, there will be some moles of N2 left in the container when the reaction would have stopped. Similarly, there would be some moles of NH3 which would have formed in the, which would have formed in the container. Okay. Now the point is how to check how many moles of NH3 have got formed. How to check how many moles of N2 are still left in the container when the reaction stops. How do we do that? Have a look. Have a look, guys. First of all, let's talk about the calculation of products. Calculation of moles of products. This is the first application of it. Calculation of moles of products. I need to calculate the number of moles of NH3 formed. Have a look how am I going to do that. Number of moles of NH3 formed. First of all, let me tell you, the entire product formation, the entire product formation is decided by the limiting reagent. Limiting reagent is the one which decides the entire product formation. What I'll be doing, since I need to calculate the moles of NH3 formed, I'll be relating the stoichiometric coefficient of limiting reagent with this product. Here it's 3, here it's 2. Now we use the mole method. Can I say, from the stoichiometry I can say, 3 moles of limiting reagent, 3 moles of limiting reagent, it gives... 2 moles of NH3. It gives 2 moles of NH3. So, 1 mole of limiting reagent should give me 2 by 3 moles of NH3. But as per the question, did we start with 1 mole of H2 or 10 moles of H2? We started with 10 moles of H2. So, I would say 10 moles of H2 should give 2 by 3 multiplied by 10. The value is 6.66 moles of NH3. So, finally, you got to know that 6.66 moles of NH3 have got formed at the end of the reaction. My dear students, do you remember? Do you remember? Entire product formation is decided by the limiting reagent. You'll be always starting with the limiting reagent, number one. Okay. Now, the second application is calculation of, let me erase all this. I hope this is clear. The second application is, what is that? That is the calculation. Calculation of moles of excess reagent left. This is one more application of it. Limiting reagent is going to let you know how many moles of excess reagent are left in the container. You started with 10 moles of N2. Now finally there will be some moles of N2 left in the container. Limiting reagent is going to let you know about that. How exactly? Have a look. Just relate the stoichiometry of the limiting reagent with N2 now. Here it's 3, here it's 1. So can I say, can I say 3 moles of H2 as per the stoichiometry, 3 moles of H2 reacts with, 3 moles of H2 reacts with 1 mole of N2. Right? I can say something like this. 3 moles of H2 reacts with 1 mole of N2. Now dear students, if 3 moles of H2 reacts with 1 mole of N2, can I say 1 mole of H2 reacts with 1 by 3 moles of N2, unitary method. But did we start with 1 mole of H2? No, we started with 10 moles of H2. So can I say 10 moles of H2 would have reacted with 1 by 3 multiplied by 10. The value will be 3.3 moles of N2. So can you let me know what this 3.3 is all about? 
Can you let me know what this 3.33 is all about? Can I say these are basically the moles of N2? These are the moles of N2 which have reacted with, which have reacted with 10 moles of H2. So you got to know that 10 moles of H2, 10 moles of H2 are reacting with 3.33 moles of N2. How many moles of N2 did I take? I had taken some 10 moles of N2. Out of 10 moles of N2, how many moles of N2 are reacting? 3.33. So out of 10 moles, 3.33 are reacting. So 6.66 moles of N2 will be still left in the container as such. I hope you got it. I hope you got it. Quickly in the chats, if you got it. Quickly. So I taught you two things. Calculation of moles of products. Calculation of moles of excess reagent left. Now guys, it's not necessary that they'll ask you to calculate moles. They can ask you mass. They can ask you volume. They can ask you molecules, right? But if they ask anything, first you have to calculate these moles. First you have to calculate these moles. For example, you got to know that at the end of the reaction, 6.66 moles of NH3 are being formed. Now moles multiplied by molar mass of NH3, that gives you the mass of NH3 formed. Moles multiplied by 22.4 liters, that gives you the volume of NH3 formed at STP. Moles multiplied by Avogadro's number, that gives you the number of molecules of NH3 formed, right? Similarly, these are the moles of N2 left in the container. Moles multiplied by molar mass of N2, that gives you the mass of N2 left. Moles multiplied by Avogadro's number, that gives you the molecules of N2 left in the container, right? All these things can be asked. All these things can be asked. But to calculate all these things, you should have the data for moles. You should have the data for moles. Perfect. So let me quickly recap it. Whenever in a reaction, the amounts of all the reactants are given, we use the concept of limiting reagent. In the limiting region concept, we are supposed to balance the reaction first. After balancing the reaction, identify the limiting region. How? Divide the moles by the respect to stoichiometric coefficients. The one which gets the lesser value, that has to be your limiting region. Limiting region is the one which decides the entire product formation. Limiting region is the one which decides how many moles of excess reagent have reacted. Yes? Perfect. If this is perfect, this question though you should kill. Tell me in this particular reaction which one is your limiting reagent. Reaction is given and it's given in balanced format. And as per the question is concerned, initially we have got 3 moles of NaOH and we have got 4 moles of H2SO4. This will be 0, this will be 0. Right? Now dear students have a look. Amounts of all the reactants are given. So which concept? Limiting region concept. The first step is to balance the reaction, it's balanced. After balancing, what do we need to do? Identify how? Divide the given moles by the respect to stoichiometric coefficients. So it's 3 divided by 2 and it's 4 divided by 1. This value will be 1.5. This value will be 4. The one which gets the lesser value, that has to be the limiting reagent. So it's NaOH here which is the limiting reagent. Done understood? Right? Done understood? I hope this is clear. All right, one more question. You should kill these questions now, people. One more. The reaction is already given in the balanced format. Let me write it. Six times LIH plus eight times BF3. It gives six times LIBF4 plus B2H6. Plus B2H6. The reaction is already given in the balanced format. Now, as per the question, on starting with two moles each of reactants. On starting with two moles each of reactants. How many moles of B to H6 can be produced? How many moles of B to H6 can be produced? You have to calculate the moles of B to H6 formed. Now dear students, I'm again given with the amounts of all the reactants. Which concept? Limiting region concept, right? And in the limiting region concept, we are supposed to balance the reaction. It's balanced. Now identify the limiting reagent. Given moles. Divide by stoichiometric coefficients. So 2 divided by 6 and 2 divided by 8. Now which value comes out to be lesser? What do you think? 2 by 6 is less or 2 by 8 is less? 2 by 8 is less. The one which gets the lesser value, that has to be the limiting reagent. So basically it's BF3 which is the limiting reagent. If BF3 is the limiting reagent, after some time, you'll find some zero moles of BF3 left in the container. 
Now, entire product formation, that is decided by BF3, right? Now, what do I need to calculate? I need to calculate the moles of B2H6 formed. So, just relate the stoichiometry of limiting reagent with B2H6, right? So, can I say 8 moles of limiting reagent gives 1 mole of B2H6. I'll write it here. 8 moles of limiting reagent produces 1 mole of B2H6, right? So, can I say 1 mole of BF3, 1 mole of limiting reagent, it produces 1 by 8 moles of B2H6? Absolutely. But did I start with 1 mole of BF3? No. We started with 2 moles of BF3. So, 2 moles of BF3 should produce 1 by 8 multiplied by 2. The value will be 0 0.25 moles of B2H6. So, finally, you got to know that 0 0.25 moles of B2H6 would have got formed at the end of the reaction. Similarly, can you tell me how many moles of LiBF4 would have got formed? Simple. 8 moles gives 1, 6 moles. So, 1 gives 6 by 8, 2 gives 6 by 8 multiplied by 2. So, these are the moles of LiBF4 which would have got formed. Anyways, this is not supposed to be calculated, right? Only this thing we had to calculate, but I'm just telling you. Similarly, this LiH, this is the excess reagent. You can calculate the moles of excess reagent left also in the container. Correct? First, you will see how many moles of LIH have reacted. Then, initial moles minus the reacted moles of LIH. That's it. Simple. 8 moles reacts with 6 moles. So, 1 mole reacts with 6 by 8. 2 moles reacts with 6 by 8 multiplied by 2. 6 divided by 8 multiplied by 2 is uh, 12 by 8. 12 by 8 is uh, 3 divided by 2, 1.5. So, basically, 1.5 moles of LIH would have reacted. And I started with 2 moles. So, 2 minus 1.5 comes out to be 0 0.5. So, 0 0.5 moles of LIH will be left as such at the end of the reaction. I hope this is clear. All clear? Let's try to do one more question, guys. Let me give you one question. Okay, let me give you one question. The question is like this. On starting with, on starting with 10 moles each of BACL2 and Na3PO4 and Na3PO4. Calculate the, calculate the moles of BA3PO4 whole twice formed. Can you do it? Say yes or no in the chats. Can you do it? Say yes or no in the chats. Can you do it? Can you do it? Yes or no? Perfecto. What are we guys directly saying no? At least try it. Change your confidence. Change your attitude towards learning. Try it. Don't directly say no. All right. Have a look, people. As per the question is concerned, BACL2 is reacting with Na3PO4. Right? So, first of all, BACL2 when it reacts with Na3PO4, what does it give? It gives Ba3PO4 whole twice. This is the reaction which I gave you in the last session as well. With this, you'll be getting NaCl as well. Okay? This is the reaction. Now, dear students, initially at time t is equal to 0, we are starting with 10 moles each of reactants. 10 moles each of reactants. So, this has to be 0, this has to be 0. Now, as per the question, amounts of all the reactants are given. So, which concept? Limiting reagent concept. Right? Limiting reagent concept. Yeah? Yes, Harini, you can do that. It will be beneficial for you. So, in the limiting reagent concept, what do we need to do? We are supposed to balance the reaction. So, balance it. This has to be 3 times. This has to be 2. This will be 1. 
and this will be 6. The reaction is balanced. After balancing the reaction, what do we need to do? Identify the limiting reagent. Given moles by stoichiometric option. 10 by 3, 10 by 2. 10 by 3 is less. So BaCl2 has to be the limiting reagent. If BaCl2 is the limiting reagent, after some time, when the reaction stops, you'll find some zero moles of BaCl2 left in the container. Now, what do we need to calculate? Moles of Ba3 PO4 whole twice formed. Entire product formation is decided by the limiting reagent. Have a look. This is 3 here. This is 1. So can I say 3 moles of BaCl2 produces 3 moles of BaCl2 produces 1 mole of Ba3 PO4 whole twice. Okay. So that means 1 mole of BaCl2 produces 1 by 3 moles of Ba3PO4 whole twice. But did we start with 1 mole of BaCl2? No, we started with 10 moles of BaCl2. So I must say 10 moles of BaCl2 produces 1 by 3 multiplied by 10. The value comes out to be 3.33. So these are the moles of Ba3PO4 whole twice which have got formed at the end of the reaction. Yeah, that's something which we were supposed to calculate. I hope you can solve all the questions from now onwards are related to the limiting reagent. Yeah? One more question. This is your homework. I'm just giving you the reaction here. This is your homework. H2SO4 plus NaOH. It gives Na2SO4 plus water. Okay? This is the reaction. And as per the question, you are not given with the you are not given with the moles of reactants. You are given with the masses of reactants. That's completely okay. We know how to convert masses into moles, right? We can do that. 160 grams of NaOH means 4 moles of NaOH. 98 grams of H2SO4 means 1 mole of H2SO4. So indirectly, we are, we are given with moles only, right? We are given with 4 moles of H2SO4. Sorry. We are given with 1 mole of H2SO4 and 4 moles of NaOH. Now, this has to be 0. This has to be 0. Now, what all things you have to calculate here? You will be doing the calculations and you'll be letting, know, letting me know the answers of all the questions in the comments afterwards, okay? First of all, you have to identify. You'll be telling me which one is the limiting reagent. Identify the limiting reagent, okay? Tell me, tell me the moles of Na2SO4 formed, okay? You need to tell me the mass of Na2SO4 formed. Once you calculate moles of Na2SO4, just multiply that with molar mass, get it done, okay? Similarly, tell me the moles of excess reagent left in the container at the end. These are some two, three assignments which I'm giving you, okay? Just give them a try and let me know its answer in the comment section afterwards, okay? Perfect. So people, I want that confidence. If the question comes from the limiting reagent, will you be able to solve it? Say yes or no, everyone in the chats, quickly. Say yes or no in the chats quickly. Quickly, people. I want to hear it from everyone. If the question comes from the limiting reagent, will you be able to solve it? Yeah? I want everyone, whosoever is watching me right now, I want everyone to say it, either yes or no. Quickly. Quickly, people. Yes, Harini, you'll be getting that. The chats are really slow. I want the chats to move fast. Why are chats running so slow? Say yes or no, quickly. Is the Josh decreasing day by day? <laughs> yeah. Don't do that at all. Perfect. Let's move on now. Let's now move on to one more concept. What is that? Uh, let's... Let's do the percentage yield concept. 
one more simple basic basic concept okay percentage yield frequently questions are asked from percentage yield okay so people before letting you know the meaning of percentage yield what it exactly means i'll first of all give you its formula okay i'll give you its formula i'll show you how to calculate the percentage yield and at the end i'll let you know what it exactly means okay first i'm going to give you the formula i'll show you how to apply the formula and then at the end i'll let you know what is the meaning of it okay this is going to be the sequence here so first of all percentage yield what is the spelling y i e l d yeah? is always equal to experimental or or actual amount divided by expected or expected or theoretical amount multiplied by 100 this is one general formula this is one general formula by means of which we can calculate the percentage yield now dear students one thing one thing in order to calculate the percentage yield of the reaction we should have two amounts experimental expected now this expected amount which you also call as theoretical amount right we always calculate it with the help of stoichiometry we always calculate it with the help of stoichiometry and mainly which method in stoichiometry will be using we'll be using the mass method in stoichiometry to calculate what to calculate the expected amount the point is how the point is how so just to make you understand this concept properly i'll directly start with a question so that you'll properly understand what it means and how it's to be calculated okay so starting with the first question basic question the question says on heating 40 grams of calcium carbonate on heating 40 grams of calcium carbonate 20 grams of calcium oxide was obtained was produced calculate the percentage yield of the reaction so first of all the reaction is like this Calc we know calcium carbonate upon heating it gives calcium oxide and with calcium oxide you get carbon dioxide as well now my dear students in the question they are telling us that upon heating 40 grams of calcium carbonate 20 grams of calcium oxide is produced so this is something which has been verified in the lab itself right this is something which has been verified in the lab this is something which has been verified experimentally that when you heat up when you actually heat up calcium carbonate in the lab it will give you 20 grams of calcium oxide so if i ask you whether this 20 grams it is the experimental amount or expected amount it is the experimental amount it has been observed experimentally that 20 grams of calcium oxide is obtained in the lab okay right this is the experimental amount my dear students in order to calculate the percentage yield how many amounts do we need first we need the experimental amount divided by we need the expected amount multiplied by what multiplied by 100 already this experimental amount is given to us yeah what do we need now we just need expected amount how do we calculate the expected amount with the help of stoichiometry which method mass method if you want to use the mole method or mass method what do you need to do balance the reaction the reaction is already balanced right the reaction is already balanced okay now understand what is the mass of one mole of calcium carbonate it's molar mass that's 100 grams 100 grams of calcium carbonate upon heating what is the mass of one mole of calcium oxide 56 grams so basically can i say from the stoichiometry i'm getting the idea basically from the stoichiometry i'm getting the idea that 100 grams of calcium carbonate upon heating should produce 56 grams of calcium oxide i'm using the term should produce this is something that which is a theoretical data which i'm writing on board that 
stoichiometry is telling us that 100 grams of calcium carbonate upon heating should produce 56 grams of calcium oxide. That means 1 gram of calcium oxide, sorry, 1 gram of calcium carbonate should produce 56 divided by 100 grams of calcium oxide. Yes. But do I have 1 gram of calcium carbonate or 40 grams? 40 grams. So as per the question, 40 grams of calcium carbonate upon heating should produce 56 divided by 100 multiplied by 40. The value comes out to be 22.4 grams of calcium oxide. Now you tell me what is it? What did I calculate? What is this term? This is basically the mass of calcium oxide which should have got produced upon heating 40 grams of calcium carbonate. So this is something which I was expecting to get formed this much. I was expecting this much amount of calcium oxide to get formed. So this is my expected amount here, which I calculated with the help of what? With the help of stoichiometry, right? In order to calculate percentage yield, how many amounts do we need? Two. Experimental, we already have. Expected, we calculated. Done, right? So percentage yield of the reaction will be experimental divided by expected multiplied by 100. When you solve it, the value comes out to be 89%. If I ask you what is meant by this 89%, 89% it is basically the percentage yield of the reaction. It is the efficiency of reaction. What does it mean? It means 89%, 89% of the expected amount, 89% of the expected amount is actually getting formed. When you calculate this term, see, 89% of expected amount. When you solve it, you'll exactly find out to be equal to experimental. Okay? This 20 grams, it was the experimental amount. It was the actual amount. So, 89% of the expected amount is actually getting formed. I hope you're getting it. How there 56? Calcium 40, oxygen 16. 40 plus 16, 56. I hope this is clear, people. Quickly in the chats. Quickly, people. Sahil Sab, this is the English channel. You can read the name of the channel. It's Unacademy Neat English, so I'm not supposed to talk in Hindi or Urdu. <clears throat> is it clear, guys? Quickly. Should we move on to one more question? Yeah? Should we solve more questions on this? <clears throat> Should we solve more questions on this quickly? Yes or no in the chats, everyone? Perfect. Let's try to solve a few more questions. Let's try to solve a few more questions. Okay. As per the question is concerned, a 15.6 grams of benzene, 15.6 grams sample of benzene is mixed with excess of HNO3 in presence of H2O4 and 18 grams, 18 grams of nitrobenzene is obtained. Calculate the percentage yield of the reaction. Read the question carefully, guys. I want you guys to read the question. The question says, 15.6 grams of benzene, when mixed with HNO3, produces what? 18 grams of nitrobenzene. So this is something, again, which has been seen experimentally in the lab, that 18 grams of nitrobenzene is being formed. So what is this, basically? This is your experimental amount. This has been experimentally observed, that 18 grams of nitrobenzene being formed in the lab. 15.6 grams of benzene on reaction with HNO3, it produces what? As per the equation, it produces 18 grams of nitrobenzene. So I got the experimental amount. What do I need now? I need the expected amount, which we get with the help of stoichiometry. Which methods? Mass method. Now, the reaction is already balanced. Now relate them. What is the mass of one mole of benzene? It's 78 grams. So 78 grams of benzene gives what is the 
mass of one mole of nitrobenzene. Can you calculate it? This will be 77. 77 nitrogen will be 14. 91. 91 and 32, 123. Okay. So, the mass of one mole of nitrobenzene, which is its molar mass, which is 123 grams of nitrobenzene. Okay. Perfect. My dear students, can I say, stoichiometry is giving me the idea that from 78 grams of benzene, 123 grams of nitrobenzene should get produced. Who is who's telling me that? Stoichiometry is giving me the idea about that. That from 78 grams of benzene, 123 grams of nitrobenzene should get produced. So, 1 gram of benzene should produce 123 divided by 78 grams of nitrobenzene. Right? 1 gram of benzene should produce this much. That means... 15.6 grams of benzene should produce 123 divided by 78 multiplied by 15.6 grams of what? Nitrobenzene. Correct? When you solve this, you'll be getting the value exactly as 24 grams. 24 grams of what? Nitrobenzene. Can you let me know what is the meaning of this term? Basically, this is the mass of nitrobenzene which should get formed. This is the mass of nitrobenzene which should get formed from 15.6 grams of benzene. So this is something which I was expecting. This much amount of nitrobenzene, I was expecting to get formed through stoichiometry. So, can I say, this is basically the expected amount. This is basically the expected amount, right? How many amounts did I need? I needed two amounts. Experimental, expected, right? In order to calculate the yield, I would say percentage yield will be equal. Experimental amount, Experimental amount, 18 grams. Expected amount, 24 grams, multiplied by 100. Solve it, the value comes out to be 73%. So what this 73% is all about now? 73 or 75, something around that, yeah? So the 73, 75%, it is the yield of the reaction. That means 73% of the expected amount is actually getting formed. 73% of, 73% of 24 will be exactly equal to 18. Yeah? Perfect? Is it clear? Is it clear? Are you getting the confidence that you can solve all the questions from percentage yield? Quickly, people. Quickly, quickly. One more question. One more question. First of all, the reaction is given to us. What is the reaction? Calcium oxide plus 2 times HCl. What does it give? It gives CaCl2. And with the CaCl2, we have water as well. The reaction is already given in the, ba in the balanced format. Right? The reaction is already given in the balanced format. Now the question says, 1.12 grams. Guys, it's a it is a similar question. Same type. I think you can do this question on your own. The equation is of similar type. Right? Can you do this on your own? 1.12 grams of calcium oxide. It gives 1.776 grams of CaCl2. Right? So this is your experimental amount. Now you will calculate the expected amount of CaCl2 with the help of stoichiometry. It is a similar equation. So this should be your homework question only. Right? Because it's simple. It's the same. It is of the same pattern. You can solve it. I'll show you some different question. Wait. Okay, let's have a look on this one. Look at this one. On heating, 150 grams of calcium carbonate. So as per the question, we are heating 150 grams of calcium carbonate. What mass of calcium oxide is produced if the yield of the reaction is 75%? The yield of the reaction is 75%. And we are heating 150 grams of calcium oxide. Sorry, calcium carbonate. We need to calculate the mass of calcium oxide produced. How exactly are we going to do that? First of all, let's try to write the reaction. Calcium carbonate upon heating produces calcium oxide. With this, you are going to write carbon dioxide. The reaction is already balanced. Okay. The yield of the reaction is 75%. Right. Now, the mass of one mole of calcium carbonate, that's 100 grams. 100 grams. The mass of one mole of calcium oxide, that's 56 grams. Okay. So, as per the question is concerned, 
हंड्रेड ग्राम ऑफ कैल्शियम कार्बोनेट अपॉन हीटिंग शुड प्रोड्यूस फिफ्टी सिक्स ग्राम ऑफ कैल्शियम ऑक्साइड सो वन ग्राम ऑफ कैल्शियम कार्बोनेट अपॉन हीटिंग शुड प्रोड्यूस फिफ्टी सिक्स डिवाइडेड बाई हंड्रेड ग्राम ऑफ कैल्शियम ऑक्साइड करेक्ट दैट मीन्स वन फिफ्टी ग्राम ऑफ कैल्शियम कार्बोनेट अपॉन हीटिंग शुड प्रोड्यूस फिफ्टी सिक्स डिवाइडेड बाई हंड्रेड मल्टीप्लाइड बाई वन फिफ्टी ग्राम ऑफ कैल्शियम ऑक्साइड दिस वैल्यू अप्रोक्सिमेटली इट विल कम आउट टू बी एटी फोर ग्राम नाउ वट दिस एटी फोर ग्राम इज ऑल अबाउट दैट्स माई क्वेश्चन टू यू दैट्स माई क्वेश्चन टू यू वट दिस एटी फोर ग्राम इज ऑल अबाउट दिस इज द मास ऑफ कैल्शियम ऑक्साइड विच आई वॉज एक्सपेक्टिंग टू गेट फॉर्म दिस इज द मास ऑफ कैल्शियम ऑक्साइड विच आई वॉज एक्सपेक्टिंग टू गेट फॉर्म बट बट The yield of the reaction is not hundred percent. The yield of the reaction is not hundred percent. If the yield of the reaction was hundred percent, then whatever was expected, same would have been actual, right? So, if I ask you, the actual mass, the actual mass of calcium oxide will be equal to seventy five percent of expected amount. is actually being formed right this is the actual amount of calcium oxide which we were supposed to calculate is this clear is this clear to everyone people so one more concept is done and dusted right one more concept is done and dusted clear to everyone quickly yes everyone 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 in the chats is it super clear is it super clear people quickly wonderful let's have a look on one more concept then let's have a look on one more concept percentage purity percentage purity okay Let's see what kind of questions are asked from this and what it means exactly. First of all, I'll make you understand what this percentage purity is all about. Or let's me, let me write one result. Okay, let's leave it aside. Let me write a result directly first of all. I'm writing something as percentage purity. Percentage purity of a compound. percentage purity of a compound in an impure sample percentage purity of a compound in an impure sample in an impure sample is equal to is equal to mass of pure compound divided by divided by the mass of impure sample multiplied by 100 now you must be thinking what is mass of pure compound what is the mass of impure sample let me make you understand this a bit see for example this is the container which i have let's say this is the container which i have okay This is the container, for example. Now, dear students, in this container, for example, I am keeping calcium carbonate plus something. I have no idea what this something is all about. A, B, C. I am keeping. I have kept calcium carbonate. With the calcium carbonate, I have kept some other things as well. These other things over here in the container, I am calling them as the impurities. Whatever is there in the container, except calcium carbonate. Whatever there is is there in the container, except calcium carbonate. i call it as the impurity okay so in the container what do we have we have calcium carbonate plus impurities we have calcium carbonate plus impurities okay now if i ask you this whole sample in the container this whole sample in the container should i be calling this as pure sample of calcium carbonate or impure sample of calcium carbonate this whole sample present in the container i'll be calling this as the impure sample of calcium carbonate i'll be calling this as the impure sample of calcium carbonate right now my dear students let's assume the mass of whole impure sample 
the mass of whole impure sample is for example 50 grams this is the mass of whole sample okay let's assume out of 50 grams we have got almost 20 grams which is basically the mass of pure calcium carbonate which is the mass of pure calcium carbonate okay let's assume out of 50 grams in total 20 grams is the mass of pure calcium carbonate if i ask you what is the percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample if i ask you what is the percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample you will say mass of pure compound mass of pure calcium carbonate that is 20 grams divided by mass of impure sample that's 50 grams multiplied by 100 whatever value comes out to be that is basically percentage purity that's percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample right how much this value comes out to be so it'll be 40 right it'll be 40 percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample is 40 what does that mean what does that mean that means that means 40 grams that means 40 grams of pure calcium carbonate are present in 100 grams of the impure sample i hope you're getting percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample came out to be 40 what does that mean now that means 40 grams of calcium carbonate of pure calcium carbonate is present in 100 grams of impure sample okay so so you can write out its definition as well so i started with the formula no doubt but first i would want you guys to write its definition percentage purity of a compound in the sample what does that mean that means it is defined as that mass of the pure compound that mass of the pure compound in grams which is present which is present in 100 grams of its impure sample which is present in 100 grams of its impure sample okay right and simplest way to calculate the percentage purity this is the formula now let's try to apply it and let's try to see what kind of questions can be asked and how the questions are to be solved but but before solving the question do remove a few points point number one in a chemical reaction in a chemical reaction only pure substance participates in a chemical reaction only pure substance participates that means impurities they do not participate in the reaction impurities do not participate in the chemical reaction number one number two there is one type of the statement which i'm going to write over here and you should know how to decode that statement the statement is something like this for example 50 grams of 80 percent pure calcium carbonate what does it mean 50 grams of 80 percent pure calcium carbonate what does it mean it means this 50 grams this 50 grams is the mass of the impure sample the mass of whole sample and out of 50 grams if you want to calculate the mass of pure calcium carbonate how you are going to do that 80 percent of 50 80 divided by 100 multiplied by 50 the value comes out to be 40 grams so 40 grams is basically the mass of pure calcium carbonate present in 50 grams of the impure sample i hope this type of a statement you can easily decode from now onwards yeah let me give you one more let me give you one more for example i'm writing a statement like this you tell me what is its meaning 70 grams of 50 percent pure 50% pure NaCl. What does that mean? So this 70 grams, this is the mass of whole impure sample. It is 70 grams. Okay. So what is the mass of pure NaCl? Mass of pure NaCl is going to be 50% of 70. So 50 divided by 100 multiplied by 70. The value comes out to be 35 grams. So 35 grams is the mass of pure NaCl. 
Yeah? Yes, Ahmad Iqbal, yes, yes, whole syllabus will be completed. Relax. No worries. People, all these things are clear? Say yes or no. Now I'm going to start the questions so that you can understand and analyze it properly, quickly. Yeah? All clear? If this is clear, let's try to do some questions so that you can understand all these concepts properly. And let's see what kind of different questions can be asked. Number one, 50 grams of 80% pure calcium carbonate. So first of all, first of all, in a chemical reaction, only pure substance participates. So only pure calcium carbonate has to participate in the reaction. So it's better to calculate the mass of pure calcium carbonate. So, in this 50 grams of the whole sample of calcium carbonate, what is the mass of pure calcium carbonate? What is the mass of pure calcium carbonate? It is 80% of 50. The value comes out to be 40 grams. So, basically, we have got 40 grams of pure calcium carbonate, right? Yeah. So, this is basically the mass of pure calcium carbonate present in 50 grams of the whole sample, right? 50 grams of the whole sample. Perfect. Okay, if I ask you, how many pure moles of calcium carbonate are there in the sample? You will say, pure mass of calcium carbonate divided by molar mass of calcium carbonate. So, these are the pure moles of calcium carbonate in the sample. And we know in a chemical reaction only it's the pure substance which participates, right? Now look at the question. Upon heating calcium carbonate, calculate the volume of carbon dioxide produced. So we know when calcium carbonate is heated, what does it produce? Calcium oxide and with this calcium oxide, carbon dioxide gas is produced. The reaction is already balanced. The reaction is already balanced. Now can I say one mole of calcium carbonate upon heating? One mole of calcium carbonate upon heating produces one mole carbon dioxide. One mole calcium carbonate upon heating produces one mole carbon dioxide. So therefore, 0 0.4 moles of pure calcium carbonate upon heating, it will produce 0 0.4 moles of carbon dioxide. So what did I calculate till now? I calculated the number of moles of carbon dioxide produced. That's 0 0.4. So my dear students, was I supposed to calculate moles of carbon dioxide produced? No, I'm supposed to calculate volume of carbon dioxide produced at STP, which will be equal to moles multiplied by 22.4 liters. The value comes out to be 8.96 liters. So this is the volume of carbon dioxide which will be produced at the end. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. Quickly in the charts. This is the volume of carbon dioxide which will be getting produced at the end, right? And see, in the reaction, it is not 50 grams which are participating. It is 40 grams which are participating. It is 0 0.4 moles which are participating. That's why I told you one statement. In a reaction, only pure substance participates. Impurities, they do not participate in the reaction. Okay? Perfectly done? All right. If this is clear, let's try to solve one more question. Let's try to solve one more question, just a second. Let's start with this question first. Let's do this question first. Read the question carefully, guys. 5 grams of H2SO4 sample. Okay, just read it carefully. It's mentioned that H2SO4 sample. 5 grams of H2SO4 sample. That means, is this 5 grams? Is this 5 grams? the mass of pure H2SO4 or this is the mass of whole sample. This is the mass of whole sample of H2SO4. So it has to be the mass of impure sample of H2SO4. It has to be the mass of impure sample of H2SO4. Correct? One thing which I understood till now. 5 grams of H2SO4 sample exactly requires 4 grams of NaOH. 4 grams of NaOH for neutralization. Calculate the percentage purity of H2SO4 in the sample. So basically, I need to calculate the percentage purity of H2SO4 in the sample, in the sample of H2SO4. So it will be equal to mass of pure H2SO4, mass of pure H2SO4, right? 
divided by mass of impure sample of H2SO4 multiplied by what? Multiplied by 100? Multiplied by 100, right? Clear? Now, people, what is the mass of impure sample of H2SO4? That's 5 grams. Already we know this thing. This is 5 grams. What is the mass of pure H2SO4? What is the mass of pure H2SO4? We have to calculate that. See, for that, I'll be writing the reaction again. H2SO4 plus 2 times NaOH, it gives Na2SO4 plus 2 times water. One thing I would ask you. Can I say that mass of H2SO4 which would have participated in the reaction? That mass of H2SO4 which would have participated in the reaction. Can I say that is going to be the pure mass of H2SO4? Because in a reaction, only pure substance participates. So I'll be using the stoichiometry and with the help of stoichiometry, I'll get to know how many grams of H2SO4 have participated in the reaction. Right? I'll get to know how many grams of H2SO4 are participated in the reaction with the help of stoichiometry. That gives me the pure mass of H2SO4. Okay? Now, first of all, have a look. What is the mass of 2 moles of NaOH? It's 80 grams. I'll say as per stoichiometry using the mass method, 80 grams of NaOH reacts with 1 mole of H2SO4 means 98 grams of H2SO4. I can write this kind of a statement, correct? 80 grams of NaOH reacts with 98 grams of H2SO4. So, 1 gram of NaOH reacts with 98 divided by 80 grams of H2SO4, right? 1 gram of NaOH reacts with 98 divided by 80 grams of H2SO4. If 1 gram of NaOH reacts with these many grams, what about 4 grams of NaOH? 4 grams of NaOH reacts with 98 divided by 80 multiplied by 4. The value comes out to be 4.9 grams of H2SO4. Now you just ask yourself that what did we calculate here? What is it? Just ask yourself, what is it? Just ask yourself, what is it? This is the mass of H2SO4 which has reacted with 4 grams of NaOH. So with 4 grams of NaOH, 4.9 grams of H2SO4 have reacted. And that mass of H2SO4 which has reacted in the reaction, that's basically the pure mass of H2SO4. That's basically the pure mass of H2SO4. Correct? Now calculate the percentage purity of H2SO4 in the sample, which is equal to pure mass of H2SO4 divided by impure mass of sample multiplied by 100. The value comes out to be 98%. So, this particular sample which we took in the beginning, 5 grams of H2SO4 sample, the percentage purity of H2SO4 in this sample is how much? In this sample, that's 98%. What does that mean? That means in 100 grams of sample, you will find 98 grams of pure H2SO4. In 100 grams of sample, you will find 98 grams of pure H2SO4. Quickly in the chats, if it's clear. Quickly, people. Yeah? Perfectly done? All right. Let's try to solve one more question. Okay, one more question. Check this question carefully. It's again simple. Yes, friends forever, yes. <laughs> Look at this question, guys. 410 grams of limestone right? So we have got limestone, which is calcium carbonate plus something else. Okay, leave that aside. So basically, is this, should I be calling this as, should I be calling this 410 grams as the mass of impure sample of calcium carbonate? It is the mass of limestone. Limestone consists of calcium carbonate plus something, right? So what is it going to be? So this 410 grams it is the mass of impure sample of calcium carbonate, right? Now, 410 grams of limestone is treated with oxalic acid. 
to produce 510 12 grams of calcium oxide calculate the percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the limestone sample so in this limestone sample we have to calculate the percentage purity of calcium carbonate okay so i'll say percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample is equal to it's going to be mass of pure calcium carbonate in the sample divided by mass of whole sample mass of impure sample multiplied by 100 mass of impure sample of calcium carbonate and mass of impure sample of calcium carbonate already we have 410 grams so we need to calculate the mass of pure calcium now the point is how do we calculate the mass of pure calcium carbonate understand properly so first of all in this particular reaction here you can see calcium carbonate so by using stoichiometry i'll calculate the mass of calcium carbonate which has participated in the reaction by using the stoichiometry i'll calculate that mass of calcium carbonate which has participated in the reaction correct and we know any such mass of reactant which participates in the reaction that's always going to be its pure mass yeah so what i'll be doing the reaction is already balanced here it's one here it's one what is the mass of one mole of calcium oxalate how much that will be 40 plus 24 64 60 plus 64 64 128 so i'll write 128 grams of calcium oxalate this is calcium oxalate 128 grams of calcium oxalate are produced are produced from 100 grams of calcium carbonate right 100 grams of calcium carbonate that means one gram of calcium oxalate is produced from 100 divided by 128 grams of calcium carbonate right so one gram of calcium oxalate is produced from these many grams of calcium carbonate that means 512 grams of calcium oxalate is produced from 100 divided by 128 multiplied by 512 the value comes out to be 400 grams of calcium carbonate so what is this term which we got here this is the mass of calcium carbonate this is the mass of calcium carbonate which has participated in the reaction and that mass of calcium carbonate which participates in the reaction what do we call that as that's called as pure mass of calcium carbonate right so percentage purity is equal to pure mass of calcium carbonate is 400 grams mass of impure sample of calcium carbonate is 410 grams multiply with 100 solve it get the percentage purity of calcium carbonate in the sample i hope this is clear to everyone quickly with this your percentage purity is also done one question i'm giving you as the homework in this one as well one question as homework this is your homework question for percentage purity you are going to give it a try you are going to give it a try okay you are going to give it a try people i hope everything is clear now my dear students it is time to discuss percentage composition molecular empirical formula that is going to be the last topic of the chapter okay with the problems and one more thing concentration terms you would have heard about concentration terms topic that is something which i teach in solution chapter right that is a part of chapter solution so concentration terms I'll be either teaching with solutions or I'll take a separate one shot for concentration terms because concentration terms are there in mole concept, they are there in solution, they are there in equilibrium as well. So wherever concentration terms are in involved, right? I'll take a separate one shot for that. Okay, perfect. Is that cool? Right? Like concentration terms. Normally, what do we study in concentration? Weight by weight, weight by volume, volume by volume, mole fraction right molarity molarity of dilution molarity of mixing of reacting of non-reacting of ideal solution molarity of ions normality equal and mass everything that needs a separate one shot wherever in your physical chemistry the concentration terms are included i'll be covering all those things in that same session yeah perfect guys so let's move on now so before starting the molecular and empirical formula before starting the molecular and empirical formula there is one more term which you need to know 
there is one more term which you need to know. Second. And what is that term? That is vapor density. One simple term this is vapor density. Vapor density. Now what is this vapor density is all about? See guys. I am writing a statement here. Vapor density of a gas. How do we define the vapor density of a gas? How do we define the vapor density of the gas? Understand. For example, I am taking two containers. I am taking two containers. Okay. One container contains a gas over here, some gas, some random gas. Okay. And one more container, it particularly contains H2 gas. We have got two containers. So one containing some random gas, whatever it is, and one more containing H2 gas. Both the gases are kept at same pressure and temperature. Both the gases are kept at same pressure and temperature. Let's assume density of gas is represented by this term, D gas, and density of H2 gas is represented by this, DH2. DH2 represents density of H2 gas, and D gas, it represents the density of the gas. Both the gases, both the gases, they are present at same pressure and temperature. Now the point is, how do I define the vapor density of the gas? Vapor density of the gas is nothing, it's simple. It's basically defined as the ratio of, it is defined as the ratio of density of the gas to that of, to that of density of H2 gas, to that of density of H2 gas at same pressure. Simple. Whatever is the density of gas, divide the density of the gas with the density of H2 gas, provided both the gases are present at same pressure and temperature. Whatever value you will be getting from this, that is going to give you the vapor density of the gas. Yeah? Weiss delay. Is the Weiss not in sync with what I am what saying? Let me just check it. Wait. Hello, hello, hello. What's up? How are you? Hello, hello. It's fine, but it's not that much of lag. Relax are creating issue as if you are unable to see anything, unable to hear anything. It's perfect. It's manageable, right? It's manageable. So basically, if you want to define the vapor density of a particular gas, it's always defined as density of the gas divided by density of hydrogen gas. Provided the same, both the gas are present at same pressure temperature. Yeah? Number one. Number two, all of you would have studied this particular formula. Pm is equal to DRT. Density form of ideal gas equation. All of you must be knowing. Density form of ideal gas equation. Since keeping pressure and temperature constant, R is already constant. Can I say molar mass is directly proportional to density? Yes, molar mass is directly proportional to density. So wherever in this particular equation, which is written at constant pressure and temperature, wherever in this equation, you are seeing the term density, you can replace the density by the term molar mass. So I can say vapor density of the gas is equal to density of the gas means I will be writing molar mass of the gas. Density of H2 means molar mass of H2. Correct? So I can say vapor density of the gas is equal to molar mass of the gas divided by what is the molar mass of H2? That's 2 grams per mole. So from this particular one, you are, got, you are getting an equation. What is the equation? The equation is molar mass of the gas is always equal to 2 times the vapor density of the gas. So sometimes, sometimes you will be given with a gas. You will be given with a gas whose vapor density will be given. 
you just have to multiply vapor density by number 2, you will be getting the molar mass of it. Nothing else. Okay? Perfect. So, vapor density of any gas multiplied by number 2, that gives you the molar mass of that. I hope that's clear. I'll show its application in a while. Just wait for it. One more thing, guys. One more thing. For example, if you'll be having a mixture of gas, for a mixture of gas, I would say for a mixture of chemically non-reacting gases. Let's say this is the container and this particular container, it contains, let's say two chemically non-reacting gases, gas one and gas two. Okay, gas one and gas two. Perfect. Now, first of all, since it's a mixture of gas, it's a gaseous mixture. It's a gaseous mixture. And for a gaseous mixture, what do we define? Do we define the normal molar mass or average molar mass? For the gaseous mixture, we always define average molar mass. Right? Perfect. So, if I want to write this particular equation, this particular equation for the gaseous mixture, what should I write? Should I write molar mass of the gas or average molar mass of the mixture? Average molar mass of the gaseous mixture is equal to 2 times, 2 times what? Vapor density of the mixture. 2 times what? 2 times the vapor density of the mixture. This is one more equation. This is one more equation. Okay? This is one more equation. Average molar mass of the gaseous mixture is always equal to 2 times the vapor density of the mixture. So, for example, if you will be having a gaseous mixture, right, if you know its average molar mass or if you know the vapor density of the gaseous mixture, multiply that by number 2, you will be getting the average molar mass of the mixture. Yeah? Right? Friends, forever there is a link. Enroll now. Karke. Click on that link and get enrolled. Okay? Perfect. So, dear students, let's say exactly what kind of questions can be asked. What kind of questions can be asked? Okay. Let's, uh, wait. Let's, let's start with a simple question. Let's start with a simple question. Let me give you one simple question. Let's say the question is like this. For example, the question is, calculate, Calculate the, calculate the vapor density of the gaseous mixture. Calculate the vapor density of a gaseous mixture containing containing O2 and O3. In 4 is to 3 molar ratio. In 4 is to 3 molar ratio. This is the question. This is the question, guys. Understand what it says. As far as the question is concerned, let's assume this is the container. And in this particular container, what do we have? We have O2. And with O2, we have O3. Right? Let me call this as gas 1. Let me call this as gas 2. So, molar mass of gas 1 is 32 grams per mole. Molar mass of gas 2 is 48 grams per mole. Both the gases, they are present in the molar ratio of 4 is to 3. Both the gases are present in the molar ratio of 4 is to 3. That means if the moles of O2 are 4x, so moles of O3 are supposed to be 3x. So, this has to be N1. This has to be N2. Correct? Clear till here? What are we supposed to calculate? The vapor density of the mixture. Few minutes back, I gave you one relation. Average molar mass of the gaseous mixture is always equal to 2 times the vapor density of the mixture. Right? So, vapor density of the mixture has to be equal to average molar mass of the mixture divided by 2. Correct? And dear students, do you remember? Do you remember how do we calculate the average molar mass of the mixture? There were certain results which I gave you, if you remember. A lot of results which I gave you. To calculate the average molar mass of the mixture. One of the result was M1N1 plus M2N2 divided by what? Divided by N1 plus N2. Perfect. And in the denominator already, 2 is mentioned. 
So I would say vapor density of the mixture has to be equal. M1, that's 32. N1 is 4x. So 32 into 4x, that is 4 to 8, 4, 3, 12, 128x. Plus M2, N2, M2, N2. 48 multiplied by 3. How much that comes? 3 8s are 24. 3, 4, 12, 144x, right? Plus 144x divided by. This is two times. N1 plus N2. 4x plus 3x comes out to be 7x. Multiplied by 7x. So x, x, x everywhere cancel. So this is 8, 4, 12. 4, 1, 5, 5, 2, 7. 2, 72 divided by 14. So this is basically what? This is your vapor density of the gaseous mixture, which you were supposed to calculate. Yeah? Right, people? Is this clear to everyone? This is the vapor density of the gaseous mixture which we were supposed to calculate. Now, if you ask me whether vapor density has any units or not, density, density, cancel, right? Yeah? Okay, it does not have any units. Perfecto. One more question. There is one small change which I've done here. And what is the change? In the last question, I gave you the molar ratio. And here, I'm not giving you the molar ratio. I'm giving you the mass ratio. Can you give it a try? Can you give it a try, people? Can you give it a try? Let's try to understand this question also. As far as the question is concerned, as far as the question is concerned, for example, I've got a container. Let's say this is the container. And my dear students, in this container, what do we have? We have got O2 gas. And with O2 gas, we have got O3 gas as well. Okay? Right? Dear students, the molar mass of O2 is 32 grams per mole. The molar mass of O3 is 48 grams per mole. This is something which you all must be knowing. Now, as per the question, the mass ratio of these two gases is given. Mass ratio means mass of O2 divided by mass of O3. This value is given to us as 4 is to 3 means 4 by 3. Right? If mass ratio is given, can I convert it into mole ratio? Number of moles of O2 divided by number of moles of O3 is equal to. Moles of O2 means mass of O2 divided by molar mass of O2. Moles of O3 means mass of O3 divided by molar mass of O3. Now you tell me. WO2 divided by WO3. WO2 divided by WO3. That's given to me as 4 by 3. Multiplied by. MO3. Molar mass of O3. 48 grams per mole. Molar mass of O2. 32. Check it out. 4, 1. 4, 8. 3, 1. 3, 16. The value comes out to be 2 is to 1. So the molar ratio of O2 and O3 is coming out to be 2 is to 1. So the molar ratio is 2 is to 1. If the molar ratio is 2 is to 1, let's say... The moles of O3 are x, so this has to be 2x. That means this is the value of N1, this is the value of N2. Now, after this, the procedure is same. After this, the procedure is same, people. After this, the procedure is same. What is the procedure now? What do we need to calculate? Vapor density of the mixture. Vapor density of the mixture is equal to average molar mass of the mixture divided by 2. Yeah, average molar mass of the mixture means M1 N1 plus M2 N2 divided by what? Divided by N1 plus N2. And in the denominator, you have two. Perfect. Now everything is in front of you. Just kill it. M1 N1, M1 N1. So 32 into 2 comes out to be 64x plus M2 N2, 48 into x, right? 48x divided by, this is 2. N1 plus N2. 2x plus x comes out to be 3x. 3 2s are, it comes out to be 6x in the denominator. Right? X, X, X everywhere gets cancelled. Just solve it, get the answer. That's it. Clear? I hope the term vapor density and the questions which can be asked from it are clear to you. One question from vapor density, I'm giving you as the homework. You guys will be giving it a try. You guys will be giving it a try. Yeah? You guys will be giving it a try. Which formula for M average I was using till now? M1, N1 plus M2, N2 divided by N1 plus N2. You can use the mole fraction formula as well. M1, Chi1 plus M2, Chi2, etc. Yeah? I hope all these things are clear to you. Perfect. Now, guys, something 
that's called as percentage composition that's called as percentage composition let me just teach you in a very simplified manner i'm not going to stretch it a lot right let's teach it in a simplified manner and what kind of simplified manner that's going to be have a look have a look guys understand properly what i'm going to say <coughs> the first part which i'm going to cover here that is the percentage of element the percentage of an element in a compound by mass this is the first topic which we are going to discuss here percentage of an element in a compound by mass what does that mean that means that mass of the element mass of the element in grams present in 100 grams of compound mass of the element in grams which is present in 100 grams of compound what does that mean you'll get the idea in some time okay before talking about that in detail whenever i need to calculate the percentage of element in a compound in a compound in a compound, in a compound. In a compound. Voice not clear. What's wrong with the voice? Just a second, guys. Hello? Can you all hear me now? Can you all hear me? Okay, perfect. Now it's perfect, right? Okay. I'm just giving you the result by means of which you can calculate the percentage of an element in a compound by mass. It's always equal to molar mass of the element multiplied by Z. Divided by molar mass of element multiplied by Z divided by molar mass of compound multiplied by 100. What is the Z here? What is the Z here? Z represents the number of moles of element. Number of moles of element present in present in one mole of compound present in one mole of compound now what all this means exactly okay i hope you took a note of every single thing now let's understand all this in detail let's understand all this a bit more in detail see guys for example for example i'm taking the example of glucose do you know what is the formula of glucose molecular formula it is C6H12O6, correct? C6H12O6, you know it, yeah? Now, dear students, if I ask you to calculate percentage of carbon in glucose, can you let me know what am I asking you exactly? Percentage of carbon in glucose, what does that mean? I'm asking you to calculate that mass of carbon which is present in 100 grams of glucose, right? How do we define the percentage of an element? It is defined as that mass of the element which is present in 100 grams of compound. Now, I'm asking you to calculate the percentage of carbon in glucose. What does that mean? That means I'm asking you to calculate the mass of carbon in grams that is present in 100 grams of glucose. How do we do that? We have got the formula. We have got the formula. What is the formula? Formula is molar mass of the element multiplied by Number of moles of element present in one mole of compound divided by molar mass of compound. Have a look. Percentage of carbon in glucose is equal to. First term is molar mass of element. Element here is carbon. So molar mass of carbon is 12 grams multiplied by. Number of moles of element present in one mole compound. Now you tell me in one mole glucose, how many moles of carbon are there? 
six moles of carbon divided by molar mass of the whole compound multiplied by 100. It will give you the percentage of carbon in glucose. That's it. People are saying it's 40. The percentage of carbon in glucose is 40. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Percentage of carbon in glucose is 40 by mass. What does that mean? That means 40 grams of carbon will be present in 100 grams of glucose. Yeah? Correct? Similarly, if I ask you, the percentage of hydrogen in glucose, percentage of hydrogen in glucose, percentage of hydrogen in glucose, number one, molar mass of glucose multiplied by, in one mole of glucose, there are 12 moles of H divided by, molar mass of compound multiplied by 100, solid, get the result, right, perfect, similarly, molar mass percentage of oxygen, in glucose by mass, 16 multiplied by 6, divided by 180, multiplied by 100. Done and dusted, right? Simple. So, let's try to solve a question based on the same fact. The first question. The question is, the percentage of sulfur in insulin, the percentage of sulfur in insulin is 3.2 grams. What does that mean? That means in 100 grams of insulin, there are 3.2 grams of sulfur right? In 100 grams of insulin, there is, there are 3.2 grams of sulfur. Calculate the minimum molar mass of insulin. Calculate the minimum molar mass of insulin. So, the question is like this, basically. We are given with the compound insulin. We are given with insulin. It's mentioned that, it's mentioned that the percentage of sulfur in insulin, it's mentioned that the percentage of sulfur in insulin is 3.2. That means sulfur is present in insulin. Sulfur is present in insulin. It's mentioned. Percentage of sulfur in insulin is 3.2. So, let me write the same statement again. Percentage of sulfur in insulin. It is given to me as 3.2. Percentage of element in a compound is equal to molar mass of the element, molar mass of sulfur, multiplied by number of moles of element present in one mole compound. Now, do you know in one mole insulin, how many moles of sulfur are there? I do not know that. I do not know how many moles of sulfur are present in one mole of insulin. Right? So, how do I do that? How do I do it? This question there. Look at this particular statement. We are supposed to calculate the minimum molar mass of insulin. Now, you imagine when can be the molar mass of insulin minimum. If I assume that in one mole insulin, there is one mole sulfur. Right? The least moles of sulfur that can be present in one mole of insulin. That is one. That is least. Right? Perfect. I have to calculate the least molar mass. Minimum molar mass of insulin. Molar mass of insulin can be minimum only if I assume that one mole of insulin contains one mole sulfur. Divided by. Divided by. Molar mass of compound. Do I write molar mass of compound or minimum molar mass of compound? And the compound here is insulin. Multiplied by. 100. This value is equal to 3.2. Right? So, one equation, one unknown. Calculate the minimum molar mass of insulin from here. And let me tell you the answer will come out to be 1000 grams per mole. So, this is the minimum molar mass of insulin which I was supposed to calculate. Quickly, you guys can let me know in the chats if it is super clear to you. Quickly, people. Everyone. Everyone in the chats. Quickly, let's finish off this chapter quickly. We have got just few more concepts to teach. Perfecto. Now guys, one more thing I would want to make you understand. One example, I am writing a statement like this. I am writing Na2SO3 dot 7 times water. For example, Na2SO3 dot 7 times water. Till now, I was telling you how to calculate percentage of element in a compound. Now, if I ask you, tell me the percentage of water in the sample. 
percentage of water in the sample by mass? What will be your answer? Till now, it was percentage of element in a compound. Now, I'm telling you here, calculate the percentage of water in the whole sample. So, what will be writing? It used to be percentage of element. Here, it's percentage of water. It used to be molar mass of element. Here, it's going to be molar mass of water. Multiplied by. It used to be number of moles of element in a compound. Now, it is going to be number of moles of water. Number of moles of water present in one mole of the sample. It is 7. Divided by. Divided by. It used to be molar mass of compound. Now, this is molar mass of whole sample. So, molar mass of this part is 126 plus molar mass of this part is 18 into 7, right? 18 multiplied by 7. Multiplied by 100. This will give you the percentage of water in this particular sample. Correct? For example, I'm writing like this. Let's say I'm writing like this. Na2SO3, yeah, Na2SO4 dot x times water. Dot x times water. I'm asking you to write the equation for percentage of H2O by mass. Percentage of H2O by mass. It's going to be molar mass of water, 18 grams. In one mole of sample, how many moles of water are there? X divided by. Molar mass of this part is 142 plus molar mass of this part is 18x multiplied by 100. I mean, if you know how to write these equations, you can easily solve the questions based on percentage. For example, for example, for example, one simple question you have. I'm giving you one simple question. Na2SO3 dot x times water has 50% water by mass. That means percentage of water in the sample is equal to 50. It's given. Percentage of water in this sample will be equal to molar mass of water multiplied by. One mole of sample contains x moles of water divided by. Molar mass of this part is 126 plus molar mass of this part is 18x. Multiplied by what? Multiplied by 100. This value is equal to 50. One equation, one unknown. Solve it. Get the value of x. Isn't it simple? Can't you do this? Can't you do this, people? After solving, you'll be getting the value of x as 7. Right? Similarly, one more question. One more question of the same format. You can solve it on your own. One more question on the same format. Nothing different here. Nothing different. Nothing different, people. Clear? Clear to everyone? Yeah? Perfecto. Now, let's just move on to the last topic of the chapter. Let's just move on to the last topic of the chapter. And what is that? What is that? That is the easiest topic among all the topics of mole concept. And question frequently comes from this particular topic. What is that? Empirical and molecular formula. Okay. So first of all, how do we define the molecular formula? How do you define the molecular formula? It's simple, guys. Molecular formula, it gives... It gives the actual ratio of atoms of different elements. Atoms of different elements in a molecule. In a molecule. What it means, you'll get the idea in some time. Okay? Empirical formula. Empirical formula. It gives it gives the simplest whole number ratio. It gives the simplest whole number ratio between the atoms of different elements in a molecule. So one is molecular formula and another one is empirical formula. 
let's try to understand and let's try to see what kind of questions can be asked from these two okay just to simplify it just to make it clear to you for example i'm taking glucose into consideration i'm taking glucose okay glucose i'm writing its formula as c6h12o6 right can i say this is basically it is that formula of glucose which gives us the actual ratio of the atoms so first of all if i ask you what is the ratio of the atoms here it is 6 is to 12 is to 6 if i ask you is it just the ratio of the atoms or it is the simplest ratio you will say it is not the simplest ratio we can convert it in the simplest ratio it is not the simplest ratio we can convert it in simplest ratio that formula which gives you the actual ratio which does not give the simplest ratio which gives you the actual ratio of the atoms of different elements you call that particular formula as the molecular formula so this is the formula which is giving you the actual ratio of the atoms of different elements so you'll be calling this as the molecular form right now dear students if i ask you to convert this ratio into simplest form what you'll be doing you'll be dividing throughout by six when you divide throughout by six six by six is one twelve by six is two and six by six is one now i'm asking you the same question is this ratio the actual ratio or simplest whole number ratio this ratio is the simplest whole number ratio right so as per this simplest whole number ratio what should be the formula it should be c1 h2o1 correct so can i say this particular formula it is giving me the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms and that formula which gives you the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms of different elements what do you call that as you call that as empirical formula so this is empirical formula this is molecular formula right perfect now guys few more things with the help of molecular formula what can we calculate we calculate molecular mass we calculate molecular mass with the help of what with the help of molecular formula calculate the molecular mass of glucose use the molecular formula 12 into 6 plus 1 into 12 plus 16 into 6 the value comes out to be 180 u so this is the molecular formula molecular formula is always calculated with the help of sorry molecular mass is always calculated with the help of molecular formula similarly there is a term called as empirical mass there is a term called called as empirical mass empirical mass it is calculated with the help of what it is calculated with the help of empirical formula 12 into 1 plus 1 into 2 plus 16 into 1 the value comes out with 30 u so 30 you are be calling as empirical mass one is molecular mass one is empirical mass right perfect till here one is molecular mass one is empirical mass one more term i'm going to define and what is that term one more term people i'm going to define and that term is that term is basically n what is n n is not n does not represent moles here n is just a number it is just a number like x y z whatever okay n is just a number n gives me n gives me the ratio of molecular mass to that of empirical mass n gives me the ratio of molecular mass to that of what to that of empirical mass there is one more result there is one more result what is that molecular formula is equal to empirical formula multiplied by n now you must be thinking how come these results are true now have a look if i talk about glucose what is the n value for glucose n value for glucose molecular mass 180 u empirical mass 30 u the value comes out to be 6 this is the n value for glucose right let's see whether this formula is valid or not what is the molecular formula of glucose it is c6h12o6 what is the empirical formula of glucose it is c1h2o1 what is the n value for glucose that's 6 so lhs rhs are they coming out to be equal it seems so this particular result is satisfied yeah okay perfect i hope this is clear and if this is clear guys one more thing that already i have mentioned that molar mass is equal to two times the vapor density sometimes they won't give you in the equation the molar mass they'll give you the vapor density term by using the vapor density you'll be calculating the molar mass yeah 
Now let's try to solve the questions which can be asked. Different types of questions which can be asked from empirical molecular formula. This is the simplest of all, okay? It is just you have to remember one general procedure. One general procedure you have to remember. For example, the question is, calculate the empirical formula of the compound that has this much percentage potassium, this much percentage chromium, and this much percentage oxygen by weight. So as per the question is concerned, Suresh ready, you can just drag the video a little back, it will be a replay for you. What is the point of repeating the same thing? Just drag the video a little back, it will be a replay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. My dear students, there is a general way of calculating the empirical formula of a compound. How come exactly? How come exactly? Gautam, equivalent weight, I told you, I'm not going to teach you equivalent weight here. Equivalent weight will be done when I'll be teaching you concentration terms. And concentration terms, there will be a separate session, right, for concentration terms. Basically, when I'll be teaching you the solutions, in the solution chapter, I'll be teaching you the concentration terms. And there, all the concentration terms, molarity of dilution, molarity of mixing, of reacting, non-reacting, molarity of ions, molarity of ideal solutions, normality, equivalent mass, everything will be done in just here. Okay. Look at the general procedure of calculating the of calculating the empirical formula, guys. This is the simplest of all. Okay. This is the simplest of all. As per the question, we have got a compound that contains three elements. Compound contains potassium. It contains chromium, and it contains oxygen. Okay. There is a compound which contains three elements. Now, as per the question is concerned the mass percentage the mass percentage of potassium is given to us as 26.6 oxygen sorry chromium it's given to us as 35.4 oxygen it's given to us as 38.1 what is this mass percentage what does that mean it means it means in 100 grams of compound a compound is containing three elements right and And in 100 grams of compound, you will find 26.6 grams of potassium. In the same 100 grams of compound, you will find 35.4 grams of chromium. In the same 100 grams of compound, you will find 38.1 grams of what? 38.1 grams of oxygen. So basically, mass percentage, right? You can relate it directly with the mass. Yeah? It means... 100 grams of compound contains these many grams of potassium, these many grams of chromium, these many grams of oxygen. Right? Do remember, the first step always to calculate the empirical formula, the first step is always to calculate number of moles. Number of moles or you can call it as atomic ratio. You can call it as atomic ratio. Number of moles or atomic ratio. Given mass of potassium, divide by molar mass of potassium. That gives you the number of moles of potassium. Similarly, given mass of chromium divided by molar mass of chromium. That gives you the number of moles of chromium. Similarly, number of moles of oxygen. So basically, let me just show you in the tab tabulated form. Have a look. This is the mass percentage that's given to us. Correct? These are their respective atomic weights. The first step always to calculate number of moles or you can call it directly as what? You can call it as the atomic ratio. This is the atomic ratio. Atomic ratio is nothing. It is just given mass percentage divided by atomic weight. Given mass percentage, given mass percentage divided by atomic weight, 26.6 divided by 39, 0.68, 35.4 divided by 52, 0.68, 38.1 divided by 16, 2.38. It is giving you the atomic ratio. It is giving you the atomic ratio. You can call it as atomic ratio or you can call it directly as number of moles. Okay. Now, dear students, this is the atomic ratio. Look at all these three terms. Which term has got the least value? 0.68. Divide all the terms by the least number. Divide all the terms by the least number. So 0 0.68 divided by 0 0.68. Value is 1. 0 0.68 divided by 0 0.68. Value is 1. 2.38 divided by 0 0.68. Value is 3.5. Now, this is something which I call as least atomic ratio. This I call as, this was atomic ratio. Now here I'll be calling this as least atomic ratio. Now, should I be calling this as least 
whole number atomic ratio this is not the least whole number atomic ratio because over here we have got 3.5 so convert it so multiply throughout by 2 multiply throughout by 2 this value is 2 this value is 2 and this value is 7 now this 2 to 7 what is it it is the least whole number atomic ratio and that formula from which you get the least whole number atomic ratio what do you call that formula as empirical formula so empirical formula of the compound is going to be a2 cr2 and o7 this is the empirical formula of the compound that's it simple yes let me solve one more question so that you can understand it properly look at this question carefully guys in this particular question we have to calculate the molecular formula of the compound okay molecular formula of the compound how do we calculate molecular formula you know molecular formula is nothing it is empirical formula multiplied by n so in order to calculate molecular formula i have to calculate empirical formula as well as n what is n n is molecular mass divided by empirical mass do we know molecular mass of the compound no we just know vapor density of the compound vapor density multiplied by 2 46 into 2 comes out to be 92 molecular mass you got divided by empirical mass i do not know yet empirical mass i do not know yet empirical mass i'll be calculating with the help of empirical formula but right now i do not know the empirical formula so calculate the empirical formula a compound of nitrogen and oxygen you have got a compound containing two elements nitrogen and oxygen their mass ratio is given 7 is to 16 either mass percentage will be given or mass ratio will be given you'll be following the same procedure right this is the mass ratio mass ratio will be given or mass percentage will be given right now the first point is to calculate the atomic ratio how to calculate atomic ratio given mass percentage divided by atomic weight of nitrogen this will be 16 divided by atomic weight of oxygen this value is 0.5 this value is 1 so this is atomic ratio now which one is the least term among the two 0 0.5 so i'll be calculating the least atomic ratio now so 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.5 that value is 1 similarly 1 divided by 0 0.5 the value is 2 so 1 is to 2 this is the least atomic simplified ratio right so that's something which i'll be calling as empirical formula so basically i got the empirical formula basically i got the empirical formula it's going to be n1 o2 it's going to be n1o2 so with the help of empirical formula can't i calculate empirical mass which is 14 into 1 plus 16 into 2 the value comes out to be again 46 only this is the empirical mass if you got the empirical mass can't we calculate the value of n n is equal to 92 divided by empirical mass that's 46 the value comes out to be 2 so n we got if n you got can't you calculate the molecular formula which is equal to empirical formula empirical formula n1o2 multiplied by n n value is 2 so final result will be n2o4 so this is n2o4 which is basically the molecular formula of the compound isn't it simple and basic guys isn't it simple and basic yeah isn't it simple and basic let me see if i have one more question so that i can give you that question as a homework right okay You have to calculate empirical formula, okay? This is empirical formula here. This is your homework question. Perfect. So, my dear students, I hope from now onwards, whatever question comes from the mole concept, you should be able to solve all the questions. Okay? And in the today's session, I gave you four questions on homework. I gave you four questions on homework as homework. I would want their answers in the comment section. And with this, your chapter one is over. Your chapter one is over, right? Now, one thing which I would want from you guys in the comment section, what is that? Let's kill chapter two. Okay, and I'll let you know what is going to be our next chapter. That is the chapter two of your chemistry. This is something which I would want everyone to write in the comments and this is my telegram link t.me slash w a s s i m s i r c h e m this is my telegram link perfect 
over here i keep on telling you all the important things related to the related to anything basically yeah so do join it as soon as possible perfect all right then guys so first chapter is done now let's hit the second chapter in the coming days till then you take care bye bye god see you all an academy let's crack it